Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode 331 of Spitting Chicklets, presented by Pink Whitney from our friends at New Amsterdam Vodka here in the Boston Sports Podcast family. What is up, gang? We got lots to get to on a packed up. Some clinches, a big retirement. I'm coming to you from Midtown Manhattan on a business trip, Biz, because we are here to win the dozen trivia that starts Tuesday. I know we dropped the episode, but it's a big deal in the Boston world. Fucking that last, the last match we got hosed. It was Minahan, who apparently there's a little bit of beef going on with Minahan and Jared Carabas, where he's now dropped out, and then they got the gambler on his team. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward. So, so we're gonna hop in via Zoom. Yeah, you eleven twenty two Tuesday, and it's gonna get dropped the week following week. So we we can't talk about who won. And we could, we if we win, we keep going on. We'll play again Wednesday, and if we win that, we're in the final. So. I'm here, all business, going dead sober, playing Jeopardy style. We're going to win this fucking thing. What time Wednesday? We got a Coyotes game. Am I going to have to ditch the Coyotes game no. to play the dozens? It'll be, it'll be in the afternoon sometime. It'll be done by <laughs> before supper time. All right. East, East Coast. So, right. What do you think about our like chances in that? I, I, I feel like sports-wise, we're solid. But other than Ari with the movies... Biz, you and I don't know much trivia. I don't know much at all. I man. know a lot you know of what? obscure shit. Though. I've gone to trivia at like a bar, and I've just... I've had some decent nights, maybe three out of 10, but the other seven, I'm useless. So, All right. I, I hope you don't take this as an insult. You know so much about useless shit. It's fucking yeah. crazy. The drink category, you're always, you're always pretty good in. We didn't get or, the drink category well, question you, right. I, I should have had it. I said Bellini. that the cactus club special with the Bellini. I messed that up. That's not on RA. Anyway, uh, I don't even know if you asked me what's going on, but I'm going to tell you. I watched that uh, Gawker <laughs> The Gawker Hulk Hogan documentary last night. That was interesting. Oh, I need a doc. I need a documentary. That, did you? I don't even know how that all went down, but I was kind of invested in that whole uh, Hulk Hogan reality show era. Like I was watching that show. I remember he was he was heavily involved with that uh, Tampa Bay Cup run to the point I heard <laughs> I heard some of the Tampa guys saying it got like they had to lock him out of the room. They thought he was like he should be in there for the team. You know when the coach addresses the torts was going to address the team and keep it like the tight knit group. Like I think Hulk thought he should have had his name engraved in the cup. That's he how much he, th- he, he should have. <laughs> Do like Jim Belushi when Chicago won it. Everyone's like, all right, Jim, why don't you go you know, have a seat outside? We're going to celebrate with the boys. Yeah. <laughs> no, Hulk He's one is up in RA. He is one of the boys. Dude, dude A&E, I don't know if How much following. did he get paid for that, Biz? Crazy amount. So the, the wild part about it that I never knew was that this guy, this um, uh, like tech billionaire guy from the West Coast was funding the lawsuit because he didn't like the, 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 the gawker.com. He had a personal vendetta against them. No so they shit. were saying is like, I, I don't know if it ended up creating a law in the, in, 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 as far as like the government or, or, or the way that these things can proceed now. But it was bizarre that somebody who wasn't really involved in the case was funding the fact that that this situation could end up taking them down. I think that they ended up having to pay up 140 million was the was the total. On, yeah. on that. What, and, and what was bizarre about it, I didn't even realize I thought that that there was like an affair going on, but no, this was Hulk Hogan's. Uh, it was his good buddy. I think he was the best man at his wedding, but his buddy just liked watching other dudes plow his wife. It's just like, that was one oh, of their things. Bubba the love sponge. Yeah. Bubba the, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that the, was the guy's name. Yeah. He's yeah, a bu- DJ in Tampa. Yeah. That's- yeah. So he liked watching Is that his real watching- name. No, yeah, that was no, that's a, no, that's a stage name. <laughs> you think <laughs> I fell for that one. <laughs> you both did, but we both did hook, line and sinker. Yeah. Uh, so it was, um, it was an interesting doc. It kind of got on to the, to the, like the, the legal proceedings of it and how, how it shouldn't have been allowed that this, this guy was funding the lawsuit. It didn't make any sense. And he basically just kept pouring more and more money into it until he, he, he dragged it down. Do- um, well, interesting, interesting story there. I'm going to check out that doc. Uh, if you're wondering how I'm doing, <laughs> fantastic. Actually, fantastic slash a touch of like uh, disappointed, but fantastic nonetheless. We won team trash down in Sea Island. This place, Sea Island Resort in Georgia, is one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. It, we stayed in this cabin. You pull the golf carts right up to the front of the cabin. You walk in. There's four bedrooms, two king-sized beds in each, a big common room kitchen, an outdoor patio, and then right there, the range. You have a hitting bay inside all lit up so you can just bang balls whenever you want. So guys are waking up, grabbing a coffee, step literally three feet outside, warm up, hit some balls. You get, you go get in the cart, go to the first tee. So we just had a, we got there Thursday afternoon and we left 
Sunday. You can tell by my voice, wounded. But we won. It was fantastic. If you followed along on Fairway Falls, he had some good updates going on on basically how we just shit kicked him. There's five matches. There's nine points every every session available. 45 total points. The thing was over after the fourth set of matches. We didn't even need to play. Just oh, an no. utter shit kicking. Um, so then you just poured it on as far as boots. Two, two things that really like made me laugh looking back from the weekend. And we got a jet on the way home. Oh, my God. dude! That is move? That, does that just cha- Eight guys, you know, you pull it together. And does that change the way to end a trip or what? Yeah. No. Oh, you just walk on, you fly home, you walk off. None of the panic, an hour ride to the airport, going through security is an utter anxiety attack when you're hung over <laughs> coming off a guy's weekend. I would rather fucking jump off a building than walk through <laughs> security and get in line in airports when I'm hung over. Uh, so the jet was the way to go. But two things when I'm looking back on the weekend cracked me up. The first was uh, one of the guys on the trip was telling us a story. I had never heard this. Actually, most of the guys hadn't in college. He right when like Facebook was early on, he used to just write that he had a girlfriend and he was at college. He's like, I have a girlfriend, but she doesn't go here. Make up a name on Facebook because he knew girls would love me. You know? Oh, he's got a girlfriend. I want to, you know, who's it? Because, you know, you're always interested. The girls always like the guys with the girlfriends. And then sure as shit, it would help him out and he'd fake break up with her on Facebook and he'd get the sympathy. Talk. <laughs> <laughs> so he had just this fake relationship where he oh my. it was just so That's funny. diabolical so funny college memories and the other one that was hilarious is if you can imagine this common kitchen you're up late every night it smells like a sweaty sock in there guy there's empty f- beer cans and food everywhere in the morning and guys are lit laying there with no shirt on tvs on just chilling and some guy knocks on the door well-dressed, well-dressed guy. He's got his golf shirt on, his clubs. And, like, one dude goes and answers the door. He comes in. He's like, hey, I'm here for my lesson. We were next to the performance center where the head pros taught. <laughs> my buddy is sitting there, no shirt on, looking horrendous. He goes, oh, yeah, you must be my 8 a.m. <laughs> This guy, this guy was just so confused. <laughs> Someone was like, "No, the performance center's next door." <laughs> oh my Gary. goodness! Oh, uh, so that was just uh, it was who dropped the one liner? What was who? What was his name? Gary. We call him uh, Gary. His name's Connor Kelly, but everyone calls him Gary. Oh, shocker! I know exactly. that's such an no East sense. Coast Boston thing. Makes like no the, sense. It's like the fucking nickname makes absolutely no. Well, the sense. reason it makes <laughs> even more or less sense is they. Everyone was trying to call him Gary. They thought the guy in um, the the breakup. Do you remember the brother? Come come with the kick drum, Gary. You know that movie? <laughs> have you ever seen that movie? All right, no, I you? don't remember that. What's come with the kick drum? What's the name? You ever of the seen movie? the movie The Breakup with Vince Vaughn? And I, I and, saw it with my oh, old lady. Oh, that's a yes, good one. All right, well, there's a character in Jennifer there. Jennifer Aniston. So funny. He's this very flamboyant Missile. brother of Jennifer Aniston, or I think it's his brother. I don't know what. And oh, she, he ends up being tough as shit, but he's well. His brothers all thought that Connor was like that guy, and they thought that guy's name was Gary, so they started calling him Gary, but that isn't even his name. Gary was Vince Vaughn. So it really makes no sense. Uh, That's basically how to explain oh, a nickname man. in Boston. But, um, yeah, a great trip. And, and then it's crazy to come home and see. I, like, I think this morning people are listening Tuesday. There's going to be 62 games left in the NHL season. We're, we're pretty much wrapped up 90% of the regular season. Most of the races look like, you know what top four teams are getting in and it's game on for us. You know, playoffs, we'd be crazy busy. Oh, it's getting busy. We can't actually leave out our buddy Grinelli though. We got to say hello to him. I'm going to be oh, grabbing sorry. a few What's drinks and dinner with him. That's all right. Got to give G well, What's props. up, R.A.? Happy to have you here in uh, New York City. I am also very happy to say that we can start teasing this street hockey tournament that we've been working on for so long. Uh, we're going to be doing a street hockey tournament this summer around August in Detroit. And uh, we'll release some more details in the, uh, in the coming weeks. Do they need an e-bug for any teams? <laughs> We will. We actually yeah. will need e-bugs. You might be the e-bug uh, goalie this year, R.A., for the Barstool team. Hey, shout out to shoot. R.A., too, because you don't get the credit. R.A. right now, you'll see on the YouTube when you watch, if you do, uh, he has no glasses on, and he just admitted before the show he can't find his glasses, and he's very OCD with his glasses especially. So this is kind of his flu game right now, and so far, so good. Yeah, you are I, humming, R.A. Right. Yeah, I might he's be usually con- always like playing with his glasses and shit and moving around, so I think fresh, now it's going to be fresh his hands down. I respect it. 
I, I might be concussed as well. I, I hit my head real fucking good getting in my seat in that Amtrak train. I, I was like, enough that I said, ow, like, so the whole train could hear it. I was like, ow, I just fucking missed it. And I had to sit down. You know what? I got a stinger on my neck. I had to sit there for like a minute and for the stinger to go away. Your head gets wicked hot. You did this to yourself on the train? On the train, yeah. Was so. there a bump or did you just do it? You just No, it was, I just smashed my head but it like went right into my neck oh, i was like oh please Jesus. please but it went it kind of came and went real quick so i could be concussed though we'll have to check so we're, we're gonna way. sell uh ra's burp nft and now we gotta sell his uh <laughs> his flu game nft uh hey Keep that, going, that's buddy you're humming that's hilarious what about your guy making up girl it's like the dude on animal house uh he's like hi i'm here to pick up my date fawn Lebowitz because they looked in the paper first and they knew she died so all the girls like oh uh hold on a minute so they oh, ended yeah, up taking our girlfriend oh. so they took him to the uh, fucking that- dexter lake club <laughs> <laughs> one of the greatest scenes in movie history. One of the right, greatest I, I movies. Have, one of I the, have not seen it. Oh my god! Oh my god! This, this movie is ridiculous. I know. I'm a Sophomore loser. Dies in kiln explosion. Uh, it's. I mean, it's the. It's the comedy that changed comedies forever. I mean, there was funny movies before Animal House. Animal House came along, and it was like the Big Bang of American comedy movies. Save your tweets. I know it's embarrassing. I will watch Animal House. It's on my list. I've been catching up with my octopusy teacher <laughs> and fucking all these other ones that Ari has been throwing at me. Well, you mentioned docs and wrestling. I don't know if A and E the last three weeks been killing it. They have one on Roddy Piper, Macho Man, and Steve Austin. They have in depth the whole story about him. If you're a wrestling fan from way back when, it's good shit so far. So um, I've been uh, I've been on YouTube quite a bit lately, and oh. like in the algorithm, oh boy, I love watching all this drama behind the scenes with wrestling. Not even the per- like all these old feuds they had with Vince McMahon and the arguments. Like I didn't realize CM Punk left WWE very ugly. Um, like the work that Rock was putting in behind the scenes. Like which guys hated each other. You would you- be great in the WWE biz. Oh, you are meant it, it for ma- the WWE. It, it, it makes oh man, I would love to be a wrestler. I, I I'm too banged up though. <laughs> I got oh. no knees, dude. Those guys, man, they just, they kill themselves. But you, and the Hulk's the biz. I'll, I'll, I'll tweet it. I'll get to the hockey in a sec. But one of my greatest sports memories ever, when Hulk Hogan entered the arena in the, in the midst of Hulkamania, he would do the fucking fingers up. The whole place is going, well, me and my brother would always sneak down like we were little shits and no one would bother you if you were behind this certain barrier. And I'm, I was legit hugging him the whole time he was doing this. I was like 10 years old, like doing the Hulkamania thing. I got pictures like two feet away. I'll tweet them out later just for, as evidence. But it's still Come shit. On. I remember 35 years later, you know, the whole building's on him. What was you know, legit hugging I am a real American. <laughs> Dude, Hulkamania was fucking huge. First oh, wrestler ever on the cover. Hey, <laughs> remember hey, his the, mumber, and then the mullet hair he had <laughs> or is he bald on top with the hair in the back yeah i can't yeah, remember oh, it was oh it was so greasy but it was awesome hey the gift of when, name uh, of the, cup. the <laughs> The, the gif of uh, Shawn Michaels coming out and doing the <laughs> yeah. like what he's got. Oh, hey, and, it was ridiculous shit people back th- then. People throwing beer on him as they're coming out. It's fucking nuts, oh, man. Hey, I remember some of those Monday Night Raws, maybe 95-ish RAs. That one, it was like they would do and say anything in those Anything. Hey, it was hey, nuts. Hey, Vince think- McMahon, is there a documentary on him? He's probably like a sociopath, no? Well, he doesn't let anything oh. get produced unless, like, WWF puts their spin on it. He's very, very he's protective. He's like a sickle, right? But, I mean, he's yeah. obviously, like, a genius. He's he, a megalomane. Mega, so, what was it? So megalomane. When, when it began, did he – Did because he at one point wrestled, right? He got involved in some things. He was never a wrestler per se, but he did get – you know, like, he, he didn't come up he, as a wrestler. He would have put himself in He implemented himself in the script I know as how the genius heel. is that, though. Yeah, it's, I mean, look at it. He built an empire because oh, his yeah. father ran it. I, I remember at the that. garden, he would have like a pink suit on, and people were yelling like, like gross things at him, like because he wasn't in power yet. He was like skinny, scrawny guy in a suit, and you know now he's a fucking monster worth billions of dollars, man. It's been, it is quite an American story, I'll tell you that. God, I was I was ju- just about to bring something up, but I guess we could move on. Yeah, uh, we got a pair of guests for you once again today. We have Colorado superstar Gabriel Landeskog. Uh, caught up with him earlier, oh, about a week ago, so it's pretty fresh stuff. Great guy. And Biz did a solo interview with Caleb Dahlgren. Uh, Caleb survived the um, Humboldt cr- uh, crash a couple of years ago, and he came out with a book, and, and Biz sat down with him. And obviously, it's a very heavy interview, but uh, it's also important that you hear it. So we're going to get to that a little bit later, but... Let's have a little bit of fun first. What is up, gang? We got lots to get to on a packed episode. Some clinches, like I said, but it's officially party season. So head over to your local liquor store today and find the Pink Whitney in the new 375 milliliter Mickey size bottle. From the pregame to the after party, make Pink Whitney your choice. Smooth stuff. 
Biz, I, I, we got to kick off of your team once again. The North is just the team to talk about. Toronto, five straight wins. It's shaping up. They might play Montreal in the first round. I'm praying that happens, but Winnipeg keeps slipping. Uh, we had a little, I wouldn't call it controversy. We had some whining online. Uh, Simmons fought uh, uh, Edlaw after he uh, hit, what's his name? Was it fucking Hyman? Knocked him out with the yeah. knee. You know, he answered yep. the bell. People are like, oh, he's never had a career fight before. It's like, well, he never gets suspended for knee and a guy either before. So I wanted to take take Biz. No, I thought, did you hear what Bieksa said about it, guys? Yeah. It was perfectly said. Yeah, it's like, you know, especially like he's, he's you know, got to be the voice of reason, especially from a player's perspective up there. And like, I'd be like, uh, that code, you know, and he's just like eloquently <laughs> yeah. rolls it out perfectly. And once again, I don't think Eller, uh, Edler really had an issue addressing it either. I mean, the fight didn't really last long anyway. He took a couple noogies on the head and, and, and we can all move on. Well, I was thinking if I was on Pittsburgh, right? And um, I'm thinking of like the, the team that Philly had when I was there and I took out one of their top players. Say I somehow took out Mike Richards, dirty knee or something. I'm not fighting Yoni picking in the next time. Maybe <laughs> Philly Riley Cote is coming after, me. you know, it's like that. It's so odd for people to even bring up that you should have to fight somebody like <laughs> the same toughness as you. If you, what are you talking about? This is like old school warrior mentality or, or, or gladiators. It's where it's, you, you're just doing whatever you can to get a leg up. So if the toughest guy has a chance to beat up a weakling, it's going to happen. You get and I'm not seven. saying Edler's a weakling, but he'd never had one fight. And I think that that was Simmons' 78th. Wait. But he did good, whatever. He hung in there. He answered the bell. Hey, you are, you're like, I'll pick the Semen uh, bongo drums. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're getting the Cote left to the jaw, you donkey. Yeah, no, I, I, thought he, I thought he did well at the start. I mean, obviously, Simmons took over. But yeah, every, everybody moved on, and, and it's great. And, and like, roles reverse, could you imagine – if, if Vancouver was having the season that Toronto's having and um, let's say Hyman need Hughes off, oh, what are you talking about? They, there'd be Rally's, a UFC. They, they, they make brothers want... be all over them. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Is there Did another you... Hughes getting drafted hey, this year, Granelli? Hey, here's another thing. Sorry. Bro. Yeah, he's filthy. He's filthy. And he could go to the Devils, which could be cool. Both Hughes brothers in New Jersey. Isn't he a sure. D-man? He's a D-man, but he's not like Quinn. He's more of like the stay-at-home type. He's defense. a killer. He's a no. He's not really a killer he's either. Pumping but... guys' eyes shut. No, no? Not, not that much. <laughs> we had, we had another scrap in that division too, Biz. No, uh, Josh Norris and Romanoff, and Romanoff looked a little late getting the gloves off there. Granelikov? Um, yeah. Well, he didn't know what was going on, man. You get a. <laughs> he has no idea that that's that, that that's really happening because it moves time moves very quick when somebody's like jumping you now i'm sure most people are getting their gloves off sooner but i don't even think he knew what to do and it was norris too so it's kind of an unlikely matchup i don't think anyone really expects that to happen either we have to mention matthews with 38 goals this guy's a freak of nature what's his goals per game right now is it what point three point eight one Eight, well, we, we just both off. Three different numbers. <laughs> I wonder who's right. You get the family Let me check up. my notes here. <laughs> sure Literally, one, says. two, three. We didn't fucking but, watch, watch it. It's going to be eight, four. And, and I feel lost in the shuffle right now is, is Marner has played like an absolute water bug. He is addition magician right now, putting it right in Matthew's wheelhouse nonstop. So these two together right now, this is, this is crazy madness. Matthew's kind of like the, the celebrations are pretty low key, at least the one Saturday night. Or was it Sunday night? Because it's so easy. It's like anything he shoots right now, it's going in. And then also, also half of them are nasty goals. It's not like he's like scoring weak goals, like these quick wrist shots. I mean, McDavid still probably gets goal of the week. What oh. what, what is happening there is is it's like how many times can you say the same thing? He's thirteen points away with seven games to go right now to a hundred. I want him to get it so bad. <laughs> I really that like because that. 56 games, 100 points. 13 points in his last seven games. He's gotten 13 in six games, 18 different times this season. I don't know how they measure that, but that's right, what well, the tweet well, said. I think he's going to do it. I, don't I know, man. My only concern here is, like, what do you – they don't have a lot other than him and Dreisaitl going into playoffs. Like, if they're not kicking on all cylinders, they ain't getting out of the north. That's their only chance. So what? how much – time how much energy of his do you put in stock into that to him getting that goal i think that well first off i gotta say you don't want to be rolling him out there 24 i know i know but but 
quickly before I get to that, because this is actually, well, Tuesday now, but so if, if last night he got three points, he will join Lemieux, Yager, Wayne Gretzky, and Adam Oates as the only players in the last 30 years to record 90 points in 50 games or fewer. Dude. I've those names, them. like that's why it's just ever heard I've of them. Heard exactly, Bez. And then in terms of getting the hundred, I think if I don't know, if with one game to go, he he's like five short. Does he sit that game? Like maybe maybe you sit him when it becomes unrealistic, but it really never is to him because he can go out and get six points one night. And Does it so, the like, first? And, and that goal, like, did you Walks see the side by side uh video images of that McDavid goal and Crosby's goal against Montreal back in the day? Yes. Pretty pretty like eerie almost how similar they are i mean he's doing the same type shit he's changing the game it it is watching him but it's he's this generation's gretzky i know that's lofty praise but when you when you're seeing these stats and he's in among all these names every single time i mean what this kid is doing is absolutely special the gretzky comparison for sure because like he's doing it the way that no one's ever done it before and it's like it's a level above the rest and 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 like i i like to put mckinnon in that level too because like sometimes you're just holy shit, but he's kind of just like nothing against me. It's just there's shit that he's doing out there. You're like, what the heck, man? I this think is he's kind of like, crazy. I think you could make an argument that he's. I wonder how this will be taken. He's better. <laughs> at, he's better at the <laughs> NH. He's better at the NHL than any other athlete is in their respective sport. Right now, correct. Maybe yes. not uh, soccer. Like I don't know that much about Messi, but everyone says, but. I don't see any other players changing their game and dominating the sport at a level like this guy is. Actually, I'm into F1 now. Lewis Hamilton. There you go. Oh, yeah. He's got, what, 97 wins now? He's just – he fucking wins. He gets the pole. Hey, he's a handsome week. fella, too. He must Stallion. just he, – Who's he dating? He's, he's married be dating. to um, the girl who sang, Loosen up your buttons, babe. I think one of the Pussycat Dolls. <laughs> Oh, she's stunning. The lead singer one. She she went off and did a solo thing too. I don't Help know. Help me her out. Name, she's digging it up. Oh, what's rocking. her name to it? I know it too. Well, well, we talked about Jennifer Aniston earlier. We didn't really dive into that. She like all right, was she the it girl when you were coming up? I, I mean, pop culture loved. I I don't I don't know that she was my it girl. Um I probably like Jennifer Connelly, Scarlett Johansson. Those were, they were probably a little more in my wheelhouse at the time. But yeah, Aniston. I mean, she, on Friends, she was fucking hot as hell. And Jennifer you know, Connelly is that the girl that's in the movie with um, Leo about the diamonds? Blood uh, Diamond. Blood Diamond. Yes, I believe so. Yeah, she was in Requiem for a Dream, the the drug movie from like the nineties. Yeah, she was the rocker. She's been in a bunch of stuff. Yeah, she always uh, butted my muffin pretty good. So Blood, uh, buttered your muffin. <laughs> Yeah. There it is. What a sick prick. <laughs> it says he's dating Victoria Odinkova, a Russian supermodel. Maybe I'm completely wrong. He's, oh, he's, I was going to say, man, this guy's at the peak. He's an if F1 Lewis driver. Ham- who's- if Lewis Hamilton has never been married or dated that girl from Pussycat Dolls, I'm losing my mind. Yeah. Cologne, is Germany. Nicole Scherzinger? Is that... Is that who we're trying to come up with? I don't know. Yes, she was like that's the most. Okay, perfect. That's that was driving one. me fucking crazy. I couldn't come up with it. Back to hockey. Sorry, boys. Yeah, Mitch, Mitch, Mon, uh, Mitch Mon has 231 points in his last 200 regular season games, Biz. I want to give him some props on that as well. Uh, but Connor, dude, he's got in his first 400 games played, 556 points. That's the sixth most all time. Gretzky, Lemieux, Stastny, Bossy, Curry, uh, Lindros. And, and that's, again, with the company he's keeping. So, all right. I think we've stroked them. Uh, stroked well, them it's just it's, before. and you compared the the, the side by sides of the goal comparisons with Crosby. Like, I think Kyle, him and him and Ovi were probably that last wave of guy that these new wave of guys have to keep up with as far as like the point standards, and they're always being compared constantly. You know, what did they do through this many games, guys? He he's he's absolutely everything is advertised, and 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 the way that the numbers show, it's it might get even sillier and sillier. So let's not be surprised by it, and just continue to stroke him off. Yeah. Throw in and the Shawn Michaels hey, gift. You, you got to show. show, show <laughs> The Shawn Michaels gift. To I'll McDavid. get the nut sack for don't him. Don't put too. my face on that one. That's biz. Yeah. <laughs> no, don't put it. Uh, yeah, that's going too far, memes. Oh, put, shit. Put, put our race face. Hey, and we got to shout out his uh, German uh, winger, superstar himself, who I think just became the leading scorer in the history of the NHL for Germans. Correct. And what is he, 22? Yeah. 20, it's like, what the fuck's this guy going to do? Yeah. He's like. 
doing he's he's he'd be talked about so much more it's it's like what he's actually done is 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 a, in a way like not shocking but certainly changes the game for for german hockey because they never had a true superstar and now it's like i i look at the development and the players in that country differently now and that cider coming up with detroit and stutzel it's like he's kind of been the leader in changing german hockey and, and where that nation's gone Love great, it. That's a great call. What they have been up and coming for the last few years in international play, and they got some fire uniforms too. Ah, those yep. fucking black. They almost look like the old Canucks ones. Yeah, Leon already the highest scorer in German, four hundred and eighty-eight points in four hundred and sixty-eight games. He passed Marco Sturm. Uh, obviously, he's going to keep adding to that. Uh, the Canadians, we got a great moment out of them. Should we uh, should yeah. we quickly mention oh. the Mike Smith comment? Oh. Got to got to dunk on the old squad. Of yeah, Grinelli, if you if you want to put the question and the answer, is there extra satisfaction for you putting probably the final nail in Calgary's playoff hopes here, um, considering the rival they are? Oof, man, uh, that was a long thought he had before he said that. He kind of had a gritted smirk on his face. So, yeah, I mean, they, they gave up on him basically in his mind. And he's been out of his mind this year, Biz. I'm glad you brought him up. 18-6-2, and two, uh, a 2 3 old goals against, 9 2 4 save percentage, three shutouts. I mean, this guy's, what, 38 years old. People are writing him off everywhere. And he's recaptured that magic he had, what, nine years ago in the desert. He's the oldest goalie in the league, right? Yep. He might be, yeah. The yeah. Smitty Redemption Tour. That's why I'm interested to see how these playoffs play out. So, Connor, pump the brakes a little bit. Get your rest. I would love to see a Toronto-Edmonton matchup. And I was I was bullish on Winnipeg, especially at the fact that Murley was all over him. But literally, since uh-huh. he came on our podcast, it's, it's, it's awful. I think Shifley might have got healthy scratch. Like the team's falling apart. I think I think it, it, somebody mentioned that they might be moving. So thanks Merle a lot, Merle. Merle. <laughs> oh, they're actually they're getting Atlanta. pitch and toss from Winnipeg again. Second hey, time. Actually, um, shout out to me, Ryan Miller, who recently announced his retirement. We'll talk about him later. He is the oldest goalie in the league, I think. I think he's yeah. older than Smitty. So that would have yeah. been bad. But we'll get into we'll get into uh, to Miller and his career. And what were we just talk- mentioning? Oh, Winnipeg, Oof. man, Winnipeg. They didn't do much at the at the deadline for D, right? I think what was it? Jordy Ben came over. They they lost Lowry a little while back, and before that, that Lowry, um, Cop, and Appleton were re- one of the best third lines in the league. So he's been gone. And then Ehlers is now out. So a lot of injury problems along with Hellebuck. Just he's been not himself, I'll say, in the last little while. So I don't know. Edmonton dominates them too. That would be, I, I, think, I think you're looking at a huge favorite if they, are, if they are indeed matched up. And of course, what they made the big trade for Pierre Luc Dubois. He got eight goals, 12 assists in 20 games. Um, I'm sorry, 20 points in 35 games. I'm sure they were expecting a lot more uh, action out of him in that regard. But well, yeah, he had the two week quarantine, and then maybe, uh, maybe he hasn't played well. I haven't seen enough to know, but the numbers aren't what you expected. Yeah. They've lost six in a row, and they're only two points ahead of Montreal. And like I wrote the blog the other day, I'm praying for a Toronto Montreal. Uh, playoff in the first round. They haven't played each other in the play since 1979. They've only played each other twice since the expansion in 67. So, I mean, Toronto, Montreal first round would be epic. What's up, Biz? Well, I was just going to ask, uh, Wit, how much stock do you put on um, how well you're playing leading right up into playoffs? Like, I, I, actually... I wonder what the correlation is to teams that, like, let's say in the last six games before entering, what their record was and, and how it, like, even the first round turns out. Because, like, right now, I clearly would give the advantage to Edmonton. And I don't think Montreal's anywhere near Toronto. But is this a situation where you think Montreal can just flip the switch? They did have a, a big, gutsy overtime win in which Cole, Cole Caulfield scored, scored his first NHL goal. But before that, they're like struggling to win games right now. They don't look very good. Yeah, they don't score a ton. And when you talk about going into the playoffs, I think if a, if a team that's wrapped up, you know, first in the conference, second in the conference, and they've struggled a little bit at the end. You're disappointed, but you're going to have the four days before the first round, and you're also ready to go. You know the season you had. You know the team you are. So I don't think playing bad can, like, kill you going in, but playing great certainly can't hurt. And you've seen all the instances of teams just fly in the last month to get the eighth spot back in the normal playoff division, you know, format. And then them having a crazy upset. I was on an Anaheim team. We were unreal. The last one I got dealt for Kunitz. 30 games or whatever after the deadline I was there. Team went on a run. We got into the playoffs. We beat the San Jose Sharks President's Trophy. So it can help. Um, 
Toronto, the thing is they're playing great. So it's like, the, while, while also having to deal with a team that's way more skilled than you in Toronto over Montreal, if that is the matchup, you're also dealing with a team right now that, that is firing on all cylinders. Like, like, like if you were on the Vegas Golden Knights, they were on a 10 game winning streak and they're, it was all crazy. And, and, and Coyotes ended up ending it, whatever. I'm not putting too, but like, would you be nervous? Would you, would you be nervous going into playoffs on like a 12 game winning streak? Would you, would you be like, Oh shit. No. No. Okay. No, I think you'd be pretty fired up. Okay. Yeah. Edmonton took seven out of nine games versus Winnipeg this season. So they're probably licking their chops um, at playing them. Caulfield, that, he's the youngest uh, Canadian to score a regular season overtime game on a goal. It was awesome. So, I mean, I even bet Ottawa that night, and I didn't mind watching that because it was just fucking such an Petrie awesome goal. Petrie made the team. play. What a play oh by Jeff Petrie. Goodness. Holy shit. Makes it into oh. a two-on-one and just feeds it right on his tape. He did a great job of leaning down and burying it, right? But it was a straight up tap in for the most part. Yeah, great celebration. Like, well, too, that's though. what I mean. Yeah, it was just a fun, a fun moment to see. What, Everyone whatever was so fired up is. for him. Suzuki, you noticed, I think, tackled him the hardest right, right off the bat. And I don't, I don't know their exact ages, but I think they're probably within a year or two of each other. Those two guys, right? I don't know when they were drafted, but um, you're looking at two guys, kind of the future of a team, and you're fired up for one of them to get his first. What a setting. One other note that Habs, uh, Jonathan Drouin took a personal leave. So obviously it's personal. We don't like to get into it. Just passing along for roster reasons. We obviously wish him the best and uh, hopefully we see him for the playoffs. Uh, Thomas Shabbat, got to give him a shout out on Ottawa. He's already fourth in defenseman points in Ottawa history going back to 92. Carlson, Redden, and Phillips are the three ahead of him. He's still a young pup. So uh, this kid's a stud on D. We've been talking about him for a long time. Uh, Vancouver, kind of some shitty news, but we can't ignore it because it's pretty per, uh, pretty pertinent. Jake Vertanen left the team uh, after some accusations about what was called sexual misconduct, an alleged incident back in September 2017. Uh, per Glacia Media, the woman had contacted the police. There are no charges, and none of these allegations have been proven in court. The team did release a statement. Uh, we've become aware of uh, concerning allegations made about Jake Vertanen. Our organization does not accept sexual misconduct of any kind, and the claims, as reported, are being treated very seriously. We have engaged external expertise to assist in an independent investigation, and we have placed the player on leave as we await more information. So, I mean, that's pretty much all there. There's not really not much to add. A uh, thing came up. The team's going to look into it. They, in the meantime, took him off the roster. So, again, we're just passing that along because it's pertinent news. Uh, we're going to jump over to the West, front of the program. Mark andre Fleury got his 489th win. He's now third all-time. I mean, he's what? What's, how old is he? What? He's, what, 34, 35? Uh, he's born in 84. He's probably 36, 37. Late eight, is he late 84 or early? 84? Yeah, yeah, he's a late 84. He was drafted first overall my year, but he was a late birthday. Yeah, and 36 so he, years old. Yep, so he actually, I mean, he's turning 37, right? How's that for math? Pretty good. If he hasn't already <laughs> turned 37. No, he's <laughs> turning 37 he's, in November. Goalies have such a shelf life, man. I know. Well, what do you mean? He's done it a long fucking time. Are you saying how shocking it is that he's still around doing that? No, I'm saying the goal, like goalies, man, like they, they play into well into their mid to late thirties. These guys who take care of themselves, yep. they don't have major yeah. injuries. He's, he, awesome. he, he's pretty dialed into his training. I don't think he was ever a big partier either. Like no. just like, yeah, just a, a, a family guy. He, so, he was in incredible so, shape. So incredible. Like, flexible. And he's like, not, he's not, he's skinny, right? Yeah, but he could skinny. just move so well. I, I, I think that, you know, you're, he's a hundred percent, a hall of famer. Um, I, I Vegas right now, they are so good, but the Minnesota wild actually are 10, two and two of them against them in their career. Like if they got the wild, if they had the season they've had and get the wild in the first round, that's a kick in the dick. And I actually think Minnesota, well, the numbers that the stat kind of shows that they just, they match up so much better against them than, than Colorado. I feel like Colorado could kind of smoke many. Well, you, well, they're both very physical teams too. Like Vegas, they play big boy hockey. Stone, Stone's getting in the mix every game, even against the Coyotes. Like he's invested every single game. He's he was going at guys, jibber jabbering, and then the whole team joins him. But same with same with Minnesota. They got that line. I think it's Felino and Greenway. <laughs> it could be fucking Nathan Gerby on that line. That's still a, an absolute meat fest. You know what I'm saying? No offense, Gerbs. But uh yeah, they 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 have a very big team. Now, right now it looks as if though Vegas is gonna take the first spot, right? Um, yeah, but what what is it? They both have seven games left. Yeah, uh, Vegas is, has a four point lead. Um doesn't Colorado have a game in hand? I think that, yeah, Colorado. I think. Yeah, and I think Colorado's schedule is way easier. 
Okay, so but, but for Colorado's sake, them drawing Minnesota would be a bit of a pain in the ass. And the fact that I don't know how many of the other yeah. guys they have out of the lineup right now are coming back. Same issue as last year. They got some guys banged up, right, R.A.? Uh, yeah, they've had injuries all you know all year. Grubauer, he's actually back in the line. I'm just sorry. got back. He, yeah, he just got back. He's been banged up. Rantanen's been backed up. Don Scoy, Saad, Calvert. I mean, Byer, O'Connor. All these guys have had injuries. I mean, hopefully they're resting some of these guys. I know, like, for, for example, Brandon Carlo in Boston. He's probably getting back in the lineup this week, but it's more a case of resting a guy for the playoffs, and you got to think Colorado's probably doing that with some of these guys. Why expend all this energy now when you're pretty much locked in on the second spot? Yeah. You know, it's just hard with because all of a sudden you got these. Those are pretty big names and guys who are you know a pretty big, pretty big piece of that lineup. So all of a sudden they got to get healthy and also get back their game legs in meantime for a potential very difficult first round against Minnesota if that's the way it all goes down. So this the West the West is extremely strong and it looks as if though fucking St. Louis is going to take out uh, that yeah. fourth spot. I thought I thought the Yotes had a chance. I'll go back to that good game run. And- yeah, good run. The the game they blew against LA when it was 3-1 going into the third and, and they lost in regulation, that put them on a downward spiral. I think they went like 9 and or uh 2 and 9 in their next 11 or something like that. It was just not not good, but St. Louis, man, they're playing some good hockey too. Yeah, they are and they they have the experience too, right? Like Minnesota's young and they're upcoming and the team's changed, but they aren't that experienced in the playoffs. And then you get the blues and you know what all these guys have been through and how they know what it takes. It's like them, them finally turning it on isn't a surprise. And it's also scary for every other team that could possibly face them. I'll say that. No doubt about that. Whit. Um, you already mentioned Ryan Miller. We're going to talk about him now. He's going to retire after the season. He announced in a press conference the other day, he has the most wins by a U.S. goalie with 391. He got his 391st Saturday night in his last game. He stopped 23 of 25 in a 6-2 win over the Kings. Great moment. The Kings all lined up after the game to handshake him. We've seen this with a few other guys this year at Milo. And, you know, it's just a testament to how the respect these guys have for each other. The moment he had with Johnny Quick, a fellow American, these guys battled together internationally. Uh, it's just a tremendous moment. Of course, Miller won the Vesna back in 2010, 41, 18, and 8, 9, 2, 9, 2, 2, 2, 5 shutouts. He played 11 years in Buffalo, brief stint in St. Louis, Vancouver, Anaheim for the last seven years. And of course, Team USA, like I mentioned, Wit. let's go to you on this one. Yeah, R.A., what a run for this guy. I had the chance to get to be a teammate of his for two weeks in Vancouver. And that two-week stretch of play might have been the greatest performance in 14 days a goalie's ever had. He was MVP of, the, of, the, of those winter games. Um, just kept us in every single game, made these ridiculous save over and over. It was like, you just didn't even want to go near the guy. He was on another level. So the Vesna trophy, uh, I, I think he could be in the Hall of Fame. Biz, did you ever uh, have any experiences with Milsey? I'll tell you what. I would say he probably gets, I would say he probably gets in, but if there's one reason why he shouldn't, it's because one of my seven goals that I scored in the national hockey league. No, you got him. Was on him. So Ryan, my apologies. If that's what the anchor that brings you down, I'll make it up to you by inviting you on the podcast and you can tell your entire career story. And uh, that's, that's all I can offer up at this time. But wit going back to what you said, ridiculous career the longevity is what you talked about earlier all right yes this is one of those guys that like holy what do you what do you play 20 years 20 seasons he played uh, excuse me 18 total nhl seasons oh my goodness that is crazy and like especially how you're moving as a goalie like i know like my hips are shit and you see some of these guys who start getting in their 30s where they just can't do it anymore. Like, and, and they're, and you know, they start the mechanics start all busting up and all of a sudden they're on the fucking the shelf for too long. It's, it's the longevity in, in that, that career is, is insane. And also, Michigan State, Hobie Baker, the best in college. In the AHL, he dominated. He, he spent like three years in the AHL and he was a fifth round pick. And then, Became the best goalie there. All right, then let's go to the next level. Gets the NHL and at one point was the best goalie there. So it was like this rise had happened for such a long time leading up to it that the career he had is just amazing. Unfortunately, he didn't win a Stanley Cup, but he certainly never um, never was at fault in terms of why teams didn't get it done. I'll say, I'll say those Buffalo teams had legit chances, and I think that, that he'll be remembered forever by Sabres fans. Wow, he got a Hobie Baker too. Yeah, he, he did it all, dude. 
Dude, I mean, the first couple seasons in Buffalo that he was a regular, uh, seven, started 74 games in 08, 67, 65. I mean, those are just insane numbers for, for a goalie. I mean, personally, I think he's going to be known as a great goalie. I don't think he's probably going to get in the Hall of Fame. I mean, he's most for U.S. wins. He's 14th all time. And as far as the Olympic stuff, the U.S. stuff, I don't think the voters give two shits about that in the Hall of Fame. We've talked about that before. I think they skew Canadian. So I, I think at the end of the end of the line, it'll probably be in the U.S. Hockey Hall of Fame. But um, you know, they're, they're, they always look at the resume and championships, and uh, you know it's probably going to work against them. But it doesn't take anything away from them. I mean, and that one goal, Hall of Fame. that one goal. Uh, you had to say that, didn't you, piss? Jesus Christ. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, dude, we, we've been talking goalies. I mean, but they've been giving us a lot to talk about. How about our buddy Jordan Bennington mixing it up with Cam Talbot? Like, he looks like he's trying to fire himself up to get in fucking savage mode for the playoffs, Biz. He's trying to drag the boys into it. I don't think he needs to do it anymore, though. It seems like they've woken up. Now now he's just doing it for personal reasons. That's psycho. Uh, yeah, they should just book him for the offseason, do some uh, some UFC-style fighting, get in the ring maybe. Him and Yablonski, <laughs> we can oh. line that one up. Yeah, we get some. Yeah. Uh, we get some. Uh, yeah, well, UFC and boxing talk a little bit later. We get some fun shit to get to. Yeah, that's uh, true. One, one last note from this division: Anze Kopitar is on the brink of a huge milestone. He's three points shy of one thousand. Uh, hopefully, he'll get it between uh, next couple of shows. He'll be the fourth player in King's history to reach that number after Dion Robitaille and Taylor. The first Slovenian to reach a thousand points, 18th European born to reach a thousand, 91st in NHL history with God tens of thousands of players. One of just eight active guys that will have a thousand, and the only active player to reach a thousand while not being selected in the top two of his draft. Just uh, an unbelievable career. I think being in LA, he, even with the, the cups, he's still somewhat unheralded, maybe because he's kind of a quiet personality. But you've you know you've seen him a shitload, Biz. Oh my goodness, he's just so good. He's like I say he's the Bar- he, yeah, the Barkov, the, the you know, he's the Barkov of the West, but obviously a lot more accomplished. Uh one of the best two-way centers in the league guys and he's still getting it done at a very elite level. And uh he's big yeah. bastard biz. Oh, he's a big bastard. Like on the ice too, it feels like he weighs 300 pounds. Yeah, you can't move him off of pucks. No. Well, it's actually it's actually freakish how how big he is and how he can move like that. There's a there's a few guys in the league that you're just yeah you just can't. You, I, I find like Matthews is like that too. He's just a fucking truck out yeah. there. The first time we met Austin Matthews, I was so shocked at how big he is and how quick he can move laterally. It's insane. It's fuck yeah. He is a he is a tree, a redwood. <laughs> all right, boys. Well, goalies are all about protection, and so isn't simply safe. Simply Safe is an award winning home security system, so you know it's engineered with the latest technology. You want to keep your family safe, but what really sets Simply Safe apart is its people. Highly trained security experts who are always there for you when you need them most. These are people who truly care about keeping you safe. So when an emergency happens, a person who cares is there for you by getting fire and police responses to your front door right away. Even if you're just having a problem setting up your system, it is pretty easy. Like I said, even I can do it. But a person who cares is going to be there to help you with the friendly chat and the quick resolution. The bottom line is when you need the most, Simply Safe is there 24 7 with people who care and experts trained to not only keep you safe, but to make you feel safe. To learn more about how Simply Safe can protect you and your family, visit simplysafe.com slash chicklets today to customize your system and get a free security camera. You can also get a 60-day risk-free trial, so there's nothing to lose. One more time, that's simplysafe.com slash chicklets. Check it out. Keep, this, keep the homestead safe like Ryan Miller and all the other goalies in the league. We talked about Colorado a minute ago. Now we're going to send it over to this stud, Gabriel Landestog. Land- Fuck. Fuck. I haven't, I haven't had a take to it. Fuck. No, 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 no. We got to keep it. No? Whoa. There was the anxiety. It came out because he doesn't have his glasses. He was pitching a perfect game. It, That's okay. You know, it was the stupidest fucking thing ever. I've been doing stuff on the fly. I put the cursor on the on his name so it didn't look like a letter, and it fucked me all up. But anyways, without further ado, Colorado stud Gabriel Landeskog. Well, it's a pleasure to welcome my next guest to the show. This Colorado forward is already in his 10th NHL season and ninth as captain of the Avalanche. Taken second overall in the 2011 draft, he won the call of the trophy and was named to the all-rookie team after his first season. And he currently plays on one of the most dominant lines in the NHL and is getting ready to return to the playoffs to take care of some unfinished business. Thanks so much for joining us on the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Gabriel Landeskog. How are we doing, brother? Long time no see. Yeah, doing well. Thanks for having me on, guys. Excited to be here. Absolutely. You just uh, said you just hit Vegas, but a little, little different than the usual trips to Vegas, eh? 
Very different. It's it's a different world we live in nowadays. And these trips used to be a blast, obviously in Vegas, but any road trip be a blast in general. And it's it's just so different. I feel bad for the new guys that came in this year, like Devon Taves and Brandon Sod and some of these guys that we that's the bonding time. I mean, they go on the road, go for dinners, go out for drinks. I mean, that's that's a really good bonding time. But nowadays we're just stuck in our hotel rooms. How if you many, don't how many trips to Vegas a year are you guys like lighting the lamp? <laughs> well, the the first year we were uh first year we I think we were two for two and and I think we got shut out in both games or something <laughs> like that. It was the, the Vegas flu was in full effect, that's for sure. <laughs> I remember I, yeah, I mean, the credit I wasn't card in, was taken up beaten too. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Tice was picking up some of those tabs and he, he, he was in his credit card was taken to beat in that year. I biz, we didn't get to play in the league when Vegas was a team, but I just remember here in Chicago, Quenville would take them for a little, like a little three day rodeo just cause he wanted to be there. That's when I was like, Oh my God, these guys haven't made. Now everyone gets to rip it up. That's it. It's, it's a good time. And, and I mean, Vegas, we all know what Vegas is and, and, uh, We've always had a tradition of after the season to go either here to Vegas for for two nights or we go to Scottsdale for two nights as an end of the year trip and and uh, and now we get a little bit of that during the season as well. Not quite as hard as an end of the year trip, but uh, it's a good tradition we got going. Stay out of my city, Landy. <laughs> Vegas, Vegas every year. Stay over there. <laughs> Gabe, as you know, in the show, we always like to go back at the beginning of guys' careers and, t- and take it from there. But I, I want to ask, what made you want to play in the Canadian juniors as opposed to the Swedish elite league? Yeah, you know, it's a good question. I've, I've gotten that quite a bit, and people seem to be a little bit confused by it. But at the time, I was even – I was pretty close to signing with Jurgard, my my team back home in, in Stockholm. And, and at that point, you're – you know, I was 16, 17 years old, and, and all of a sudden you got a contract where you're making – you know, 500 bucks a game or you're making, you, you know, at least some, some money. And that's pretty attractive when you're 16, 17 years old. But for me, the change was when I went over to play the under 18s um, in North Dakota and Fargo and say what you want about that city. I know they have an USHL team, I believe uh, could be wrong on that, but we were, we were there during the tournament. And I think the gold medal game was U S Canada and we were sitting in the stands and it was like 5,000 people going nuts for these you know, 16, 17 year olds playing. And I remember sitting there with my agent and he was saying, well, you know what? You don't have to play in the Swedish elite league next year. This could be an option, uh, whether it's here or in Canada or whatever. And I started thinking about it, uh, visited Kitchener and visited, uh, Mississauga as well. Um, and, uh, fell in love with Kitchener. I mean, they, Steve spot in that organization, they showed me around, showed me a good time and, and, and got me to meet my billet family and all that. And, and it was very, for me, I was very excited about the the idea of going and playing in front of 6,000 people and, and playing, you know, 68 games, which is a lot more than you play in, in Sweden. And and for me, my goal was obviously to play in the NHL, and I wanted to to get acclimated to, to the North American style of hockey. And, and I felt like I had so many more levels to, to get to and so many things to develop my game. Um, in the Swedish Elite League, it's easy coming up as a 16, 17-year-old, and, and you get stuck in that fourth line role and you get to play five, maybe 10 minutes a night if you're lucky and, and you're kind of molded into the, to, to that system. And, and for me, I just wanted to play a lot more. I wanted to develop and, and learn. And, and that was really the ultimate decision. And um, looking back at it, I guess it was the right one. I, um, I was going to ask as a follow-up as a Swede, did you feel any type of pressure like from the country and like, where they're like, why don't you want to play here? Why don't you want to stay over here and develop? A little bit, but not not a whole lot. I think maybe because I, I I don't think there was a whole lot of Swedish guys that went over at that point. So then they didn't really think there was, you know, they they didn't really know what they were what we were doing. They probably expected me to go for a year or two and then come back and play in the Swedish Elite League and then hopefully get drafted or whatever. But for me, my goal was to to develop and and to go play, and I saw it as a great adventure and. Um, you know, I went to high school for two years, which was, which was an experience in its own, a uh, bit of a culture shock going into those hallways. And, and it was just like the movie growing sucked up. sucked off in the bathroom in the hallway. <laughs> fucking stallion. No, 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 none of that. Oh, okay. but, it was, uh, <laughs> but it was, uh, it was a great experience and looking back at it, I learned so much and, and moving away at 16 was, it was tough for first, but I also always say that it was tougher probably on my mom and dad, that it was tough around me and, uh, cause I was busy playing and busy hanging out with my new teammates and, and all kinds of stuff. So, 
Um, but ultimately I see it go back to your question. I see it as if you go away and you develop and you become a better hockey player, it's a, it's a good thing for the Swedish hockey federation as well. And, and, uh, you know, it's, you know, all different, there, there's kinds of, there's all different routes to go about it. Right. Some, some guys, Adam Larson and, and some of these guys playing the Swedish elite league came up as young guys and played really well. So it's different I, ways I think- for everybody. Still, the shocker of the of the century biz is that London didn't buy this guy. I mean, what the <laughs> well, fuck were they doing? <laughs> I was going to ask: Were you drafted by Kitchener in the in the European draft, or I thought I read that you were drafted by Plymouth originally? Yeah, yeah, I was drafted by Plymouth originally. I remember that draft, the import draft, uh, sitting at home, and I was super excited. I thought Kitchener was going to pick me, and then somehow, I guess Plymouth got a sniff that I was interested in going, so they took a chance on me and. And for me, at that point, it kind of crushed my dreams. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to go now. <laughs> yeah, I, didn't know, I didn't know. <laughs> Kitchener ain't fucking Plymouth. <laughs> yeah. No, and the I, opposite is. Yeah, so I actually got – I remember sitting at home waiting for the import draft to happen. And I was excited about being a part of the Kitchener Rangers and, and all juiced up to go. Uh, especially because I'd visited. I knew I'd met my Billet family. I'd seen the rink. I'd met everybody. And then all of a sudden Plymouth got a sniff that I was going to, that I was interested in going and took a chance on me. And, and all of a sudden it's kind of uh, crushed my dreams a little bit. And I thought, well, I'm not going to go now. I don't know anything about Plymouth. I don't know where it is. I don't know who the coach is. I don't know anything. So um, it was a few tough weeks there of just kind of sitting around and, and, and uh, hoping that something was going to get done. And Steve spot was pretty adamant about it the whole time. He's like, we'll get something done here. And, and he was, smart enough during the import draft to draft Thomas Tatar, who was, uh, had just been drafted by the Red Wings and, you know, obviously Plymouth being in Michigan as well, thinking there was going to be a connection there and that was going to be attractive for the Whalers. So Thomas Tatar never ended up playing a game in the OHL, but they swapped me for Thomas Tatar. And I believe there might've been some other players or picks involved Yoink. as well. And, yeah. So it's, uh, I was very happy when that they trade went through them. and, and yeah, yeah. <laughs> It, uh, especially now after going to, you know, nothing bad, you know, towards the Plymouth Whalers, but after going and, and playing in that rink and, and playing in the Kitchener Auditorium Memorial, uh, in that barn, it's, it's very different. And I'm happy I, you know, spotter got that done. So, so is it true that your father, he played in the, in the SEL, right? Yeah. He played a couple of years in the Swiss elite league and then the second division. And that, and that I'm guessing is kind of like, how you fell in love with the game is through him and he got you into it. Yeah. At a pretty early age, he was done playing by the time I, uh, you know, I came around, but he uh, introduced me to the game of hockey, obviously, and, and put, put us out on an outdoor rink back home and, and uh, spent one winter uh, doing a backyard rink. And that was, I think he had enough after that. Cause it's, <laughs> it, it, it's a lot of work, uh, but yeah, fell in love with the game pretty, pretty easily. And, and, uh, played all kinds of stuff growing up, played soccer, played floorball, which I'm sure you guys don't know much about, but the European sport that we play up in the Scandinavian countries, that's kind of like wiffle ball inside type of thing. Um, and uh, yeah, played all kinds of stuff, but hockey was my number one love and, and uh, got fairly serious when you get up in the teenage years. But before that, it was just about having fun. Landon, you were the first European captain of Kitchener. How much of a challenge was that for you as a young kid, not just in a foreign land, but in Canada as a, a captain of a hockey team? Yeah, different. But I think at that point, my second year came around and my my language, my language skills had gotten a lot better. I was more comfortable in the room and, and things like that. My rookie year, I was, I'd like to think I was more quiet and reserved and just kind of uh, observing, but um but yeah, huge honor. Obviously, it's such a rich history in that organization, um, and, and learned a lot. And especially that being my draft year, and and uh, for me, my main thing was it, it didn't matter if it was that first year in Kitchener or eventually when I became the captain of the Avalanche. It was just be myself and um, don't try to be any anything else, and don't try to be something you're not. It was just pretty natural to me to just be myself. And, and uh, we had a good team there, a good group of guys that made it easy for me. And uh, I don't know if I stepped on anybody's toes that some of the overagers might've expected to see, but um, I think we were all pretty happy with the way it, it, it turned out. We had a really good group in that locker room. You mentioned the language barrier, but I, first time I saw you talk, I was like, no, that kid's from Medina, Minnesota. He's not, he's not from Sweden. Like, <laughs> I know a lot of guys from Sweden, they speak perfect English, but you really don't have much of an accent. Is that because you're from Stockholm, such an international city? Like, it's just crazy that you really can't tell that where you're from. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think I my dream, like I said, growing up was always to play in the NHL. And I, I'd watch Matt Sundin and Forsberg and, and Lidstrom, and did, they just seemed to handle themselves very well in, in the English language. And I was just like, well, I got to start paying attention in English class. And, and it's pretty simple. And then I came to Kitchener, still had a pretty heavy accident. Or accident. Still had a pretty ha- heavy accident. I take it back. Some of the guys were <laughs> – some of the guys <laughs> – some of the guys were ripping me pretty good in the room and I'd miss up. I, I remember my rip, my first year in Kitchener, we're in the room and, and I said something, somebody made a joke and I said, Oh, that was really fun. And everybody kind of looked at me They're like, <laughs> it wasn't fun. It was, you mean funny? And I didn't know the difference between fun and funny. And, and uh, guys were ripping me pretty good my first couple of years, but I learned pretty quickly. And, and uh, yeah, it's just the way it, you got to have fun with it. And I know it's, it's hard with a new language to, to get comfortable and, and it just, it's one of those things you got to try. And, and for the most part, when you try guys have a pretty good understanding of it. Uh, in, in Kitchener, it was your second year. You got the C you mentioned, you know, you weren't sure how maybe some of the older ages would have thought about it. It was your second year. It's a pretty cherished history there. And, you know, some guys had put in more time. Was there a conversation before they gave it to you, whether they thought maybe even you were ready to take it, or have you always been like a, a natural born leader where you thought you were probably going to get it? No, I, I really didn't think I was going to get it my second year there in Kitchener. And then, you know, coach just kind of called me in and said, are, do you want it? And are you, do you feel ready for it? And in my opinion, I was just, you know what, be a great challenge. It'd be a great adventure and, and a huge honor. So um, one of those things I, you know, you're not going to be the perfect captain. And as long as you accept that uh, and just try to be the best you can and, and try to listen to everybody and, and hear everybody's opinion, see everybody in the locker room, I think you're going to, you're going to do well. And going into that, that second year, well, the, the, the 2011 draft was at the end of that season. It ended up being uh, Nugent Hopkins, you, and the third overall pick was Huberto, a hell of a top three for, for that year. Going in, were you rated that high preseason by central scouting and stuff, or, or was it kind of a late season push? Like, how did your whole draft year go? Uh, I don't think I was rated that high. I was, I think I was rated in the first round at some point before the season started, and then um, – I had a good start to the season and, and, uh, and was scoring a bunch of goals. And, and it, it was just one of those things that as, as the season went along, I guess scouts started watching. And, and that was another thing about playing in the OHL was a good, good window of, of, uh, you know, showing off what you can do and a lot of scouts at the games and things like that. Um, uh, but even to this day, we joke, I talk to native all the time. If you look at who I'm sandwiched in betweens in that draft, I think Nuge had 110 points, Huberdeau had a hundred and something points and I was sitting there with 66 and, and Nate and I always joke about the intangibles. Nate always says, yeah, but they, those guys don't have intangibles like you do. Because <laughs> the whole time during the draft, the whole time during the draft, that's all they Bob McKenzie would talk about was my intangibles. And I just, yeah, at that point I didn't even know what it was, but um, yeah, happy with the way it worked out. I was going to ask before the draft, were you hoping to end up anywhere in particular or perhaps maybe trying to avoid anywhere in particular? Not really. Uh, I was excited about the opportunity to you know, obviously see in Colorado up there in the top three. And I think towards the end of the season, it was basically Huberto Hopkins and me and in, in, in different orders. So uh, I was a big Colorado Avalanche fan growing up, obviously with Peter Forsberg. He was kind of my guy growing up um, as well as Matt Sundin. And then eventually Henrik Zetterberg as well, but seeing the avalanche up there was, was uh, pretty exciting. And, and I didn't know much about the city of Denver. Uh, I knew the only thing I knew about Edmonton was that it was cold uh, and in Canada and I knew Florida was hot and sunny and, and Denver was ultimately kind of somewhere in between. Um, so I'm really happy. It kind of fits my lifestyle and I'm super happy with the way it turned out. And, and it's such a, you know, people at the start would talk about compare me against Forsberg, and that's just super unfair in my opinion. He's one of the best to ever play. So, um, absolutely, it's it's an honor to pull on that jersey every time, and and just trying to do my best. That's all it is. Not trying to be Peter Forsberg or Joe Sackick or anybody else. Just trying to be myself. I knew you grew up a, a massive Forsberg fan. Had you uh, had a chance to contact him before you were drafted to the Abs, or was that maybe what like what started the connection? Yeah, it actually kind of started the connection. Um, you know, I got some text messages after the draft from Peter. And then then after my rookie season, he does a, a chair, or used to do a charity tour 
uh, in Sweden every summer where he gets all kinds of NHL players together and we go and play local teams and, and raise money. And remember my rookie year, I was, I was, I was, I got to ask to go to that. And, and obviously I was super starstruck. Peter Forsberg, Matt's, uh, Marcus Naslin was there. Sadeen brothers were there, all kinds of players. And, and all of a sudden I look at the lineup and it's all charity games and it's all funny games and whatever, but 92 in between 21 and 19, I'm like, wait, that's me playing center, which I've never done in my life, playing oh my with goodness. Forsberg and, and Marcus Naslin. And those guys were huge the idols of mine. And I talked to Forsberg and I asked if it was a spell mistake. And he said, no, that's perfect. You guys, you're first in the four check and you're first on the back check. And then just give a fuck to us. So we, uh, a pretty cool experience. And then Peter and I have gotten to, to know each other uh, fairly well over the years. And he comes to Denver, he comes and stops in and says hi every time. So it's, he's a great guy. And, and uh, obviously he, he knew how to play the game. Well, you had no problem. You step right into the league. You win the Calder Trophy. Just this amazing year where you lead the team in goals. And ha- have you ever, like, imagined something going that smoothly, right? I mean, you dreamt of playing in the league. You learned English because you planned on beating the NHL. But never could you have imagined a season like that, huh? No, really couldn't have. And, and I mean, I was – it was just one of those things. You that, that whole rookie season, you look back at it, and it was just a whirlwind of, of you just trying to find your footing and trying to find your game. And, and everything is such a, at a, such a high pace. And, and not only that, I mean, in junior, you could kind of win stick battles by kind of going by them and, you'd, you'd, you know, you grab the puck and go. But here, everybody was so much stronger and, and in the right position the whole time. And um, it, it took a while to find my footing and and uh, and kind of get my game going. But it's one of those things, once you start – you know, gaining some confidence, you can go out and play. Uh, you know, I had, I played with Ryan O'Reilly that entire season. And we had, obviously now we've seen what he is. And in my opinion, he should be a Selkie, Selkie finalist every single year. Um, and, and he's just so good. And I remember at that point, he was, we were on the third line, me, him, and Dan Winnick. Uh, and then eventually we ended up working up playing with Milan Hayduk on the, on the other side. Uh, but I remember looking at factor and thinking this guy's a third liner. And I look at his stats and he had like 26 points in his first two seasons. And I'm like, how is this, this doesn't add up. And he exploded at 50 something points that year. And then obviously the rest is everybody knows who he is now. And you're like, if so. he's third liner, I, I don't know if I can play in this league. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. In so it was, yeah. Factor and factor, honestly, I, I credit a lot to him. Uh, you know, just seeing how he goes about his business every single day, how he prepared himself for games, how he he stays out there an hour after practice is over, just working on little details. And, and uh, you know, he, he kind of showed me the ropes of of putting in that work. And uh, and you can see how it's translated to his game now. Where could you imagine a night out with uh, this guy in the factor? Imagine yeah. in your rookie year. Yeah, I'd be residuals. holding the door for him. No, I'd be, they'd be sending me to get to the guy in the bathroom to get them breath mints and stuff. <laughs> that's the guy. Hey, Landy, that's I the do guy, it. too. I, I came back I, I, at a team meal when I got to play with Lemieux. I came back, and I said to, like, Murley or somebody, I was like, hey, I was like, like, do you, like, have to tip those guys? Like, I don't know. I feel like every time I go in, I got to tip them. And Mario looked over, and he just goes, what are you trying to save a buck? And I was just like, <laughs> oh. <laughs> pigeon toss. So you would have pigeon tossed me the same, I'm sure. Gabe, oh, I want to ask. You were named captain of the Avalanche after your first season. You're not even 20 years old yet. Uh, the team was, you know, somewhat in a transitional phase, had a lot of high picks. Did you have any sort of, like, mentor for helping you with the captainship, either in the room or outside? Yeah, we, we, we had a bunch of guys that, that were – great and I had some experience and you know Paul Stastny was one of them uh Milan Hayduke was there my first couple of years O'Reilly was another guy that I could lean on and, and was just uh, you know great guys in the room and uh, we had J.S. Jagir as well and whatever we we had some guys have been around that could help in the room but honestly looking back at it now I it, it was a few years early I think it was it was early for me and it was it, I, I know like you said it was kind of a part of where the organization was at where the team was at that point but uh man I was young and I was so green and I was just I didn't know myself what I was doing I didn't know I hadn't really established myself in the league even though I had a good first season but one season doesn't make a career um, 
so I was still trying to find my way and, and uh, you know, some bumps in the road and, and some really uncomfortable players only meetings and some uncomfortable decisions, but uh, kind of f- found my footing after a few years. And, and I was pretty honest with it from the get go, just like the Kitchener thing. I was like, listen, I'm not going to try to be Joe Sackick. I'm not trying to be Nicholas Lidstrom or Matt Sundin. I'm just trying to be myself and we'll see where this takes us. And, and just trying to learn along the way, really. Because you mentioned in Kitchener, like the listening. And as a captain, you kind of got to feel it out all the time and, you know, talk to these different personalities and try to make it all work. And you also mentioned coming in the NHL and how big of an adjustment it is. You're trying to, like, bring your game to the next level. So it's hard to exert brain power in, in, in both dynamics and try to balance it all, right? Is that's kind of yeah, what I, that? Exactly. And I try – I think when, when kind of things started clicking for me was when I just started really – it, it sounds maybe backwards, but you have to focus on yourself and you got to figure out your own game first. You got to, you know, you got to worry about yourself and where your game's at, go out and play the right way. Because if you don't do that, if you're not ready to play, you're not going to tell anybody else how to play or you're not going to tell anybody else how to back check or whatever. So your efforts got to come first and lead by example. And then, you know, after that with experience, obviously comes, comes some knowledge and, 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 uh, and some other things. So it's, um, one of those things where you just got to learn and, and, and keep grinding away. Um, was there ever a doubt? Uh, we talked to McKinnon and there were some doubts in his mind at a certain point, whether he could bring his game to that next level. Did you ever get, did you ever go through a period of that time where, whether you thought you could make the leap, the leap to being like an elite point getter in the league and, and a really a, a, a household name? Yeah. There, there's some ups and downs for sure, but especially in that second season, the lockout year. So they had just named me the captain right before they announced the lockout was happening. So by the time they announced I was going to be the captain was when we were still thinking there might be a season that year in 11, 12 or in 12, 13, excuse me. And, uh, and then the lockout happens and I was skating in Denver and, and the abs didn't want me to go down and play in the, in the AHL. So at that point I was kind of like, well, I got to go play somewhere. So I went back to Europe and played and, didn't really have a great fall uh, playing over there. Uh, came back. I think I might have been a little bit out of shape going into that training camp there in January and ended up getting it get absolutely crushed by Brad Stewart in San Jose. Got a conky. And then, you know, he I missed people. 10 games. He absolutely crushed me in the neutral zone. <laughs> I came around jumbo. I thought I had, I was feeling good that game. Came around jumbo in the neutral zone. Just a perfect angling job by jumbo. And then Brad Stewart came up and, Broke my nose, gave me a conky, and no you shit. know like, it was Charlie Horse and all kinds of stuff. He just oh absolutely God. ran me over. Yeah, I was everybody a, prepare right. shot. Yeah. <laughs> looks like so my was, uh, broke your the, toe. Yeah, yeah looks like exactly, my my, so. my bill at the Jeep dealership. <laughs> a carburetor? What the fuck's a carburetor? <laughs> yeah, so that season, I mean, I you know, not using the concussion as an excuse. Uh, but it, it was choppy that year and I didn't play well coming back after that. And, you know, at that point I was struggling to find my, the momentum again. And we came back the year after that, we got Patty Wah as a coach and, and then started finding my group played with Stastny and, and McKinnon, his rookie year and um, started finding my, my groove again. And, and there's always, you guys know it's during the season, there's always periods of time where you're doubting yourself, or you're not playing well and things like that. Confidence is low, but, but then it's funny. It just, all you need to go, you know, you just need to, puck off the shin pad to go in and sometimes the, the confidence can turn. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's one of those, it's a constant battle. Even year 10 now I've gone through some tough stretches this year where you're kind of like, man, where, what am I doing wrong? But um, stick with it. You talk about sticking with it. And then 2016, 17 came it was just a tough year for you guys. And Bednar was there, I think 22 wins. And I just wonder what changed that next season. Obviously McKinnon takes off. He gets 95 points. You double your point, you, your point output from the year prior. It was just like, it finally was just a different vibe in that room. Yeah. That number one, number two, uh, the team was different going into that 17, 18 season. Uh, the year before that was, you know, Varlama was hurt. Um, we had a bunch of guys, um, key guys going down with injuries, but at the same time, I guess our depth maybe wasn't as strong. Uh, and on top of that, we all had career worst seasons, so it just wasn't a good mix. And then when you're, I remember that season, we, we had fought our way back to being 500. We were nine to nine coming home to Denver. Uh, and we'd kind of been up and down 
funny part is actually that season we went six and zero in preseason, and we were feeling ourselves. <laughs> and then we won the first two games of the season. We're eight and zero under Betsy, oh, and we're yeah. like, "Yeah, this could be a good Fuck year." Man. Yeah, plan the parade. We <laughs> yeah, we fight our way back to nine and nine. We had a five game home stand, and we got one point out of it, and that was just kind of. And then I came back from an injury. We go into Montreal. Jerome McGinley's fifteen hundred NHL game. He put up like fifteen grand on the board, something like that. After six minutes, it was like seven nothing. We're we're losing. We ended up losing by ten one, and it was just a tough night. And after that, it was just it snowballed downhill, and and was a tough season. And um, it just really made you doubt. If we're talking about doubts, that made you doubt uh, all yeah. kinds of stuff about yourself. And um, we were really wondering, like, are we really this bad, or or what's going on? And then season after that, some changes were made. I'm glad they stuck with Bedsy and gave him yeah. obviously another shot at it because it really wasn't fair to him. He was thrown into it. I think Patty, Patty left August 10th or something like that the year prior. And Betsy came in with two weeks to prepare for training camp and wasn't fair. So after that, we got some young players in Tyson Joes came in and got a full, full training camp. Uh, JT Comfort already been there. Alexander Kerf was, was in there. Sam Gerard came uh, a bunch of these guys came and just really, excited our locker room and and we just said enough is enough i uh i think everyone probably asks you what mckinnon and what it's like to play with this guy regularly but when i talk about you having an, a big jump in points that year ranton and almost tripled his points from the year prior and I, I swear to God, he reminds me of Malkin sometimes the way he plays like yeah. did you know right away even that first year that this kid was special well thinking of think of it like this he was the only guy on that 16 17 season that scored 20 goals so he was he was basically the only guy that had a year that year. And we were, you know, you could definitely see that he he was something special. And and like you said, I mean, a Malkin, I think, is a very fair comparison, even though it's early. And, and the way he Gino's trots, been, though, like when he's getting yeah. going to the neutral zone, just this big yeah. lefty, you're like, Jesus. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, so it's – Miko's a very special player. Obviously, at that size, you don't expect him to be, you know, so mobile and, and, and kind of – bounce around the corners and coming out of battles with pucks and whatever, but he's, uh, he, he's got a lot of, he can basically do it all, uh, except for body check. And he doesn't like hitting anybody. He, he, he's physical and he can play, he can protect the puck, but he doesn't go, he, he doesn't go out of his way to hit somebody, which is pretty funny, but uh, he's a little reminding if I was, sometimes. Yeah. If I, was, if I was six, four, Jack two twenty five, I'd, I'd run, you know, I'd run around a little bit if I was Miko, but he's also dishing and, and, uh, he's a player, so he's he's fun to play with, no doubt. Landy, you mentioned Patrick Wire a couple of times. You played for him for three seasons. Is he the most intense coach you've ever played for? Yeah, I think so. Patty was, uh, yeah, Patty was definitely intense, and uh, you could tell he still had that fire in his eyes from from playing. And, and certain days, it was hard to know what side of the bed he was going to wake up on. He was a little bit unpredictable that way. Um, he was, he was very good at motivating his players. I'll say that he knew how to push buttons. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes he had crazy things going on. I remember the one time we, I believe it was the second year we had a little bit of a rough stretch. You know, sometimes you're going through a rough stretch, players can start to complain and, and kind of bitch and moan about certain things. Patty pulls us all in the video room and he shows us a motivational video from YouTube about, quacking and complaining as a duck or soaring like an eagle those are basically your that was basically your choice you had to make and basically sending us a message that hey we're, we're going to be soaring eagles we're going to you know puff our chests out and spread energy where we go and whatever so the game starts um and you we all know nate at this point and nate's you know vocal and and nate can kind of bark at his teammates sometimes when, it, when they're not doing their best and he came back to the bench and i guess he was barking at somebody and all of a sudden we, we're hearing that ramp, 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 ramp from <laughs> behind us and we're, we're looking back and it's our hall of fame coach patty Wah standing back there ramp, 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 just quacking at nate basically saying like giving him a reminder he should be soaring like an <laughs> eagle instead so patty was uh patty was uh he had some different tactics and we laugh about it to this day and uh he could run some bag skates i'll tell you that uh i felt bad we had Danny Breer and Jerome McGinley and some of these guys, uh, like older guys, um, and uh, they were kind of on the the last few years of their 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 careers. And 
and Patty's second year, things weren't going as, as he would have liked or we would have liked. And, and he started really bag skating us. And then we would go an hour and a half and, and barely any pucks. And, and I'm telling you, some of these games, we'd go in with 10, 11 guys would be coming out of the trainer's room with their groins taped up. And it just felt bad. But Patty, you know, it's one of those things when you start winning a couple of games and you've been bag skating, they think that's the recipe for success. So they kept, he kept with it. Biz, well, Patty was no, it. Patty was a good coach. Biz, there's no guarantee like old veterans despising their coach at the end of their career. It's always the guys at the end that just they're not playing as much as they've become accustomed to. The team's struggling. I saw it in Pittsburgh. Guys like fuck Terry. And <laughs> I don't know Patty Waugh enough, but it actually surprised me that he wasn't a little bit more forward thinking and in, in, in the fact that he was, you know, he had such a long career. So do you think it's just because he inherited from the older days that like you got to show up and, and work your absolute bag off and that's how you win. Yeah, I think so. But, but like I said, like Patty would have different tactics depending on what week it was really like some, some days he'd be a player's coach and come into the trainer's room and just shoot the shit and want to talk about, you know, he was telling stories about whatever other days it was just kind of, uh, you know, the complete opposite of being a hard ass and, and, and that kind of stuff. So he was almost, it, it almost felt like he was trying to be a mix of the old and the new kind of thing. And, and, but I think as a player, you appreciate when you know what you're getting from your coach and you appreciate that kind of consistency. So, um, yeah, it, it was, a, it was a really good experience though playing for Patty. We, you know, it was, it was cool. And, and obviously you could tell what made him so successful as a, as a player, you know, just that, the mental, that mindset of just, you know, he was going to, you, you've, I'm sure you guys seen the, the video of his first game as a coach behind the bench at the Pepsi center. He almost blew down the, the glass. In against between Anaheim. The, the, yeah. Against Anaheim. He was, he who was, who was the coach that, Carlisle for Anaheim? I think it was, who was Bruce Boudreau. I think. Oh my yeah. God. <laughs> <laughs> he would have popped this tip. fucking head off. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce, he's yeah. just looking for like the meal post game. He's like, Jeez. Yeah. and I think weren't you guys trucking them too? <laughs> I heard that's yeah, what the yeah. fight was about. They they didn't give him a free voucher for the meal the, in, the, in the in the meals room. That's what fucking Boudreaux was hot about. Yeah, it was uh, yeah. good memories, of Patty. <laughs> yeah, he he wasn't afraid to pull the goalie with five minutes left either. That was that was something that looked like it was going to catch on in the NHL, but it didn't last too long afterwards. Yeah, yeah, I remember we well speaking of that we. We were down four nothing in Vancouver, and Patty pulls a goalie with ten minutes to go, <laughs> and basically just gives the Sedins another cookie, and then we got dashed up again. And we were just like, "Thanks, Patty. Thanks for that dash." <laughs> quack quack. <laughs> yeah, quack quack. <laughs> uh, I want to uh, bring up Joe Sackick's name. Obviously, he's the general manager, and it's not in his job description. But does he ever give guys maybe pointers or tips, pull them aside, and say, "Hey, you know, maybe try this"? Or does he completely stay clear of that stuff? Uh, Joe's Joe's go-to advice is just shoot the puck, just shoot the puck, hit the net. Those, those are the so two things. Fan. Shoot the puck and <laughs> shoot the puck and hit the net. Those are the two things. And I feel like just saying back to him, "Hey, Joe, you score six hundred goals. You could take a, you could flick the wrister and go bar down like nobody else. So it's not the same thing. We got to actually try to aim and try to get the scoring <laughs> chance before we can just pull the pull the trigger. But yeah, Joe is Joe is a good guy. I don't I don't think he. You know, he doesn't want to get too involved in, in players or give too much advice. You know, he's around if we need it and we can talk to him. But other than that, he's he, he's just kind of that, you know, he's a GM, right? And he likes to be involved and likes to be around and show his face off. But he's uh, he, he's he's around and I think he's, um, you know, he's comfortable in his in his role as a GM right now. And um, he's been a good mentor for me, honestly, as a captain as well, early on, especially before he really became the GM to, to bounce some ideas off of. So it's really great having that guy around. Hey, Sackex, the shoot it guy on the power play at home at the Pepsi center, just yelling in the ozone. Shut it! Fucking shut it! <laughs> There's a fan yelling Especially- it and his buddy's like, what are you doing, dude? Come on, let him pass around. He's like, well, look who's yelling it behind us. It's Sackex <laughs> with a fucking loudspeaker. <laughs> shoot! Those people are idiots. I, I yeah. say it all the time. It's like you you can't just come in the zone and rip it when you're up a man, but that's Bruins fans for you. You'd be like Witt shooting into Patrick Marlowe's shin pads. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I forgot to include I went sliding into the net. After oh, the my block. goodness. Tough, you tough looks. Are, you tough are look one. Of myself. All right, well, speaking of offensive defensemen, Kale McCarr, he gets dis- discussed enough. I need to hear about this Samuel Gerrard little water bug out there flying around. I mean, what a trade to grab him. I think it was from Nashville too, right? 
Yeah, it was that three-way deal with uh, Duchesne, Turris, and, yeah. and him, yeah. What, what, yeah, right away, are you like, this guy's different level? Yeah, I mean, right away, we were, you know, he's got that spin move that's patented now almost that just he, he does it five times a game, five times a period. But uh, right off the bat, we were kind of, my stick is about this long, and, and we were just like, is this guy really, like, how is he going to play like this? But he just – he's continued to grow and he's continued to evolve into this. Now he's a 200 foot machine. He's the breakout machine and goes back there and breaks it out by him by himself. And, and offensively, you know, we know how mobile he is. You can't check the guy. And, um, it just, he's a guy that's really impressed me this year, especially when Kale went down early in the season and, and Gerard and, and Devon Taves, both guys have, have stepped up big and, and G in my opinion, you know, he's been one of our more consistent players all year and been one of our best players of the year. And he doesn't get a whole lot of love around the league, obviously, with Kale being on our team and, and, and things like that. So, gee, and he's a guy, he, he kind of likes it that way. I think he kind of likes being in the shadow and, and just kind of going about his business. Hey, as far as G's concerned, you guys give him a hard time about how many of the, the loop-de-loops he's doing? Do you guys get on him? Uh, all the time, all the time. We're calling him on the bench right now. He, he goes low to high to him. We're like, here it comes. And he goes for the, <laughs> the spin. But um, does, yeah, does Bednar get him on the, on the, what do you call it? The, the team video? Do you guys even bring it that far? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, Bedsy's got to be. He, sh- he shows him all the time. And we're, we're giving the old little holler in the, in the team meeting when he does it, start whistling and stuff. But G is, uh, you know, that's his move. And he's super effective at it, and uh, he's a fun player to watch. I'm telling you, if you don't, if you haven't seen Sam Gerrard enough, you got to start yeah. watching him. It's entertaining. He's he just he skates it everywhere. He doesn't even need to pass it. He's just move. He moves it himself. Hey, I got yeah. one more question about this. Okay, so Ronaldo was on the Coyotes, and I think he just entered the the league. And there was this, I think he ended up hitting McKinnon mid, mid ice. And I think Gerard yeah. went over to kind of be yeah. like, I'm going to go challenge this guy, realized, realized it was Ronaldo. And he kind of had shimmy shook him to a certain degree. And <laughs> Ronaldo's got a wick, a wick about this fucking big. <laughs> so he, he had already hit the eject button. I think his fucking gloves hit yeah. the score clock and he just pounded Gerard. Did Gerard go at him to, to try to protect uh, McKinnon to a certain degree? I think he did. I also don't think G knew who Ronaldo was at that point. <laughs> and just, you know, he was, he found out pretty quickly. Check the fucking game notes, buds. <laughs> yeah, no shit. <laughs> Check the fucking game notes. Oh, Wrong my door. Yeah. I, people were losing it and they wanted Ronaldo out of the league. And I'm like, I don't know, man. This guy was skating over, give him a little shimmy yeah. shake. He, I don't blame it, him. Yeah. Hey, I don't it, it was, Ronaldo's like, I get to run him over and fight Gerard. This is amazing. <laughs> He's just li- licking his chops at the stake of the yeah, penitentiary. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just needed a clarification on that. So th- thanks. Yeah, man. G. Yeah, we'll make sure G reads that. I think he started actually reading the stat sheet a little bit more after that. <laughs> G's a guy that he can be a little out, out to lunch sometimes from being from a small town, Roberval in Quebec. He, yeah, he's. Anyways, we could talk in a half an hour about different superstitions that that guy's got going on. It's, really? What's this his worst one? What? I mean, this guy's next level. He's. <laughs> oh, that that gets tough, dude. That gets... I don't know how he I'm does obsessed it. with this guy. Let's keep let's keep going. If if there's any way you guys can catch one of our live games and get out there for warm ups, I so can this guy. He's got <laughs> he's got a schedule to the T during on ice warm up. He'll go. You know, he'll go stretch for, you know, 90 seconds on this spot. And then he'll go stand on the blue line. And he just kind of leans on a stick and just kind of mean mugs. I don't know who he's mean mugging, but he's mean mugging somebody. <laughs> and then he goes, skates for a couple of laps. Then he does one of the horseshoe drills. Then he goes to the other side of the blue line, and straddles the blue line, mean mugs somebody. Again, I don't know what he's doing. And when he first started doing this stuff, we, me and Eric Johnson, we were just firing pucks at him. We're like, why the fuck is he standing over there? Like, we got, we got drills going on over here. But it, 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 you know, and then he's got this whole, and then he starts doing hot laps during when we're doing the half moon shooting and he's skating through the, the half moon and, and he's got all kinds of shit going on. And we were, we used to give it to him pretty good. And now we've just started accepting that's who he is to yeah. stay away from G and, and stay away from his spots. But yeah, it's, it, if to me, that looks exhausting doing that. You're, you're going to even it out with the fact that he's a, he's a one man breakout. It's like, as long as you yeah. keep doing that, we'll let <laughs> yeah. you command all the ice and warm up. All right, pal. Exactly. Yeah. 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 
Hey, Landy, how sick are you of the same seven teams over and over and over again? And do you like the two and three game sets that teams have been playing this year? Uh, yes and no. <laughs> um, it's a nice little, you know, if it was a during a regular season and you could, you know, you're staying over in a city for four or five nights and, and whatever you're playing a game, then you get back to your hotel room. It'd be fun. Cause you go off for dinner, you go off for drinks, whatever it'd be. Uh, it'd be great, but now it's kind of, you're locked in your cell and, and that's it. Um, it's, it's different. It's definitely different. And now it feels weird. We're, we're actually in Vegas now because to doing a makeup game. So we're here, uh, just for one game and it feels a little bit different this time around, but, hmm. um, definitely sick and tired of the seven teams that we've been playing. And, and I'm excited to, to get back out East next year and, and get back away and, and start playing the Canadian teams again and things like that. What has been the biggest challenge for, for you individually this season? As far as not as far as I guess a mental approach. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just a daily grind, right? We're playing every other night. I think that's probably it. And, and get used to how much we're actually playing in such a short period of time. Uh, you know, we obviously an eighty-two game season. You're playing a, a lot of hockey, but you're still getting a two or three day break here and there, or whatever. Uh, there's none of that this year. And honestly, at some points in the season, it's been nice because you've, your team's been rolling and you've been playing well. You just kind of want to keep playing. But the mental grind's probably been the toughest part of it and not being able to – it's kind of hard to, to switch off between games sometimes. And, and uh, you just kind of always – feels like your life is just consumed by hockey, which is – at times it's good, but at times you just kind of want to get away from it as well and, and uh, go have a night out or go for a nice dinner or whatever. It's – um, so that's been different, but honestly, it's the way the world we live in nowadays and just got to make the most of it and accept it for what it is, I guess. I read about this late nineties, uh, all-star game tape that you watched over and over that had Gretzky and Forsberg in it. Is there a backstory to that? Uh, did you, did my dad, did you talk to my dad about this or who? No, <laughs> no, 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 I, no, I had, a, was I had that an article. I had a buddy, I had a buddy who read it and, and, and sent it over. Yeah. Yeah, honestly, that was just um, – so growing up, we didn't get – my family didn't get the channels where they would show the NHL games. So my grandmother would would would, uh, would record them, and, and she would record a handful of games, and, and one of them happened to be – might have been the 98-99 All-Star game uh, where they were still – where at that point they were doing the format of North America versus the rest of the world. And, uh, and I believe I watched it, I don't know, 300 times growing up I would just always I mean at that point there was no phones I wasn't much of a video game guy I was just kind of that was kind of when I was starting to fall in love with the game of hockey and I would just always watch it and I think Gretzky had four goals and Joe had a couple of goals Forsberg as well and the skills competition and everything so I would just watch it all my VHS and I'd fast forward to the skills competition and watch that and just really just something that uh, got me it really fell in love with the game and just all always wanted to play in the NHL after that. And, and because in Sweden growing up at that point, wasn't a whole lot of NHL video on TV. It wasn't any games being shown really that I could watch. So uh, just one of those things I nerded out and, and uh, yeah. Was Fedorov in there with the flow? I'm pretty sure he was. Yeah. Oh he my was in goodness. There. That's yeah, what you yeah. fell in love with coming out of that fucking <laughs> tunnel with the laser light show. Hey, that video that always plays with, with him coming out with the fucking more, most gorgeous flow. Yeah. <laughs> and the Nikes. Those he had those the days. Nikes. Oh, the Nikes, hey, so, that's right. You mentioned Eric Johnson, former first overall pick. Is he still constantly fucking with people? Because when I was in Vancouver for the Olympics with him, he, like, texted me one night. I, I have to talk to him and get the whole story. He's like, are you wearing a thong? And I'm like, what? And then the rest of the tournament, he would just ask me the question over and over. I still don't even understand <laughs> and how he was fucking no with me, but he was. It. Yeah. He's, yeah, he, he hasn't been around a whole lot this year. We miss him because he's, he's been out with – he's been dealt, dealing with some yeah. injuries and, and some things. So kind of sucks because he's such a fun guy to, to have around the room. And he's been a guy, honestly, I should have probably mentioned earlier, he's going to be pissed when he hears this. Uh, like on one of those guys I've – yeah, I've been able to lean on him, honestly, throughout my entire career. He's my roommate coming into the league. Uh, he was such a – he's such a, like, annoying older brother coming into the league. It was almost like I was the older brother. I was almost more mature than he was. He was 23 at the time, and he would – we'd be roommates on the road, and I swear 
35 out of 41 road games that year, he'd leave his fake teeth around. He'd leave them sitting on his nightstand. He'd take the early bus. I'd take the second one. He'd just shoot me a text. Hey, do you mind grabbing my teeth? I'd be like, fuck, not again. Um, just annoying shit like that. And, and, uh, but he's, he's a fun guy to have around. He keeps it loose. He's, uh, uh, he loves to give it, but he doesn't love taking it. Uh, I don't know if you guys heard the story. The, the one time me, me and Jamie McGinn, we were in practice and EJ blocked it. He honestly blocked a backhand shot from the blue line. So you could just imagine what a muffin that is. I mean, we're in the NHL. We're supposed to be able to shoot backhands, but from the blue line, it's pretty hard to do. Uh, so he blocks a backhander from the blue line and he goes down like he's, his foot was in four different pieces and he basically crawls to the bench and we're just like, everybody's kind of looking around all confused because it turns out to be a bone bruise. The next game he was fine and he was able to play. So we, we started having fun with it. So me and Jamie McGinn go out there and I, and he grabs the spray, uh, the, the spray paint and I go and lay on the ice kind of like it, like I'm a crime scene victim. And he draws a line outline of my body and we put pylons all around it, sprayed number six in, in the middle of it. And he was so, he was so mad that we made fun oh. of him. And he was like, yeah, he, he wasn't happy. I think, I believe he cut out the pockets of Jamie against jeans after that. And he wasn't thrilled. And then Ginner was pissed because they were nice, true religion jeans and, and everybody oh, else was like, well, those, those jeans, you shouldn't be wearing those anyways. <laughs> um, but yeah. Un oh my unbelievable hey so the funny story is boyd gordon who blocked a ton of shots uh yans blocked one one time and it was a bit of a muffin too and Yans sometimes wasn't able to take it too same thing he fucking gordo <laughs> chirped him about it wires crossed they, they weren't talking for like five days <laughs> It was ugly in the locker room, but obviously the the, the relationship uh, came back together, and it was like a funny funny reentry. Yeah, yeah. Lanny, there's been some big news about the new TV deals. Obviously, uh, the NHL is going to be back on ESPN, and then it just came out TNT is going to be their other partners. That's some guys have been chatting it about it all. Do they even care? You know, given the prominence of ESPN. Yeah, a little bit. We were just talking about this morning. Um, who's going to be on that TNT panel? Is that going to be you guys, or who's going to be on there? This, we'll, this, we'll try this, I think I think Biz is going to just take over TNT. That's well, one saying. of the prerequisites one of the prerequisites is you have to know how to read. So already I'm <laughs> fucking out of the mix. So <laughs> the, the, the buck stops there, buddy. Uh, yeah. I we, we don't know, man. It's kind of an interesting question, and the hockey's in a very very cool place, and I think they're going to do a great job of, of figuring out who's going to be in it. And and I think that I mean the game is the game is thriving. What are the guys saying in the locker room? Yeah. I mean, obviously the game is, like you said, it, it it's really growing and obviously it sucks that we're not being able to capitalize on how good the league is right now and, and have some fans in the building. But, um, but yeah, I think it's great news back in on ESPN and then TNT, I think is going to be good as well. Uh, there's something about NBC, NBC sports. So I've always liked that. Um, you know, this will be the first time in a long time. I believe that we're not going to be on NBC, but uh, I think ESPN would be cool, um, you know, hopefully grow the game in, in the U.S. markets a little bit more and, and, and get on TV a little bit more there. So I'm excited. Um, and I think it'd be good for, obviously, for the cap and, and for all kinds of stuff. And pretty A lot of money in, involved in those deals. If you were calling the shots, what one move would you make TV-wise? What move would I make in terms of uh, who do I put on the panel? Or what or, or channel? Maybe maybe making like a national game of the week or something along those lines. Uh, I feel like Saturday night is like a, a was a huge wasted opportunity by NBC not kind of making that a hockey night, sort of like they're doing not not sort of yeah. like what what they do in Canada. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you there. Uh, hockey night in Canada is definitely special, and especially when you talk to the Canadian guys that you know Saturday nights that was that was the night. And you look at football, obviously now I'm so Americanized that you know, I love football and I'm in three different fantasy leagues and this and that. And, and, you know, Monday, Thursdays and Sundays, you know, that's, that's where you're watching. And and I think at this point, my wife knows that as well. And, and she doesn't battle me for the remote. So uh, that would be pretty cool to get to that point in hockey where, where there's designated nights for it. And, and it's just um, hockey days of, of the week, I guess. And I think Saturday would be a pretty good spot for it. I think no doubt, the best team you've been on since you got into the league and, and all in a year where, where your contracts are coming up. And has it been hard to kind of not think about that? Have you talked with the team? How's that gone? 
Uh, we talked a little bit after the bubble and then in the off season, but, um, uh, we haven't talked talk much lately, and I think once the season started, we I think we both sides kind of agreed that we'll just focus on playing and focus on trying to win the cup, and then we'll we'll deal with it after. And I feel pretty comfortable with where we're at and the position that we're at, and and uh, you know it's been uh, Denver's my home, and it has been my home for ten years, and and I I love the city, I love the fans, I love the team and the organization. I've been pretty pretty upfront with that ever, you know, ever since I came to the team. And even that 16, 17 season when, you know, there are trade rumors going around and whatever, I was pretty adamant about, I want to stay. I want to be a part of the solution and, and a part of this team. So, um, you know, we'll see how things go, but um, I'm excited for for the possibility of, of staying in Denver and and what that would, um, how that would go about. So um, we'll see. And, and right now, you know, you guys know what it's like. It's during the season. I don't think anybody really likes to, get into that stuff you you just kind of want to play and and uh and do that the only way you're like come talk to me is if you're just going to give me a max deal at like nine million a season then maybe we can yeah at at that point we can discuss it yeah joe and i can sit down and have a coffee (laughs) um landy we had brian burke on and he was saying that he thinks that you're going to be an nhl gm one day is that something that he got from in conversation with you or was that just an off-the-cuff thing or or I don't know. Do I give off the GM vibe? Is that something? Is that a vibe that I get? I, I guess he he thinks so. So I don't know if you want to be given off that vibe. I don't know either. Yeah, Joe's going to trade you. Vibe. He sees you as a threat. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I, I heard those comments and I was kind of laughing. And some guys are asking me about it. And I honestly, I really don't feel like I'm the right person to be a GM. Like I'm not. I'm not into the numbers. I'm not into you know, I've never really been a dream of mine to build a team. In my opinion, it seems like it's a stressful job. And um, I don't know. We'll see, I guess. I don't want to close any doors at this point, but um, I don't know. I got to work on my vibe. I don't want to be giving off the GM vibes already. Yeah. After that next deal, I don't think you'll need to worry about getting a job after you retire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, hey, we can't thank you enough for coming on because, um, you know, long time coming that we get to finally chat with you. Your team's a blast to watch. It's going to be a sick run for you guys, I hope. And and we're looking forward to watching you guys, hopefully playing deep into the postseason. So thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on, guys. Keep doing your thing. You guys are a blast to listen to. Uh, Landy, two quick things. Uh, the <laughs> the offside in, in San Jose. I was going to oh, ask let's you. talk about this. Yeah, oh. ask it. Uh, so I, wanted off the air. I wanted to talk about that before I let you go. And the next thing I'll, I'll save till after your answer. Uh, that offside was, I guess we can say it now because it's so far removed, but we've studied that in depth hundreds of times and it wasn't offside. <gasps> it wasn't what's, offside. What's being missed? What's being missed? Because by the time I get off the ice, I'm off the ice by the time I think it's Colin Wilson. who's Whoever's got the puck. I think it's Willie. By the time he regains control of the puck, I'm off the ice. Now, I don't want to stir anything here. No, I what might have what, to look at it again, but yeah. There's been certain offsides where I'm like, I don't know, it looks like, it, and then it switches because the player hasn't made contact with the puck on the other side of the blue yet. Is that what you're saying? That's what I'm saying. So I think if you're, you know, if the puck is in the zone, that's usually what they're looking at, right? But if if a player is kind of pushing it over the zone, that's offside if I was to have my skate in the zone. But if the puck was kind of chipped in, so there's nobody has possession of it. And at that point, to think of it like he, I don't know, it's hard to explain when they're not watching it, but there was no possession until I was off. And that's what our team was. We were rattled once we found that out a couple of days later, we actually sat down and really looked at it. And because I couldn't go into the off season without looking at it. I'm doing uh, a true crime podcast on it. Yeah. I don't know. You might have to get some, uh, might have to get some officials uh, involved and see what they actually think. It would be fun to get, if you guys could get some linesmen or some, some, some actual referees on the pod. Have you guys had any, any active guys on? We're we're gonna, I think eventually have you guys before I got on. We no had Kerry Frazier. Oh, Kerry Frazier. Yeah. I did a one on one of them. Jesus Christ. Yeah. No, I'm not active. He said active. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. and the last thing I was going to say, as far as what you might want to see from the NHL, I kind of had a bit of proposal because my mind went somewhere. What about Gary Bettman Dunk Tank? He visits every arena on Saturdays throughout the year. So, when the home team scores, he gets dunked and he has to stay there the whole game and get dunked. <laughs> 
<laughs> Would that yeah, not sell great. tickets and, and get and get Absolutely. more viewership? Absolutely. Yeah, I think. Okay. Do you think you'd agree to it? Well, I was going to say, talk to the <laughs> NHLPA, maybe ask them what they think of it, and let's get the ball rolling. I think Gary Bettman, yeah. Dunk Tank, let's fucking go, baby. That's a, There you go, TNT, free idea. Hey, your, yeah. your, your best argument in the offsides thing is, if you're not considered too many men, how are you considered offsides? Like, yeah, yeah. That was, exactly. I just kind of rewatched it because I forgot about it. That was a joke. Yeah, it's. I mean, it's one of those things that, like, you can flip it any which way you want as well. Like, my original feeling was, well, why the fuck didn't I pull over the <laughs> I get, try to get in the gate, and whoever the goalie was sitting there was sleeping, and somebody oh. else was tying their skates right there, so couldn't open the gate, so it takes me 15 seconds to get on the bench. But... Yeah, that kind of, that was kind of tough to swallow, but um, it is what it is. Landy, it wasn't meant to I've be. been saying it from the beginning. I think I tweeted it out when it happened. I said, you always need a fucking gate guy. So talk to Joe. Who knows? <laughs> Maybe we can work something out. League minimum. We'll do a, a long-term deal. I want the security. <laughs> gate guy. Let's fucking go. Yeah. Hashtag gate guy. All right. Well, All right thanks boys. for coming on, buddy. You're awesome. Absolutely. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Landy. <laughs> Huge thanks to Gabe for joining us, man. He's from Sweden and he speaks better English than the four of us do somehow. I mean, you would never know he was from a non-North American country talking to him, but it was great talking to him. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. Can't wait to see him in the playoffs. He's one of today's great athletes and today's athletes deserve more than your grandfather's tired old salty sports drink, which is full of artificial dyes and the body armor made with potassium packed electrolytes, antioxidants, and B vitamins, plus no artificial sweetness, flavors, or dyes. Body Armor Sports Drink provides hard work and hydration and more, plus it tastes great. My favorite flavor is Tropical Chaos. That's what they used to call me in Cancun with. Body Armor helps today's athletes stay on top of their game. Body Armor is great stuff. Of course, summer's right around the corner. Weather's starting to turn, so hydrate with our favorite sports drink, Body Armor. All flavors of body armor are available for store for sale on Amazon and in store purchases right now. So many flavors strawberry, banana, fruit punch, orange, mango, pineapple, coconut, blackout berry, mixed berry. And again, tropical chaos. I'm gonna have some of that in a little bit. Good stuff. Check it out. All right, we're gonna go back to the hockey. We're gonna take a look at the central. I don't know if you guys caught this too. This is a pretty interesting nugget from Elliot Friedman Saturday night. Rod Brindamore, he's actually somehow in a fucking contract year. I don't know how they haven't locked him up yet. Uh, you talk about a team player. Well, he's he basically told the organization, I'll resign. If you resign uh, my assistants, the trainers, um, the fucking sick boys, all, all the staff. He just wants everything in place. He likes what they got. And basically, I mean, he's, I don't know if they're going to call his bluff. I don't think he's, I don't know if he's bluffing. I shouldn't probably say that word, but basically he wants an extension for not just himself, everybody. So it's something to keep an eye on. I mean, I think Carolina would be fucking foolish Dude, not loyal. to do that. Wow. What a guy. I think it's crazy because it wasn't I, – I thought it was just his coaching staff. And then I – from from Elliot, I heard it was actually everyone involved. Like, I, I think it could be the like the omelet guy in the locker room is probably included. <laughs> so – Yeah. And he does have uh, – he does have some serious leverage, right? Because if he wasn't re-signed by them, he'd have a job in so six seconds. Teams would fire coaches to fucking hire him. Like, yeah. So yeah. he's like – I'd hire, I'd hire him power. to be my life coach. By the way <laughs> – I'd give him five sheets to be my life coach. Yeah, dude, I'd be, we'd be stuck in the gym the rest of our lives, uh, eating granola that doesn't have any sugar in it somehow. Fuck that. He just wants to be paid in protein. That's I actually, what I heard. That's what I, I caught wind of, which would it, actually surpass any NHL coach right now per year. So it's a, it's a conflicted. Um, very nice of him. He also, um, in doing this, I think he knows, or it's 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 well known that it, his contract's not going to be. Um, like a big six million a year run one, right? Where you see these new coaches, these guys getting big deals. Like I don't think his would be monstrous. So he probably knows if you want me here, take care of everyone else. It'd be interesting to see how it plays out. I mean, why wouldn't they? First in the central right now, the what seventy five points. They're pretty you no. Know, they're not running away with a Tampa and Florida or nipping at the heels. But I don't know. It seems like a no brainer if I'm the owner of that fucking team. Hey, uh, another thing too. How much did he make when he played? Like fifty. 
Oh, he was probably getting four or five hundred grand a year most of his career. I remember the first no. time. Brendamore? Brendamore? No. I think no, when no. they won the cup Maybe, no, by the end, like he was er, I think in, in Philly. Career. I think in Philly he was making pretty big dough. Brunelli, for them. help you out. Maybe Not 30 50 million, though. I don't know if he made 50. Okay, all right. I'm Let crazy. Me, out Let right me see now. what and oh, we see. go to the Google machine. The recent search history. Elephant. 50 well, million. Fuck rights, baby. I fucking knew it. Not a boy. Ari thought he played in the 50s. <laughs> no, I, no, but he started in what, like the fucking. Already thought he played fucking six hundred games in the A dude, and then finished his career. In the he field. started in fucking eighty nine ninety, and then I guarantee went to the KHL. I, I guarantee you, he wasn't making more than fucking <laughs> six fucking no, probably six high six figures for the first early part of his career, dude. He broke in in nineteen ninety. Guys weren't making fucking anything back then. The TV. Well, he probably fucking brought the owner now. in the back room and fucking flexed at him and said, "I'm gonna pop your fucking head off if you don't give me a nice fat fucking extension." He fucking hang clean 350 and then stared him in the eye and said, look me, look me in the face and tell me you're not giving me any deal. <laughs> I remember I the first do it. The first time I seen a picture of him without a shirt on in the hockey news, and it was like it was like a revelation because you know you don't see guys how fucking chiseled and jacked they are. I was like, holy shit, this guy's a fucking monster, man. All right, uh Florida. We had a funny story down there. Chris Dreed, you got a new master goalie down there, and uh who would though have, I guess he bought a baby blue Lambo and there's a picture of him. So he had that painted on the side of his helmet. That's Keith right next to him too. Right. And shotgun wit. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. He, uh, Keith, maybe before training camp, but uh, he had a few other players on the other side too. Just like a classic helmet with a little tribute to the boys. And we got to give a notch uh, shout out to Sam Bennett, man. I don't know what Calgary was doing with him up fucking up there in Alberta, but he's been on fire since he got to Florida. He got his 12th point in his ninth game. He had took him 38 games to get to that number in Calgary. So uh, that, that's a, a change of scenery that's worked very well. He's been well having a lot guy. more Burt Reynolds. I met that guy at the Stampede. He, he, uh, you know those shots, Burt Reynolds? Wait, wait, what? Uh, there's a, sh- a shot called the Burt Reynolds? Or you yeah, yeah. Reynolds? Oh. I, hey, I don't know. I don't even know what's in it. He just kept talking about it and ordering them, and we kept doing them. And so, can you Google what's in a Burt Reynolds Grinelli so we could tell everybody? But this Sam I think Bennett whiskey's guy, in it. I oh. used to do, I used to have those. They were in Edmonton. I remember. Yeah, yeah, that was. I think that was the only night I blacked out. So thanks, Sam Bennett, and uh, and he's probably having a couple on the beach right now, enjoying all these points he's putting up. Burt Reynolds. He never. He was. He was never really. I mean, I'm sure there was times he played on a top two line, and Calgary fans might say different, but. With, the, with his draft where he's third overall or fourth overall, he's got sc- crazy amounts of skill that you just, you know, it would come out at some point or you thought it would. And now it's just small sample size where he's lit it up. The Burt Reynolds shot equal part spice rum and butter ripple schnapps. So I was wrong. Ooh, no whiskey, snaps. He called schnapps schnapps. Well, it ain't pink. Whitney, schnapps so are, I ain't schnapps are anymore, those, so. not fucking shots. Dude, Burt Reynolds, though, he's a top three American sex symbol in the men category. All fucking time, dude. There was no bigger sex symbol style than Burt Reynolds in the 70s, man. One of the other thing I've been watching on YouTube is all these old actors on these uh, talk shows. Oh, my goodness. Did they used to let it fly back then? It, it wow. was it was unbelievable. To, you, like, so, old, so old Oprah interviews, or what do you mean? Like no, farther back. Like Burt Reynolds was on uh, a couple of them. Who was the? It was Johnny Carson, the big one of the big ones. Oh yeah, oh yeah. I I'll go to his YouTube channel and watch all these old interviews that they used to do. They're, Dude, they're, it's so intriguing. It was just a, it was so much. I think it was just better because it was the, the the they opened up and they were they seemed a lot more normal. Yeah, well, and half of them are probably fucking drunk. If anybody wants to laugh, go look at all the road, all the Rodney Dangerfield clips from Johnny Carson. You'll sit at your fucking chair for hours and laugh. I mean, yeah, one of the funniest are, comedians ever. Oh, just n- nonstop. One of the fucking quickest guys you've ever seen. Uh, the other big story in the Central, of course, Dallas and Nashville battling. No, I know why Tigers eat their young. <laughs> what movie are they? Shitty old two. Oh, uh, Tigers eat their young Caddyshack. Yeah. <laughs> Look, give me a box of Nickelodeon. That's another one I haven't seen front oh, to back. Biz, this oh, biz. Not front to back. I've seen, I, listen, I, I'm trying to find a night where I, I, I can get into it. Maybe I got to smoke a certain type of joint to be able to, to, to get the so – I've watched some of it. I get I get a little bit bored. The humor – some of the humor doesn't sit well with me. When you oh, respect I, I can the understand fact, that. When you re- respect the fact – I love that this, it. Uh, who, who's the, who, who's the guy Chase, you guys – Bill Murray, no, the, Ted Knight, Rodney Dangerfield. Ron Dangerfield. So when you when you know when you realize that he was doing these scenes all banged up on coke and it's it's like it's 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 a comical. It adds a different element to it. So I'll circle back on that in Animal House. 
Dude, I read the book on the making of Caddyshack. Highly recommended. Chris Nishawati, I think you say his name. It's unbelievable. And Rodney never acted before. He was a c- comedian. And they would go, okay, three, two, one, uh, roll or whatever, like action. And Rodney would just stand there. And, the, and Harold Ramis, the director, would be like, Rodney, what? He's like, oh, he, he didn't know what to do. And he's like, oh, what do you mean? Like, do my bit? He's like, yeah, yeah, Rodney, do your bit. And then they like, they did it over. And he just comes in and just does all that off the fucking cuff, all tooted up. And there's actually a scene when they're at the, that fancy dinner where Spalding fucking drinks all the drinks and pukes in the car. In the background, Doug Kenny, who wrote both Animal, Animal House and Caddyshack, or co-wrote, you see him in the background holding a fucking plate of wolf in the broad, leaning down Come going on. To snap in Caddyshack. You what? Come it. on. It's fucking in the movie, dude. It's oh, like a, a Caddyshack goodness. Easter egg. Doug Kenny's giving a snap into the broad oh, next to him way, way in the background. Oh, the days yeah. where you could fucking <laughs> sit up doing that, you wouldn't feel like absolute dog yeah. shit for three weeks straight. Uh, fuck, tell me about it. Oh. Different different time then. Different uh, UC time. Saros, man, uh, absolute tear. I mean, me and uh, Merle have been pounding him lately. He's been almost an automatic win. Huge game he had against Dallas the other night. Uh, Dallas lost in overtime to Nashville. Last two months, I'm not sure I'll update these stats. Uh, 21 games, 35 total goals against, 947 overall save percentage, 958 during five on five. He won 15 of those games. I mean, he's he single-handedly kind of pulling Nashville into the playoffs right now. But Dallas, they're going, not going down without a fight. Biz, call the race not over yet. We were giving it to Kirill Kaprizov a few a few weeks ago, and Jason Robinson comes out of nowhere. Uh, seemingly, he had, a, he had a rough start. He's actually got more points per game right now than uh, Kaprizov. He's got 15 goals, 25 assists in 46 games. Kaprizov, 23 goals, 20 assists in 50 games. Uh, is this a coin flip or what? No, I think I think that if 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 Kaprizov throws it neutral, I still think he's going to come ahead, finishing in first. That's just, you know, I think that I think that uh, part of the fact that there was that early hype and he, and he lived up to it and he sustained it the entire time. This kid's put on an unbelievable what would you say three quarters of the season. Early on, I didn't. I don't know how. I, I I wasn't hearing about him, but all of a sudden, you know, he's catching up. But there are still a few so, few games left. Who who knows? They've had crazy things happen there for league awards before. Remember when Jamie Ben ended up like, uh, I think in the last game in the third period, he had like two or three Won points the scoring title in right? order to win the scoring title. So that was a, that was wild. Uh, because you saw it in real time and the building was completely aware that he needed to get it in order to win it. And the bench and the teammates, that, that was, that's one of the coolest highlights in, in recent memory of seeing a guy win a league award. Yeah, that's true. And I think that as much as we've talked about Minnesota's vibe kind of changing and like their whole team and how you watch them is just, it's all approached different now. I don't know, at least from, from a, from afar, the way I am. And it's kind of cause of Kaprizov. So I think that goes into it and them being in the playoffs. Maybe if Dallas gets in the playoffs, he's got a little more bit of a chance to, to overtake him. But I think that the goals that Kareel scored are, 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 have been that much more impactful too, right? Like these are, these are some of the best goals of the year. Yeah. And, and so that kind of changes also the view, like, around the entire league of, of him compared to Robertson. That's a very fair statement. But Dallas getting Sagan back. So um, he released a pretty cool video, actually. It's like two minutes of following him from the morning he got surgery. And I didn't even know he had hip and then knee surgery. And he was like, you know, I think he had the second surgery 60 days after the hip surgery. So what he's been through to finally come back and play uh, last night is, is pretty awesome to see. ESPN.com. Emily Kaplan has a great piece about Robinson that dropped Monday. It's about his whole story, his whole hit family history. You know, his brother's uh, plays for Toronto, his season, how it started off kind of shitty. And now he's in the call, the call, the race. So that's a great read. And another great read dropped on Monday, Aaron Portsline. He covers Columbus on for the athletic does a fantastic job. And it's a really good read about something we've talked about on the show a bunch of times. Why can't Columbus retain their great players? Why does no one want to go there? And he talked to three guys anonymously, and they didn't really sue or anybody. They gave honest answers. Uh, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read it, but basically, you know, they were saying Yamo's such a hot ass on restricted free agents. Sometimes it makes them not even want to play there when they are when they're unrestricted, and they think he kind of maybe looks toward the future too much. They didn't have anything bad to say about him, uh, but it was a very interesting read. Oh, for sure, from a player's perspective, it's like, hey, like (laughs) guys are getting offered more to go play in places that like tend to win more. And it's also, I don't know, maybe a more fun place to live. And like the the people, the people who were interviewed in the article were pretty positive about the experience of living there. They loved it. They were, they, they said, said a lot of the time when they said, no, I love it there. People were maybe surprised at their answer, but 
I agree. So, so, so would you say that before never, no one was ever prepared to maybe hold it against Yarmo as to why maybe they're unable to retain that? How do you feel about what you took from the article, R.A.? I think it's a combination of factors. Uh, I think it's, you know, Columbus, and there's no disrespect to the city, but like the article says, it's not Miami, it's not L.A. It's, you know, it's kind of a quiet Midwestern town. I think it's probably not on the level of St. Louis when we talk Midwest. Uh, I love the quote one of the guys said, uh, he actually said wheeling girls like <laughs> in the quote. He's like, "Guy, young players want to wheel girls, and he mentioned like Montreal and Miami. And, hey, he was being honest. It's like, you know, th- there's probably less whatever potential for that. But, yeah, they're having a hard time keeping guys, and I- I'm not blaming it on Yamo. I didn't really I mean I intimate that well because one guy said i love torts but i'd fire torts like he's just he looks like he's all done the team's tuned him out so there was a variety of answers and i think there's a variety of well, reasons it, it, well it's also i was kind of is is yarrow maybe self-aware that he's he's kind of chiseling and that's why the words got noticed to why guys are like hey i'm not taking a fucking hometown discount to play in columbus buddy like i i i, I like the place but <laughs> no yeah. offense and and i mean the, the one the one that I, I, was uh <laughs> The one that got swept under the rug the most as far as not getting as much attention was the Anderson move, right? Because he was only prepared to sign a one-year deal because he's like, no, like I don't like the way that the dealings go here. And and sure enough, he ended up getting what, exactly what he wanted and he gets to play in Montreal. So it's like why – I feel like players have more leverage now than ever. They're going to be trying to use it. You need to draft – like you need to get a superstar because, I mean, I love the city of Pittsburgh, but – People probably won't be happy with this, but is it that much different than Columbus? I mean, I don't know. Like, Ohio State's a huge university. Like, if people want to go play in Pittsburgh, Crosby and Malkin have been there. Columbus has never had a true, like, legit superstar. And if you did, like, guys will go play in Edmonton because of fucking McDavid, right? I mean, it's not going to always happen. But I've spent time in Columbus playing Muirfield Village, sick golf course. I think it's in Dublin, Ohio, outside Columbus. It's a nice place, right? I mean, you could definitely enjoy yourself, but in terms of like dealing with hard asses all the time can definitely get old, man. It's like some of these guys, like you with all the arguments you just put forth and then also like getting your balls busted by torts and then Yarmo probably being a hard ass to do contract negotiations with. It's just people are ready to move on. Um, So the Rick Nash great era, fans. The great Rick fans. Nash era, I mean, Yarmo is obviously not going to get, you know, thrown under the bus for that. Cause they weren't really, they weren't able to surround him with enough pieces. Yep. Cause you, you, you made the comparison to, to Crosby being able to track. Well, I don't think I, that's a, I, I, Rick Nash is a, a incredible player, but I'm talking like a true, like superstar, okay. like got okay. somebody that a Crosby, McDavid, Ovechkin, where no matter what I city you're was, in, guys are going to play with I thought he was kind of there at one point. He did, was, he win, he, did he win a, a, a league award? He won. Uh, I think he shared the Rocket Richard one year, I believe. Nasher was awesome, but I'm just, I'm, I'm, yeah. I don't think he was that Fair true, enough. like all time great. It's still probably be, uh, is Rick Nash Hall of Famer? I'm not exactly sure, no. but. No, he's not. Sorry, no disrespect, but it does, that's hey, kind of one of those filthy. questions you can just yes or no on a lot of guys. Uh, and one, I, one thing I want to say about the article, the players had nothing really but great things to say about the fans there and the, and the passion, and they were even taken aback at how, how, how much passion they had there so yeah it's clear there's an issue and i don't know if the organization is going to take this with a grain of salt or read it and whatever and i don't think it's going to change what they do but either way man they got they got to do something if they want to retain all this talent great talent they keep bringing in it keeps leaving so all right we're going to shift over to the east your boys the pittsburgh penguins they had a two in one week they clinched a playoff spot for the 15th straight season they've been seven two and one since the deadline jeff carter four goals two assists in 10 games they're getting gino back uh, monday night tonight I mean, Penguins, man, a couple about a month ago, I don't think anybody was worried about him. Now it's a different can of worms to get in the goaltender and Gino coming back. Quit. It's it's ridiculous. I think if um, if they actually win their last four games in regulation, they clinch that division. And who would have ever guessed that they were going to win it at, at one point when when Berkey and Hextall came in? What's wild is what they've done without Malkin and sixteen five and two, right? And and like. I think they've ranked second in the NHL in goals per game since he's been gone. So Crosby's always stepped up and Malkin's always stepped up when Crosby's been out. So it, it, it continued to happen. Now Malkin comes back in. He's going to play with Kapanen and Zucker, right? And then they got the Crosby with playing with Rust and Gensel. Rust, another two goals Sunday. Just been so good. And then that third line, Jeff Carter's there. It's like 
this is a team right now that if you if you see them getting hot and they continue to get that goaltending, it's like they could win the Stanley Cup. It's wild, but they this core has done it before. What's to say with this season they're having? It couldn't happen again. Gino's rested too. Let's see what he brings because before he, before he went down, he certainly wasn't having like a Malkin type season. And Biz, you've been the one to say that was it you? Maybe someone we interviewed that he's going to have one more season that like is like legendary, and maybe maybe it's this postseason. Um, and f- I mean, I think I think in the second cup they won too. I think Latang was out, and they, they didn't even really have much of a back end. No offense to the guys who were who, you know who were in the six, but if they get solid goaltending and Latang's humming like he, like he has in the past, look out. I think Matheson's actually out for a little bit, and he's been good, right? He's yeah, traded over he, from Florida and like catches some heat sometimes. Oh, some bonehead so plays, so much flack, but he skates so well, right? He can play like tons of minutes, doesn't get tired. So losing him could be bad. I don't know how long he's out for. Uh, S- Simeon Valamov, man, talking about goalies, man, they're just dominating the show. He owned the Rangers. He shot them out four times this season, including back to back to close the season. He's got seven that leads the league. He struggled about a month or so ago, but he's, he's ob- obviously recaptured his game. The Islanders, they're right in the thick of it. I know we've talked about him plenty on this show. I wouldn't want to play them in the first round. I'll tell you, they're just like that sort of well-oiled machine that Trotz has going. Um, Biz, how about the fight between Chara and Matt Martin? How about that great picture? That I don't. I, we got to give credit who took the picture we put on the Instagram. A Chara reached back. That looked like it was out of a movie, man. That was some scary shit. That's like staring down the barrel of a gun. <laughs> oh yeah, that's just the boogeyman came to life right underneath your bed and staring at you with a disgusting mask Those, on or like something. Poltergeist. I mean, it almost looks like he takes it. Maybe not on Matt Martin that night, but some guys it almost looks like he, he lets up on because he knows he could just. I fucking think he does with on. everyone, and he's just. A, I mean, if he's the genuinely nice person, I know he's a giant, but he's just like a, like a really kind human being. So it goes against his nature. Uh, I got to stroke my boys off once again. Still on fire since the deadline. Nine and two. Ha- Taylor Hall, how you doing? Let's get some drinks. Let's get a burger at Lazar. These guys are fucking flying. Uh, Brandon Carlos coming back. He missed seventeen games. His head is fine. He had something else bugging him, but that's a huge addition for this team going to the playoffs i'm telling you i uh, i got i i throw a little extra dough on the bees this year late because they were 16 to 1 a week ago i tried to get it in in time i didn't they dropped down to thir- 11 then they went up to 13 i'm telling you man i'm very confident about this squad right now biz okay yeah, they, uh, oh this east is unbelievable yeah it's it, to get out of that is going to be a battle I, I i actually actually I think the only team that won't get out is the Islanders and people are just going to say I'm being a bully, but no, I'm not. I, the Islanders, I know they don't give up goals and yes, they're D's ridiculous and it's just been, but you got to remember the Islanders, they're 20 and 20 and two against the non-playoff teams they played against this year. They don't score goals. They can't score. So while being a very difficult out, I do not think they can win, but Washington Pitt, Boston, it's like, I don't know who to pick and Boston, Halsey has shown who David Krejci like really is. You can forget at times that this guy, the career he's had has been so good, so instrumental in the Bruins having this run where they've been such a good team for so long. And then he gets a true like star winger on his side and like, oh my God, that assist he had on Saturday, the double toe drag at the blue line and then on the two on one is like just to give him a tap and Halsey looked right over right away just to say <laughs> what a dish. So for, <laughs> Marshawn too. Marshawn's like, like one of the best players in the league. Bergeron, they are nasty. And to keep getting guys back healthy, heads up for the bees. You're right, all right. Oh, there was a stat about the hat trick that uh, Smith had that in the last how many of her years, it, uh, there was like four guys that have only had a hat trick. Do you have that one? I don't have that one. No, but uh, I don't no, know if, if it was on the tech stream. Sorry, buddy. Sorry about all right, no that. worries, no worries. Um, uh, Kata Hot, Philadelphia, he's all done for the year. He's got an MCL sprain in his knee. Uh, Philadelphia, man, ugh, you talk about uh, falling apart. And this one's courtesy of Bill Meltzer uh, on Twitter. Through the end of February, the Flyers had a 3.39 goals per game average. And bu- buoyed by back-to-back shutouts against Buffalo, had brought their season goals against average down to 2.89. From March till May 1st, the team is 11, 18, and 4 with a 2.42 goals per game average and a 3.94 goals against. That's just ugly. I mean, 3.94 from March to May. They just fell apart, man. And, and you, you wonder what's, if there's something else to miss with that team. I know, you know, Carter had his problems this year and they probably maybe throw him out to the fire a little too soon. And, you know, Elliot's a, a good, probably backup, good 1A guy. But, I mean, this team just fucking melted down. They weren't getting their offense from anywhere. What, what did you see? 
I just saw a team collapse, and I think I picked them to win the division. Stay en fuego. <laughs> I couldn't believe how pathetic they were the second half. And I, I, I plan on seeing some significant changes, right? I think there's going to be names maybe in and out of there that, that surprise some people, but it, it can't keep continuing on like this. I mean, 1975 was their last Stanley Cup. It's been quite a while, and you think that this year there were some high expectations and I don't know what happened. I mean, the goaltending, yeah, for sure. But overall, it was just a mess. Bernie Perron. Uh, Grinelli just sent that uh, text over. I'm sorry, tweet over. Biz. Craig Smith is the first Bruins player other than Bergeron, Marshawn, Pasta, or Krejci to record a hat trick since Broadway Jimmy Hayes back in December of 2015. So that's wow. just, that's a wild stat. Yeah, shout out. Like, yep. Hazy's trick. Uh all right, we got one more story from the East, and it's actually a, a pretty good one, pretty nice story. It's going to happen after the, the show already drops. The undrafted nine-year pro Michael Hauser is going to get his first career NHL start in net for Buffalo. Uh, his last game was, uh, let's see, March 7th of 2020 for the East Coast Hockey League Cincy Cyclones. He's got one AHL game under his belt since 1617. Buffalo's goaltending has been decimated. Elmox out. UPL's waiting on a diagnosis. Tukoski needs rest. This is the sixth goaltender Buffalo's used this year. What a story. You guys both know him. Biz, let's go to you first on Hauser. Well, you play with him, I think, uh, maybe before me, Whit, right, in San Antonio. Was his last AHL game for the Ontario Reign? Because that's where I play with him. This guy was the apps, the biggest degenerate gambler. And I think the boys went off to a Vegas trip. Um, during one of our all-star breaks and then, <laughs> and somehow he got talked into getting a Bud Light tattoo on his ass. I think, I think it's on his ass. And two weeks l- later, Bud Light changed its logo. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. He, he, this guy was an absolute cartoon character. Great from, I think he just got the tattoo to like boost the morale on this trip. Like that's the kind of guy he is. Dude, this guy was awesome. Team. Oh, and my b- by the way, like, it's a miracle he's playing goalie, dude. He was born uh, with like yes. club feet, fourteen surgeries by two years old, man. Yes, yes. Like that is, imagine like being his parents and going through that, and then for him to make it is like such a feel good story. I played with him his second year pro. He was up and down on the coast. He was hilarious. He was a degenerate. <laughs> and then if you look at uh, his next year when I was in Russia, that's when he had like a really good season. I think yeah, he was nineteen and nine for San Antonio the next year. So I, I, I'm really happy for him because I think that second year um, when I did play with him, it was his first AHL start. So getting to see him go through that and then years later, he's getting an NHL go. It's it's awesome. And he'll make a little bit more money to spend this summer. He's, he's the backup when On he's getting the, hey, when he's getting the start. He's the backup where like, oh, the boys are like, how is he's getting the start tonight? Let's go. Because, <laughs> you know, he's going to be an absolute degenerate the next day for football Sunday. And he's going to get absolutely <laughs> hammered. You know, it's, no, he was, he was the man. And he had a really good career um, with the London Knights as well. I think they they wanted a pretty long playoff run. They might even went to the Memorial Cup that year. So he had a great career, man. So really happy for him to be getting this uh, and a nice little bright spot at the end of the season for the Buffalo Sabers. I hope he fucking gets a shutout. Oh, that would be fall. Be sick. Uh, I'd, be, I'd be crying like the Bieber doc. And you know, guys are going to be selling out the f- totally for him tonight because of the guy's oh, situation. Yeah. It's like you know when they when they put uh, what's his name David A is in that game, and you know Carolina just rallied around him and played, man. So oh, you're keep... comparing him to a the guy that plays men's league. Well, I mean, as far as so far as the team's going to fucking like, all right, this guy, like, look at his record; he's no, never I played know. before. I you know, I, yeah, I know they're going to fucking go wild for him. So. Uh, all right, guys, we're going to get serious here for a second. Uh, last year, obviously, you've been harder on everybody, harder on some people than others. Uh, that's why we're going to do something new, and we're partnering, partnering with our new sponsor, BetterHelp Online Therapy. At Barstool Sports, we truly love and appreciate our listeners. Without them, none of us would be able to do what we do. I pinch myself every day that I'm able to do this for a living. Uh, believe me, I do. Uh, so once in a while, we try to bring you something good. Maybe this is for you. Maybe it's not. Uh, but a lot of us take care of our bodies uh, but with as tough a year of it's been, a lot of us maybe not think about taking care of our minds because, you know, we can just get wrapped up in stuff. Uh, and there's a misunderstanding about what therapy is. It can be whatever you want it to be. It doesn't have to be sitting around just talking about your feelings. Uh, one thing that always moves me when we meet fans is they tell us how chicklets help them get through something or a bad time, and it makes this all worth it. So, you know, a lot of people are battling whether they're temper, stress, uh, too much to manage. You know, you hear so much about depression, anxiety, PTSD. The, the list goes on. You know, if this is you, you can use therapy to get some tools to make life easier. 
Uh, everybody is struggling with something. There's no more shame. I think people talk about this. We talk about it on the show. You hear a lot more about it. You don't have to tell everybody your personal business, but you can talk to a therapist, do it privately, and you know get that some help that you might need. And BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist. So you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. So join the millions of people who are seeing what therapy is really all about. It's always a good time to invest in yourself because you are your greatest asset. And this podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp, and our listeners get 10% off the first month at betterhelp.com slash chicklets. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash chicklets, C-H-I-C-L-E-T-S. And, you know, I know there are like boom and hot out there who don't like this stuff, but, you know, it's tough to reach out. But once you take that first step, it, it, it's pretty easy after that. And worst thing that can happen is somebody tells you something and gives their opinion and maybe says something that they think could help and you disagree with them. <laughs> I mean, it's seriously there. And, and, and on the flip side, somebody could say something that makes you really realize things or look at things in a different way. And because of that, there's no like absolute no harm in, in maybe talking to someone if you're feeling down about anything. So glad we've partnered up with them. It's a say it again, our better help, better right. slash chicklets. Good job. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Really well said to our, eh? Thank you. Thanks, boys. Um, well, next up, I, I mentioned Biz did this interview solo with uh, Caleb Dahlgren. Uh, he wrote the book Crossroads, My Story of Tragedy and Resilience as a Humboldt Bronco. Uh, of course, April 6, 2018, we lost 16 souls on that day, one of hockey's darkest days. And Biz sat down with Caleb to talk about his story and the book. So we're, we're going to go to that right now. This is uh, pretty, pretty heavy stuff, but pretty important stuff. So without further ado, here's Caleb Dahlgren. <laughs> Checklets fans, a very special guest today, Caleb Dahlgren, former assistant captain of the Humboldt Broncos. Uh, we're all aware of the situation happened just over three years ago on April 6, 2018. Caleb, welcome to the Spit and Chicklets podcast. Thank you so much for having me on here. It's an absolute honor to be on this. Thank you very much. I'm probably, this is probably the most nervous I've ever been for an interview, my friend. And uh, like I said, it's an honor to have you on. Uh, a lot of things in the pipeline for you. You started a charity for type 1 diabetes. You're currently attending York University. You just released a book that is number one in all of Canada, a bestseller. Uh, how, how have you been? <laughs> Life's been pretty crazy, not going to lie. It's been pretty crazy, but just enjoying it and trying to enjoy the whole process. And yeah, right now, this book is. I don't even know what to expect going into it and coming out of here. It's, it's been pretty crazy. And uh, just support around that has been incredible. And even support after the crash and into today, just make me the person I am. It's something I'm really grateful for. So I would imagine a, a lot of the book tour right now is taking place on Zoom just because you're in Canada with the lockdowns and everything. Yeah. So it's been strictly on Zoom, Skype, uh, phone calls. And I've been in Halifax in one minute. And the next minute I'm in Vancouver. So I mean, it's pretty sweet to have that kind of opportunity to be across Canada in any second. Um, but uh, yeah, it's nice to have that. And it's also kind of tough because I like having the personal connection with people and chatting and meeting people. But uh, this will do for now. So looking forward to returning in person eventually. And he's got those pearly white teeth, Mikey. Look at that. Mike. You don't look like a <laughs> hockey player. You look like a male model. Looks like, oh. looks like Claude Giroux. <laughs> <laughs> he does have a little bit of closure. So uh, you were born in uh, uh, Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. Then you ended up moving on to Saskatoon. You betcha. Yeah. Weird names. Hey, for all those American fans out there, Moose Jaw and Saskatoon. <laughs> probably, probably like, what's going on? Where is this guy? It's in Saskatchewan, which is another weird spot. So, yeah, I know I was born in Moose Jaw, moved to Saskatoon when I was six and grew up in Saskatoon. And then when I was 16, I moved to North Balford for two years moved to Wilcox for another two and then to Humboldt my last year. And now I'm in Toronto with the York university. So kind of been all over the place. We were talking about Patty Marlowe breaking uh, Gordy house games played record and, and how everybody from Saskatchewan. And I hope I'm saying it properly because G Boyd Gordon, who's from there always used to give me a hard time about saying Saskatchewan wrong. Am I saying it properly? I'd say you're saying it correct. Yeah. It's Saskatchewan. And a lot okay. of people say Saskatchewan. Or, yeah, so Saskatchewan won. You got it. You got it right. And, and, and Witt was just talking about how everybody from there is just so friendly. And you're, you're very similar. Just a happy-go-lucky guy. I'm sure loved being at the rink and always has a smile on your face. Well, thank you. No, I appreciate that. And you're right. It was amazing to see Patrick Marlowe just 
beat the record. I was unbelievable. And two Sasky guys too, which is crazy. I mean, both of them are world renowned people and at least our community of Saskatchewan, everybody knows them. So uh, it's pretty cool to see that happen in real life today and be able to be a part of that. So I, I want to dive into your, your career and your life growing up in Saskatchewan. Uh, at the age of two and a half years old, you started skating. Yeah. Yeah. I absolutely loved it. I was on the ice and my parents, well, even when I was born, my parents said, uh, welcome to the world at 2015 first round draft pick, Caleb Dahlgren. Obviously it didn't turn out like that, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> absolutely loved me. And, uh, hockey was in my blood for sure. So yeah, I strapped on the skates when I was two and a half and never looked back. It was, it was the best. I absolutely loved the wind going through my hair, sound of my skates, even when you breathe and you see like the little cloud come up. That was what I loved about it. Not only your own love, but, but of course, uh, a family that is hardcore hockey. Like I, I heard your mom's the biggest Yarmir Yager fan. You were actually, in <laughs> fact, also named after a former hockey player, correct? Yeah, Musha Warrior. So there's a CHL team, Musha Warriors and Musha. And I was named after Caleb Toth, who ended up being an NLL player later on. But he was a warrior at the time. And they thought that name was pretty cool. He's a tough guy. And uh, they wanted me to be tough. So it's pretty funny. <laughs> I was, I was going to ask you, uh, were you trying to emulate your game after him? <laughs> I don't know about that, but uh, five foot eight. So I'm not really the tallest in the game. Can't really be a tough guy when you're five foot eight. I mean, there has been guys that have been, even Nasty Morasty. I'm not sure if you know him. I fought him about five guy. or six times. He's a Sasky guy too. Oh, great. yes. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not like him by any means, but uh, yeah, I, I try to play a shutdown role later on in my career. Uh, why? How did your mom become the biggest Yarmir Yager fan? She loved his flow. And that was the thing that I thought was hilarious. She actually loved his locks. And uh, that was her, that was her appeal to him. He was a great player and well-renowned. Like guy was unbelievable in the NHL and she loved how good he was, but he also looked really good. So in warmups, when he rocked the no bucket and had those locks, that's what, that's what got her. The old uh, Jerry curl mullet he had going on kind of, <laughs> kind of reinvented the hockey style back then. But uh, just, uh, just from going back uh, when, when you were growing up, uh, you, you grew up idolizing uh, Joe Sackett, correct? That was your favorite player. Yeah. He was my favorite player growing up him and Jerome McGinley. Those two were my idols. And I liked them because of what they did on the ice, but how they were off the ice too. They were so community driven. They were great leaders. They led by example. They led through the team. Um, yeah, and obviously they're skilled on ice and they both worked hard day in and day out to be better. And so I really admired them. So most of your time and energy growing up as a kid in Saskatchewan was was spent trying to to make it to the big leagues? Yeah, I'd say so. For me, I have tons of friends. Uh, I was the only child, so I always have friends over at my house. And we'd go downstairs, chuck on the rollerblades, shoot some pucks, hang out, blast some tunes and have fun with it. We made the most of it. And uh, yeah, I'd say NHL was a goal, but later on in life, I'd say around 11 and 12, I kind of found a passion in going to pro overseas, playing in Europe. I went there and played with the Team Canada Polar Bears, they're called, and fell in love. That was like the goal was to go there. Well, first to go to school, get a scholarship, and then go overseas and play pro. And that was a little bit different route than other people, per se, were so NHL driven, where I was more driven to the experience of playing overseas in Europe. Uh, what countries in particular? So I was, oh boy, went to Germany, Czech, um, Slovakia, Italy, Sweden, and Hungary. And oh my goodness. Yeah, it was all over. It was absolutely incredible. The experience really changed my life and changed my mindset too on hockey itself and just how different their culture was and the atmosphere over there. So I really wanted to experience that eventually one day. Is, is it a while you take a two hour flight and it's like, it's like, Oh my goodness, this is nothing like where I was just at. Seriously. Yeah. That's, I couldn't get over it. We were actually traveling through a bus. So we'd go through from like town to town to town on a bus. And uh, it was such a cool experience. We had a tournament in Prague and then we would go and venture out in Austria. We went in Swiss Alps. Like it was, it was a pretty cool time over there. I enjoyed it completely. And just a different atmosphere you see a castle, you're like, holy, this is so cool. And then next year in by like a nice mountainous area. Yeah, it's pretty sweet. I was in at Prague uh, when we did the world premiere games and uh, we had uh, Alf Samuelson as an assistant coach and we ended up having this uh, big meet and greet with also Boston, the team that we were playing. And sure enough, Cam Neely and Alf Samuelson are standing 
probably, you know, 15, 20 feet away. We're thinking that there might be a Donnybrook. So that's my only experience <laughs> overseas in a castle. So it, it almost ended up pretty crazy. Now, what age were you when you were traveling over to Europe experiencing all this stuff? Yeah. So it would have been U12 uh, both years. I was back to back. You, I was 11 and 12 when I went. And so that experience really changed my life. And then also went to UND and saw their arena and their facility there. And that was another one. I was like, okay, I got to go to college. Really. This is gorgeous. And uh, so I picked up my marks in school and had the dream of going to play professional, got a personal trainer. And that was like a really pivotal time in my life was just like, I really dove into it head first and wanted to go play professional uh, first college and then professional. And yeah. So, so then came the decision at a certain point when you got old enough to join uh, the Saskatchewan Junior League, which is a junior B league called the S- SJHL. You betcha, correct? yes. Yeah, you got it. So Saskatchewan Junior Hockey League. And uh, I went that route because if you go CHL, you burn your eligibility to go into the States, NCAA. So I wanted to curate both options and have both options open. So I stayed in Saskatchewan and played in the SJHL there which is a pretty established league. And, and you ended up starting with the Notre Dame Hounds. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You, I saw you played one game your first year to get your feet wet. And then you ended up coming back to play two more after that. I mean, what was your, what was your first ever junior experience like? Yeah. So for me, I actually got asked to make, well, I made the team as a 17 year old, um, but I wanted to actually go back and play another year of AAA. So I declined the offer and went and played another year of AAA to develop. And then I got called up for a game and it was really cool just being out there. These guys are absolutely men. So, you know, that when you go in the corners, like I was one of the bigger guys in our league and then you go in the corner and these guys are absolutely manhandling you and you have to find your way to adjust and figure it out. And so for me, I did that and I was fortunate enough to get called back up for their playoff run where they went to the finals there and lost in the finals. But it was a really cool experience and eye opening one too, just to see as you're playing against these men, and who are soon off to university is how much I need to improve and needed to get better throughout that time. So it was really cool to be in Notre Dame and their storied franchise within the hockey community. And uh, just to be a part of that was something really special for sure. So going back, uh, well, I think it was my my draft year. I went back and played AAA as well because I don't think I was ready to make the leap to junior. Now, you just mentioned that you finished your AAA season and got to go up as a, what, a black ace? Or were you able to jump in the lineup uh, after only playing one regular season game to help them out with that uh, playoff run? Yeah, I was actually able to hop right into the lineup. Um, and it was a pretty cool experience just to go right into the playoff gameplay. We just finished our playoffs as our AAA team. We lost in the finals. And then I got a phone call the next day saying, hey, we'd love you to come up and play. And so quickly got ready, got him changed, uh, unpacked all my stuff and hopped on to my vehicle, unloaded everything and went to Notre Dame. So it was pretty crazy, just a quick turnaround. I think I literally got home and uh, took some stuff in, put some more stuff in my vehicle and hit the door and went to straight to Notre Dame. So it was a pretty cool call and experience and yeah, so I went, had a practice, and then I played. It would have been two days later, so hopped right back into it. So I would imagine that offseason, your trainer got another call saying, hey, I got to p- keep up with these guys in the corners. We got to take it to the next level. <laughs> yeah, like I was always a thick player, and I always am a thick guy anyways. And uh, so it was just, yeah, we got to keep bearing down and keep doing what we're doing because I was already strong enough, but I had to keep on getting stronger, and there's nothing wrong with that too. I want to be faster, quicker, and stronger, and I think that's what every player works on in offseason pretty much. So oh, I guess I'll, I'll ask you to break it down. What type, who would you, who would you say you emulate your game after if you could pick maybe a, a pro guy now? Were you a, a, a penalty killer? I was, I was, yeah, I was a penalty killer. I just shut down roll, but I could also finish if I had the opportunity. So I'd say a Brendan Gallagher type or even um, trying to think of some smaller guys who are a little more physical um, I'm not going to say Marshawn cause I wasn't like Marshawn. Um, but I would just get under a guy's skin, but I wouldn't do it dirty. It'd just be cause it was hard to play against. And so even like a fourth line center, who's just the guy that's always on you, always in the corner, blocking shots, taking hits, always can trust and rely on situations, but can be put out in the last minute to score as well. So yeah, it's it kind of an all around. So I I could tell based on your stats, you obviously started improving at that point in time through your first couple of years with Notre Dame. Did you start hearing from colleges about maybe getting a full ride to to the NCAA? 
I wasn't any full rides. No, I wasn't that good per se, but uh, I had really good opportunity when I was in Notre Dame my first year. Um, I was talking to a couple of schools and they really liked how I was able to just transfer into a shutdown role because you know, in AAA, I was a top six guy, played on top six line. And when I went to Notre Dame, uh, my coach was like, hey, we want you in a shutdown role. What do you think of that? And I said, sure. So they put me up against the best players in the league every night. And my role was to literally shut them down from scoring. And so I took great pride in that role. And that's when colleges took note because they were looking at those top players on the other teams and they're like, holy, like this guy's shutting down his players. Like what's going on? So I was talking to a few schools at that time then. And then my second year didn't really have the best year. It was still in that shutdown role and still was shutting down the top line guys, but they wanted me to start producing. So then in my third year, I was able to be in a top six role. And so I was talking to a couple of schools at the time, no firm offers for full rides. So I decided to stay in Canada. So um, that off season in 2017, did uh, how how did it go down? Where you ended up joining Humboldt? Were you traded? Did you just sign there as as a free agent? Yeah, so I actually was traded in my 19 year old season. I was in Notre Dame and was assistant captain of the team. We had about eight 20 year olds at the time, so it was pretty big honor to be an assistant captain. We had that many 20s in the dressing room too. Um, and so for me, I never took that lightly at all, that role. And I wanted to be a leader for that team for many years to come or for the next year after too. And at, during the season, I just didn't feel fulfilled as a type one diabetic. I was given back to the diabetic community, but I didn't feel like I was able to really launch this dream program. I had, uh, I had this dream program in my mind and I just really, really wanted to launch. And I knew Wilcox wasn't the place. It's a town of 400 people and they really don't have that big of a fan base for the uh, junior A team. So for me, I really wanted a place that had fans to rally around this program. So after the season, I went up to my coach's office and before one of my teammates came up to me, he's like, Hey, you're going to be captain. Congratulations. And I was absolutely devastated to find that out because I didn't know at the time, nobody knew at the time, but I was going to be asking out for, to try starting this program. So I went to the office, talked to the coach and it was difficult. It was probably the hardest decision I've ever had to make in my hockey career. And I, just, I said to him, I was like, hey, like, I, I'm not happy. I'm not fulfilled here. I, I want to start this. I have something more to offer. And uh, yeah, so I got traded to a bigger center like I wished. And I ended up in Humboldt there. And so my first phone call with Darcy, I told him about this dream program I had. And he was like, yeah, we're harm set in. Let's do this. So it's, it's been pretty incredible to create a program for that. For for people who have no idea, what's it like living as a type one diabetic? Like obviously, it, it you know it, it's extremely difficult. I know Max Domi, and we'll talk about him later because you've ended up becoming friends with him, and, and, and of course launching a charity around type one diabetes. What what's the experience like? Yeah, it's it's a little bit difficult, I'd say, because for people who don't understand, they just see you as a normal person, and we are normal people for sure. But what we do have to do is constantly monitor our blood sugars our blood glucose levels 24 seven. So say the best way I describe is if you have a chocolate bar, you're good to go. Like you're all good. There's no worries at all. No issues. But if I have a chocolate bar, I have to give myself a needle to bring down through insulin to bring down my blood sugar level to an adequate level. So your body already automatically regulates it. So every time I eat something, I have to give myself insulin. And then also with physical activity, say we have a bag skate and we're going hard in that bag skate, my blood sugar levels will end up coming down. And if they go down, I could have a seizure and have a full bone and pass away if, I, if it doesn't get treated properly. So you got to really be careful what you're putting in your body and watching what you're doing. And then also really watching your levels because it can go too high too and it can go too low. And uh, both are very fatal. So when you, when you said you weren't fulfilled, was it because you just wanted more people knowing what you and other type 1 diabetics have to live through day in and day out? For me, what was, I wanted to create this mentorship program and it was called Dahlgren's Diabetes. And this program was for type one diabetic children. And I was able to create it humbled, but what it really did was be a mentorship platform for those children. And uh, just someone to look up to, to talk to about diabetes and relate to. So when I grew up, I didn't have that role model. You think of like Bobby Clark, who's an NHL legend and someone I grew close to afterwards, but he didn't have, like, he wasn't really out there. It wasn't even in my era either. It was more just, there was no YouTube when I grew up. It was, so you're kind of by yourself and you're isolated. There wasn't even much awareness. So if you go to school and you're carrying a little bag around, you get derogatory names called at you because you're carrying around this bag, even though you need to carry it for your diabetic supplies. Or if I go to the bathroom and give myself a needle in grade four and other students come in and start freaking out because I'm giving myself a needle, then you get treated differently for that aspect. And so 
I knew what it was like growing up. I wanted to give back and help those children through that struggle. So I ended up creating this program and brought them out to a Bronco game. Uh, first, you had a pregame meal at Johnny's Bistro, which is a local restaurant in Humboldt, the best one yet. Um, and then they'd come out to the game with their family, get a ceremonial face-off, or sorry, get some tickets, then a ceremonial face-off. And then afterwards, I'd meet with them, chat with them, and go to their school, do a speech. And then they'd be inducted into our Facebook group chat all together. So the whole idea was truly just to make them feel special for their disease and feel beautiful about it and that it is okay to have it and they can pursue their dreams and passions. So this was inside of me as I'm sitting in my coach's office being like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do this, but I can't do it here. And uh, yeah, so I was able to do that in Humboldt. I'm, I'm like Marv. Well, first of all, the name's incredible. Can we go back to the name? Can you say it again? <laughs> yeah, I saw yeah, Grinelli so it's, chuckling. <laughs> it's a tongue twister. Dahlgren's Diabetes. Dire and, beauties, uh, that's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. So I wanted them to be beautiful for their disease, but also it's a hockey slang too, yeah. beauty. And so yeah, I thought it was pretty funny how I was able to create that. And and like I just find it amazing at such a young age that 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 you wanted to to do all this. Most kids are, you know, just worried about maybe, you know, playing video games and, and just showing up to the rink and even getting your workouts done. Meanwhile, you're almost like a full grown man. And it's it's I mean, now we have our answer as to why you were given an A on your sweater as far as the leadership is concerned. Well, thank you. Yeah. And I feel like there's more to life than the sport itself. And people do get trapped in the sport. And like one of the people I look up to is Jason Zucker. And everything that he does in the yeah. hockey community too. And there's lots of other players who give back. I mean, Marner assist and tons of other programs out there that guys are doing, which I love. And I think that goes to show that there is more than just a sport. And I was able to use my platform in hockey to actually create change and awareness around it. Something that means close to home for me and so many other people. So you said Darcy, your head coach with Humboldt, he, he, you, you met with him and he was completely gung ho on helping you out with all this. So clearly the bond between you and the organization, it, it was right from the beginning. Talk about getting into the organization, training camp, becoming friends with, with all these new teammates. Yeah, it was super cool. I knew Logan Schatz, the captain, uh, going into it, who was one of my buddies growing up. And he always used to say, and we have the sign in the back saying, not a big deal. That was literally his go-to saying. So I think that's hilarious. He loved this podcast. So uh, I just want to get mentioned that. But uh, yeah, I knew him going into it. And I knew a couple other guys. But other than that, I didn't really know many guys. Obviously played against them because Notre Dame's rival was Humboldt. And so I thought it was pretty funny that they're rivals. But uh in training camp, it was super cool just to go and connect with everybody. There's so many great people. And I know Darcy changed it up quite a bit. He brought in a lot of guys, and he wanted to bring in good people first and then good players second. And I think that's something that truly breeds championship culture is those people that do bring in those good people at heart, and then they're great players too. And so then it was awesome. And in training camp, I actually went in with pneumonia. So uh, it was <laughs> it was a little bit of a grind for me. But uh, I can give you a story if you wanted that. Oh, yeah. We're, this is exactly what this podcast is about. Let's hear it. All right. So we have our fitness testing. And I told uh, Louis Schott's captain and Darcy about my pneumonia. And I got it from working. I was working at an arena all summer. And I was out on the arena five days a week for at least five hours, maybe even six to eight hours on the ice every day. And I honestly think it could have been the mold or whatever, but I ended up getting it. And it was just before training camp. And so as a 20 year old going into training camp, I didn't want to take the option and I wanted to be that leader on the team. And I knew I needed to make a statement because I'm going to a new team and they traded for me. So I have to prove myself, obviously. So I didn't want to cop out of it. So I was like, you know what? I'm just going to take it and just run with them. I'm going to try this fitness testing. I haven't been working out for two weeks. I've been sick. I'm just going to go and try it. So we ended up doing shuttle run. And I'm not sure for those who are familiar with shuttle runs, but you have to run from one side of the cone. I'm not sure if it's 60 or 50 meters or maybe even 30 meters. And then back to the other cone. And you have to go there back and forth six times under a minute. And so I did in the summer about a month ago, even a month. Yeah. So like say I did in the summer, end of July, I, it was under a minute. I was fine. No worries whatsoever. So here we're in August in this camp time and training camp. And I'm like, okay, line up online. So I'm a little nervous because I haven't done cardio in a while. I have pneumonia. So like you can't breathe that well. I have an inhaler there for my pneumonia. So we're getting ready. We're lining up and uh, you're like, okay, go. So we all go and the buzzer rings and we're running back and forth. And 
after like the third time, I was starting to get really heavy legs, trouble breathing, starting to like get really <laughs> like actually trying to really gasp for air. And I was like, this is not like me. So then we're going on my fifth time. And now I'm really like struggling. I'm getting like really behind the pack. Captain Shotzi is like leading everybody, and I'm like way, way behind. So then the last then you one, start hearing I'm... the chirps, then the chirps start coming in from the guys not doing oh, it. Yeah, but nobody knew me, so they really couldn't even chirp me because no one really knew me yet. And so then I go for the last one and I hit the end cone and I'm running back. And I just absolutely legs give out face plant on the floor. <laughs> and I just was like, as if I try getting up, hands slide away, fall again. And then I ended getting up and started jogging back in. And that was when it really hit me. I was like, holy crap, this is tough. Good, good way to welcome to the team. Hey, like all the guys were like, who is this guy? Why yeah, do we have who, him here? Who is this guy gassing beers all summer and not training? <laughs> and he shows up out of shape for the fucking beep test. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. That shuttle run was, yeah, that was something. And I felt terrible, but uh, afterwards they found I had pneumonia. They thought it was pretty funny. So it's a good story. Well, right. And, and it may be one to break the ice a little bit with, with your new teammates where I'm sure it probably became a topic in the locker room. You guys could have some chuckles about it. And, and really that's where the bond begins, right? Well, hundred percent. Yeah. You like to have fun. You like to joke around. So that was a running joke for a little bit, for sure. It was just how bad I did on the shell run. <laughs> Another thing that I saw was that you guys had a very, very good team that year too. You guys had 33 wins. I would imagine that you guys were heading into playoffs or were you guys already in playoffs when, when the accident took place? Yeah, we were already in playoffs. We were actually, we beat the team that was supposed to win it all, Melford Mustangs. They had the Nippon Hawks number, who was number one in our league. And uh, they were the team to win it all. They lost people said they were going to win it. So anyways, we beat them four to one in the first series. And then we were in the semifinals and uh, it was against Nippowin. And we were down three to one in that series, but it could have been three to one for us. We lost two games. I went into overtime there and uh, it could have been just a flip of a switch and we would have been three to one for us. So we were uh, on our way to our game. And that's when the crash happened. This was, I knew this was going to be difficult to ask you are you okay with taking us through the day or at least what you can remember of, of everything that transpired? Uh, one of the, one of the worst days in, in hockey history. Uh, it brought the country of Canada together, the whole hockey community. You saw, you know, um, you saw every, really, really everybody come together after the, the situation that happened. And it was obviously a very difficult one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so for sure. It was just a normal game day. And I, I can't stress that enough. It was just a normal game day. Obviously, we had our backs against the wall. And if we lost, we were out. But we knew what we had to do. And we believed in our dressing room. We really believed we could win it. We knew that we were a solid team. And we did blow those two leads. And we made some adjustments the night before on video. So we came to rank, had a little pregame skate. Lots of you guys did the normal routine. So we went to Johnny's Beast Show for a pregame meal, or I guess a pregame brunch. And uh, me, myself, and my roommate, so Stephen Wack, Bryce Fisk, went back to my place uh, at Carla's, or our place at Carla's, and uh, had a pregame nap, got ready, and headed out the door, went back to Johnny's, grabbed a pregame meal, and went to the rink, grabbed a stuff, loaded on the bus, and hopped on the bus. And so it was no different than anything uh, else. It was just we were prepared and we knew what we had to do. We had to go and win, and that was about it. And so on the bus, there's guys playing cards, joking around, uh, listening to music, watching TV or watching a show on their phone. Um, yeah, it was just a normal bus trip. And I think the cool part about buses is it feels like a safe place. And so many memories are created there too. Like I know some of the best times have been on the bus and just joking around, hearing stories and just bonding with your teammates is from the bus. And so for me, that was something that I always took pride and enjoyed was just the time alone with my teammates on the bus and on our road trips, having fun together. And so uh, right before the crash, I ended up changing. I only changed into my suit about half an hour out. So we wear our track suits on the bus and then we change into our suit. I know um, lots of junior teams do that. So it's not really unfamiliar. And then uh, sat down, tossed my suit up and sat down. And I sat in the aisle seat. And I was in row 12. And so that was about really it. I remember, I remember, I guess, there's some guys in front of me. I started laughing and all that because we're all laughing on the bus. And then I was like, okay, this is way, way too much. I got I to gotta tone it down, put in my headphones here. I got to focus up. We got a game to play. And I like to visualize before the game. So I uh, ended up putting in my headphones, pit play, put my head down. And then that was the last thing I remember. Everything else went black. And so I um, woke up in the hospital four and a half days later and 
uh, I was in with it in the hospital. I was in post-traumatic amnesia, as called. And uh, it's a state of consciousness where you are talking and moving and interacting with people, but you don't remember it. As some would say, it's like you're blacked out kind of thing where you're still coherent and still doing things, but you just don't remember it. And so I was in that state for four and a half days and was in and out a bit more afterwards. But um, that was really when it came to my senses of what had happened. And I learned about the tragedy. Just going back to one of the things you said about the the, the bus being the safe space. And I, I remember talking to a, a bunch of guys afterward and, and you, as a player, you reflect, you're like, how many times were you in the bus joking around with the guys playing cards and, and how special of a place it was. And, and it, like you said, that was the one thing that resonated. And then now you mentioned that you, it happens and then you don't remember anything for four and a half days. When, when you finally come to how long till, till everything was even able to sink in at, at what had happened. Yeah. So when I woke up, it was difficult. I actually thought I was dreaming. I looked around and saw white and I was in a hospital. I was like, oh, I must be dreaming. So I tried closing my eyes, going back to bed and I couldn't. And so then I actually like moved my neck a bit. I had a neck brace on at the time. I was like, Oh, the heck. And I saw my parents there and I was like, how did our game go? Do we win? And they looked at me just shocked. Like what game? I was like, do we win our game? Like there was no game. I was like, well, it probably was. Obviously, I'm injured. I probably got hit from behind in my mind. So I'm thinking I got hit from behind in a game. I obviously don't remember. So I must have got concussed and must have broke my neck or something because I must have got hit from behind. And so there's like, there was no game. I was like, what do you mean there was no game? They said, there was a bus crash. And at the time, they've already told me this story twice. And so I don't remember them telling me the story. So they were really, really confused. And I, I was like, well, what do you mean? And they're like, Dana passed away. And I was like, Dana, what do you like? What? And so I was really confused about what had just happened. So then they explained to me that there was a crash and that 16 people who I considered to be family had passed away and that I was one of the survivors and that um, I was injured, but they didn't even know my injuries. I never asked for that either. I was more curious about who was here and who wasn't here. And so they kind of gave me the brief list and they didn't really even know at the time either who was still here and who wasn't. Um, and then I had to go to my physio appointment and then less than three minutes away. So um, I still didn't believe them. I said, okay, I'll pass me my phone. So they passed me my phone, which really wasn't my phone. It was some random new phone that ended up being my phone. I flung it open, hit Twitter. And first thing I saw was prayers for Humboldt and Humboldt Strong. And so that's when it really kind of hit me that this was something that did happen. This was real. And then, like I said, within a minute or two, I had to go to physio. So I quickly had to get changed, had to process everything and go to physio. And so I still didn't know my injuries. Even when I went to physio, I had no idea what I was injured with. Um, and yeah, so it didn't really hit me until that night. It was a chaotic day. And then that night I ended up going back on my phone and opened up social media and there it was again there's like the sticks out for humble trend was going chaotic there's so many different uh tributes from the hockey community in the world um so that was just unbelievable and i was i was taken back and i still am today from all the support but in the time it was super difficult and i went to text with my roommate Stephen wack and i realized that he wouldn't receive the text that i was going to send so then that was in when it really hit me even more was after that and um yeah, it was not easy whatsoever. And then you ask the questions like, why am I still here? Why are others not? When you have the person sitting behind you pass away and the person beside you pass away, it just doesn't make sense. And so for me, that was one of the tough parts about it was just how come they aren't here and why am I here if that happened? So um, that was hard at time, but uh, I was able to get through it through looking through their social media profiles and healing from that. Um, like, did you, did you have to talk to some professionals to maybe get over some of that guilt? Like I'm, I'm crying a little bit right now. Obviously that's uh that's tough, tough to hear. And you having to go through all that, like that is just, that's some heavy shit. Mm -hmm. It is for sure. And I was fortunate enough to not have to talk to professionals. Um, but there's nothing wrong with professionals either. For me, I've been dealt with a lot of stuff in my life beforehand, being a type one diabetic, losing my personal trainer at a young age, losing one of my teammates at a young age. Um, it was almost losing my dad at 16. So I've been dealt with lots of stuff beforehand. So I've had good coping mechanisms for this kind of thing. Obviously there's nothing they can do with 16. One is a lot, let alone 16. And 
for me, I was able to reframe my mindset after a couple of days and just be like, Hey, you know what? Like I gotta live big for those who aren't here. Like I gotta do this real big and I gotta live my life to the fullest for those who aren't here because I can't control a situation. I can't control the semi driver who went through the stop sign. I can't control who's here. Who's not here. I can't control my injuries. All I can really can control is moving forward from this and find the best way to stay positive and find the positive in this situation. Trust me, there wasn't many positives at all, to be honest, but there was some with some with all the guys who were still here and us being able to live our life to the fullest for those who aren't. And uh, us, something I really clung to and focused on was just trying to move forward and to really find the positive and to live my life to the fullest because I have a second opportunity here. That, that's just like such unbelievable strength of the fact that, you know, you, you could figure that out, especially so quickly. Cause I know like three months afterward, I ended up meeting you at the NHL awards, you and a, a bunch of your mm-hmm. teammates. And I'm like, I'm like, how could, the, how could you be out, you know, three months later having to stand in front of everyone and, and deliver a speech on behalf of the entire community organization and really at, at the, the focal point of the hockey world. And, and, and you got up there and I, I hate to laugh, but there was a funny story about when you ended up going up to, to give the speech that the teleprompter was blocked, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So I didn't even really want to do the speech. Not gonna lie. It was kind of forced upon me. Um, but I was the assistant captain that year and I wanted to step up and be a leader um, yeah. and still be the leader throughout everything that happened. And so I ended up going up there and we, in the morning we had this, we like did a little run through a little practice test and I wasn't able to see it. So Braden Cameron lent me his glasses and I was actually able to see it with his glasses. So I said, okay, great. I'll wear my glasses so I can at least see the teleprompter. We had a little mock-up speech and uh so i was like okay i'll be fine so sure enough we walk out on stage and in the back actually they showed the video of where like what it was leading up to and we had no idea so in the back we were super emotional i i don't know how i held it together to be honest we had guys that were tearing up in the back because they showed it on the monitor right in front of us and it was about our crash and everything that happened and so it was super super emotional with that aspect and so I, I had to hold it together. So I get up there and I'm standing and the whole crowd is standing for us, which is unbelievable. And it was an absolute honor to have that. And so I kind of put my head down and then I look back up and there, everyone's still standing. And so I kind of waited another second and everybody was still standing. And then I was like, okay, well, I guess I kind of do this speech. And I went and looked at the teleprompter and I couldn't see it. And I was like, oh my goodness, I can't see the teleprompter right now. So I put my head down, hoping people would actually sit down and nobody sat down. So I didn't want to say, okay, you guys can sit down. So that's kind of disrespectful. <laughs> right, Everybody's right. standing for us, right? Yeah, so I don't yeah, want to be yeah. rude. <laughs> and so standing in front of the teleprompter was Pekka Rene. And I was like, why would you put the goalies in front of the teleprompter? First off, next time NHL, please don't do that. But like, I actually had issues I couldn't see. And so I ended up winging the speech that I gave to the entire world, I guess, the hockey world especially. And that was the most difficult thing oh, I've no ever kidding. experienced. First time on national TV. I don't even like really doing that type of thing. I didn't want this role. And I was given this role. And now I am had to wing it. So, yeah, I made one mistake. And I still feel terrible at the mistake. I said um, they were recovering. I said Nick Smolanski, Warren Gobey, and Lane Matchuk were recovering in the hospital. And Nick wasn't in the hospital. And I feel sorry for Nick. So sorry, Nick. Um, but I felt terrible because he was talking to schools at the time. And then he had to explain that he wasn't in the hospital. And yeah, so that was a little bit difficult. But um, other than that, I ended up doing quite well. I said what I wanted to say. I rehearsed the speech probably 10 times that day before. So I knew, knew what I wanted to say. And I was not expecting the teleprompter to not be able to see it through Pekka Rene's head, but I still try to make the most of the situation. You did unbelievable. I was there live watching it, man. That's incredible strength. And I tell you what, it turned out better, better than one of my ad reads. So I, I, <laughs> I think you did okay. And, and better than the introduction I had to do six times over before we got going here. <laughs> For those of you, all right, yeah, for everyone listening, I butchered the intro. You guys know I struggle with those, but uh, we can move on. But um, going back to the to the four and a half days you spent in the hospital when you, uh, you 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 know lost your memory and don't really remember much, you did end up having some visitors in in that time, right? I did. Yeah, I sure did. Who 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 were some of the big names that were able to come visit you? 
Well, so yeah, there's quite a few. So Ron and Don were one. And then our prime minister in Canada, Justin Trudeau, was another one. And um, had some FaceTime calls with Johnny Goudreau, uh, some videos from Stamkos, Bergeron, Kopitar. Um, there's, there's honestly quite a few. I know McDavid came a little bit later on. I think he might have even called us. The hard part is I don't really remember who it was because I don't remember it. But I do have some videos of me and... I wasn't really myself. And I'm going to say that right now, just to clear the air. I wasn't myself. So I suffered in the crash, suffered a traumatic brain injury, a severe traumatic brain injury. And I also had a fractured skull, puncture wound, scalp gloving, broken neck, broken back, blood clots, um, muscle, nerve, ligament damage. So I, I had all that. And I also had this brain injury. And this brain injury was very, very severe. I shouldn't have been able to remember my name or even how to walk or how to talk based on the image itself. So in that four and a half day span, I truly wasn't myself, even in the hospital, I really wasn't myself and the brain injury can affect your personality. And for people that don't know that it really does, even concussions can do that too. But mine was very severe. And so I was very sarcastic. I was kind of rude. I was quick witted and ignorant, which is completely opposite of me. I am quick witted, but other than that, not really sarcastic, not rude, not ignorant. And so, yeah, I said some stuff that was a little bit questionable in those days span, but uh, they provide a lot of good humor for lots of the people who visited me. Okay. So that's what I was hearing. And one in particular was Crosby. Now you grew up not being the biggest Crosby fan, which is a (laughs) little bit bizarre being from Canada and the fact that what he's done, how did that, how did that all begin? And not to throw sit under the bus because I'm sure you love him now after the fact that he reached out. Yeah. So growing up, I just didn't like how he, no offense, Sydney. I feel like if you're going to listen to this, I'm sorry right now, but I just, I want to let play this out there. I wasn't a fan of how he came to the league and started whining to the refs. I, I feel like you ought to pay your dues and you got to get into the league and take a couple hits and take some of the tough stuff because I know you're like, he was literally the best in the league. And, but I feel like you ought to take some of the rough stuff and earn your way to get that respect. And, um, that was one of the things I didn't really like about it and just rubbed me wrong. And so I was a big Ovechkin fan growing up. I just loved his passion and his, how he would hit and score. I didn't like how he wouldn't play defense. I, that wasn't really me. I liked to play defense. And that's why I don't say I model my game after him. Cause I really don't, but I just liked how he had so much passion around the game and just wore it on his sleeve and was so well with there and would absolutely ruin guys, but then would also score three goals a night. And you're just like, how did he do that? And, um, so I was, when it was Ovi versus Sid, I was an Ovi fan and uh, I even had a fat head on my wall of Ovi. So uh, I was a fan of him, but I think in the hospital, he ended up sending the Pittsburgh Penguins sent a Jersey to us and uh, it was super nice. And it was fully signed Jersey. And when it came, I was like, Oh, cool. That's nice. I was like, is that Kessel? Cause it, all I saw was an eight and a one, but it was actually 18. And my parents were like, Oh no, no, it's a, uh, it's, it's a Broncos one. The, the Penguins sent it. And I said, oh, did Cross sign it? And they're like, yeah. I was like, oh, I hate Cross." <laughs> and, 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 and then I had like lots of friends in my room. So I like my friend, best friend, Brody Decker, Adam Ermitrout, Michael Coral, even me, Wyatt Tyndall was in there too. And Madison Shen, whose brain Shen's sister was in there. Um, and Laura Goebel. So like, they're all my really tight knit friends. And they knew I didn't really like Crosby. And so Madison was videoing it. And um, anyways, we get into it. And uh, I looked at the jersey. I was kind of cool. And uh, I was like, oh, where's Cross signed it kind of thing. And they sent it. They showed me. I was like, oh, that's cool. And then um, I, the jersey, they like, I lifted it up. And I was like, oh, that's pretty dirty jersey. And then um, they're like, yeah. And also, uh, there's another kind of personalized thing for you. And my dad said this. And at the time, like, he didn't really know what I was going to say because it was from Crosby. And he's like, yeah, this is science personalized. So uh, just take a read. And so then uh, I was like, is it from Cross? And he's like, yeah. I was like, oh. <laughs> so then in the room, um, my we had a, in like high school, it was really, we would always like talk about hockey. We'd always have lunch talks about hockey. All my buddies and I played hockey and I uh, loved it. And so we ended up talking about one season. It was Drew and Crosby who were like running for, I think it was, most points or something it might be the most goal i'm not too sure but they were running for it and uh i was like you know what drew's having a better season than crosby i'm gonna be straight up and honest about that and this was like way back in the day so then my buddy michael 
uh, brought it up and uh, he was like, or I guess Brody would have been the one. He was like, who's better, Drew or Crosby? And I was like, dude, Drew had a season that year. And I went to depth. Like, he's like, yeah, Crosby has Mulkin, Latang, Gensel, Kessel, who can all finish the puck. Drew didn't have anybody. Like he had Shen, Ghost, who has been, who has been a ghost. And like chirping these guys. And I idolize these players. Like that's the tough part looking back is I idolize these guys. And I think they're incredible athletes. And so ended up chirping them. And so I guess Crosby got the video anyways, because Maddie Shen, Sent to her brother Braden Shen, who sent it to Crosby. So Just laying into Crosby's video. game, calling him. Yeah. Up. Hey, hey, I don't blame you. He was fucking complaining in the sandbaggers too, buddy. Don't worry about that. Keep hammering <laughs> so, on. So yeah. Anyways, we get to the photo part now. So I get the photo in my hands, and I read it, and it was a really nice photo. And he signed it, and he said like, "Wishing you the best, and hope you're doing well." Thinking of you, and then I looked. I was like, okay, maybe I do like Crosby a little bit. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so it really it sent. It was really nice and. He's been so supportive for all the Bronco families too. And yeah, I have no hard feelings against Crosby whatsoever. He's been super kind to all of us. And I know lots of guys on my team for the Broncos least loved him and they're his favorite player. And uh, so it really, really meant a lot that he did that for us and he didn't have to whatsoever. And uh, just goes to show how good of a person he is. I mean, yeah, you know, he's the best. And and all those other people that also showed up and sent videos. You mentioned uh, Don Cherry and, and Ron McLean stopped by. I mm-hmm. believe H- Haley Wickenheiser stopped by yes. as well during that yeah. period of time. Yeah. And I touched on it earlier. You grew up idolizing Joe Sackick. And it just so happens you end up getting to meet him as well. And there's a, a very unique story behind all that as well. I want you to tell it. Yeah. So uh, there was, a, I guess, a Broncos event for the families to go and there's tons of NHLers who were there coming and showing up. Um, and yeah, like I got to meet Haley Wickenheiser, Paul Brandt, they came in the hospital, which was amazing. And Haley is an incredible person too. Same with Paul. Everybody who came was absolutely incredible. Even Ryan O'Reilly, McDavid came too. Like those guys. So great. Anyways. So um, Joe Sackick <laughs> was at this event. And so he was my idol growing up. He was my guy. If we played main sticks, I'd pick either Jerome Aginla or Joe Sackick. Like that was my player. And um, so he was at this event and I wanted to go to the event really badly. So I got clearance from the doctors to go. And uh, it was my first time ever like going out of the hospital and being out of the hospital. So I went and as soon as I got there, I just felt a rush of being overwhelmed. All the families were there. And it was my first time seeing all the families. And I wanted to talk to every single family and offer my condolences and say how sorry I was for the loss and how much the person meant to me. And so I ended up meeting with Darcy's dad and I talked to Darcy's dad for about 20 to 30 minutes. And um, after that, I went and sat down because supper was ready. And I even felt more of an overwhelming rush because I felt like the families were looking at me or they wanted me to talk to them. And so it was just, I just kept feeling more overwhelmed, more overwhelmed. So I ended up going home because I just couldn't take it anymore. Um, I just wanted to talk to everybody, but I knew if I talked to everyone and there was 30 families and it took me 30 minutes to talk to one, it wouldn't be possible. So I ended up going home, uh, back to the hospital, I guess. And when I went back to the hospital, um, I knew I was going to miss out on seeing like the cool guys, like Carrie Price was there. Um, even Shay Weber, Brandon Gallagher, there's lots of people I would like to talk to and meet, but uh, ended up going back to the hospital and it's a little bit bummed about that, but I felt like it was the best for my recovery at least. And so later on, Joe Sack again, up approaching my parents like, Hey, I heard that your son you know, idolized me or liked me as a player. And my dad's like, you're Joe Sackick. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, yeah, I am. Um, but uh, you just call me Joe. Oh, he's like, you're Mr. Sack. He's like, you just call me Joe. He just call me Joe. And my dad's like, okay, Joe, sorry about that. And um, sure enough, so they started talking. And Joe's like, yeah, like, I'd like to meet Caleb if that's okay. After this, can we go back and let me meet Caleb? And so my dad was like, well, yeah, like for sure. Like we need to hop in the vehicle. We'll take you and we can we go meet Caleb for sure. He'd absolutely love that. Joe's like, okay, sounds good. So then afterwards, the event, Joe came up to my parents like, hey, I'm ready to go. And so I ended up having to hop in the vehicle with my parents and drove to the hospital. And when he got to the hospital, uh, um, the lady at the front desk, it was like past the curfew time. So we weren't allowed any visitors past this curfew time. And I was on the neuro floor. So with the neuro is for brain injury, injured people. And uh, so like, we're supposed to have lots of sleep, like ample sleep is the best recovery for brain injuries. 
And uh, she's like, it's kind of late. Like, I don't think you should be here. Um, they're, they're not allowing any visitors for Caleb. And my dad's like, well, we're kind of his parents. Like, we want to see him. He had a rough night. We want to check in and see if he's okay. She's like, no, like, I don't really want you to come in. Um, I don't think this is, this is safe or smart. And he needs his sleep. And my dad's like, well, like, we have a special guest. And we want him to meet his special guest. And he had a rough day. And we're his parents. Like, I feel like we should be able to meet him. She's like, no, no. My dad's like, okay, like we have Joe Sackick here who wants to meet my son. Can we please meet my son? And the lady's like, you have Joe Sackick? My dad kind of like pulls Joe Sackick in and she's like, oh my goodness, you're Joe Sackick? Oh my goodness. So she started freaking out about Joe Sackick. And it was like, okay, okay, this is against what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to let you come in and don't tell anyone. But I need to get a picture of Joe Sackick when you yeah. guys leave. And so <laughs> sure enough, sure enough, she let Joe Sackick in and um <laughs> when did you let him in? I guess he went upstairs and he met with me and I was able to chat with him. And he was one of the big things that I guess people don't really know is that he was involved in the Swift Current Broncos crash where they lost four people there. And um for me, that was an eye-opener. I had no idea that he was actually part of that team. And so he kind of talked about his experience there and just said, like, you need to be a leader. You're a leader in your 20-year-old season. You need to continue to be a leader after this, too. When you get out of the hospital, you got to continue just being a leader and finding the positive in the situation and continue to move forward. And that was one of the best advice I could have got at the time, too, because I was in an okay headspace. I wasn't in the best headspace. How could you be? But I was in an okay headspace. And when I heard that, I was like, he's so right, like, I continue being a leader throughout this and afterwards too, because that's part of being a leader too, is that you gotta be a leader when you don't want to be a leader and you gotta be a leader away from the rink at the rink in all situations. And I think I take great pride in that. And I've always had my entire life. And so when he said that, I just rung a bell and stuck with me. And I was like, yeah, like, you're right. I gotta be a leader throughout this process afterwards. I gotta continue enjoying the process, but also live my life to the fullest. So those aren't here. And, yeah, so that was a really touching conversation with him. And uh, yeah, I suppose wrist shot and what made his wrist shot so good is like, yeah, just shoot lots of pucks. <laughs> like a quick twitch <laughs> of your wrist. And uh, yeah, just like little good conversations as well. But yeah, that was a really pivotal moment in my healing journey was me and Joe Sackick and having him meet me and, and want to come and see me just truly just shows his character and ultimately explains the reasoning why I looked up to him as an athlete too was because he did want to take time for me. He didn't have to. And he literally went out of his way to meet with me. It was late at night. It was like 1130. Yeah. Came to meet me. His flight was leaving at 6 a.m. the next morning. So he didn't have to do that whatsoever. Right. Yeah. And the fact so that he, he did get you that message too in, in order to, you know, propel you to, I mean, to like look at all the stuff you're doing now. And that probably had a little bit of an imprint. I mean, I'm sure, you know, family and, 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 and other guidance. But wow, what a fucking special moment. Pardon my French. Yeah, that no, is... it was. It really was. And then he did end up getting a picture with that lady downstairs. And she's like, <laughs> my husband's going to kill me. But uh, it was it was pretty cool just to hear the story back. I had no idea the backstory of it all. My dad had to tell me this whole story. And yeah, it was pretty cool just to have Joe end up coming and see me. And yeah, I actually talked to him about the book too and sent him a message. because I talked about it just before a uh, tribute chapter about me meeting him and how much it meant. And he gave me the okay. So that's really special too. Of course. And, and um, I mentioned it earlier with the type one diabetes, but th through this whole situation, you've became very close uh, with Max and Tyodomi because of Max's mm -hmm. situation and being a type one diabetic as well. So yep. talk about their influence and, and the doors that they've opened for you in order to expand this charity and continue to help uh, these young kids get through a very difficult situation. Yeah, no, it's been great. And I actually met Max, but Max before the crash, it would have been in 2016. 16. Yeah. December, 2016. Uh, my girlfriend at the time planned a trip. We were in Arizona and she talked to Maddie, whose brother is Brayden and Luke Shen and Luke was on Arizona and Max was on Arizona at the time. So when I was in Arizona, we went to a game and then after the game, I ended up meeting with Max, which was pretty sweet. Um, so that's when I first met him. And then after the crash, uh, connect again and we chatted a bit and we're both with JDRF, which is Judah Donald Diabetes Research Foundation as national ambassadors so we have that in touch and in common and he reached out and he started chatting and yeah, he's been such an influence in my life and same with Bobby Clark too. Bobby Clark and I met up as well afterwards and both amazing people doing amazing things for the type one diabetic community. And 
the families, their families are incredible too. I honestly can't say enough good things about both of them and how they've treated me. Um, it's been amazing just to have them in your corner too. And so, yeah, like we talked a lot, Max ended up, it was Toronto versus Montreal and he invited me out to the game there too. So I was able to meet with him then and chat some more and hang out. And so, yeah, we have a pretty good relationship I'd say, and are able to support with each other. And we're both with Dexcom now. So yeah, kind of on the same length and super cool just to have someone in your corner and uh, rooting for them in their, in his corner too. And, and all the while growing this charity, you wrote Crossroads, also attending York University, which uh, we talked about before we hopped on, uh, you're taking online classes and going to finish your education. And then I also heard that uh, you're, you're going to be going to chiropractor school. Yeah, yeah. So it's pretty exciting times in my life, honestly. Uh, I was able to, I guess, write a book during my five courses per semester and being a student athlete on the men's hockey team and also really involved in the community at York too. I took on quite a few roles. I wasn't able to play any game. I wasn't cleared for contact and I'm still not cleared for contact due to my brain injury, which I really go in depth in the book about. But one of the big things for me was just wanting to be a leader in any capacity possible. And so if I couldn't play the game on Friday and Saturday, how else could I be a leader? So I took on a recruiting role. I took on a strength and conditioning role. Um, I'm a varsity athletic student council representative for our men's hockey team. I was part of the Black Indigenous Varsity Student Athlete Associate Alliance. Um, I really just wanted to be heavily involved in that community and really give myself. And so I've been able to do that when I was a part of Heroes Hockey, which is another uh, organization for children who learn the game, who are underprivileged, but still want to play and learn and have fun. And so it's been a really great experience being at the York and even them still offer me a spot after the crash still saying like, Hey, like we, you can come here and we want you here, whether it's one year, two year, five years, three years down the road. Like we want you to be a lion. I think that truly meant the world to me. And so I really did my best to go even against the doctor's orders and to go to York in 2018 and just give it a shot. So it's been quite a great experience so far. I, I think it's incredible how in every situation you're able to take your mindset to what can I still do to help now saying that given that you haven't been cleared for contact with the brain injuries that you've sustained, is there a possibility that you're able to play again or have you had to come with the grips that more than likely you probably aren't going to be unable to be cleared to play competitive hockey again? Yeah. So I've had to come to the grips with that. I think the hardest part for me was in my first, like, so I'll give you a little background story here. So in the hospital, I was passing all these tests with flying colors, like breaking records based on my prognosis. And it was really weird that I was breaking these records. And so then in the summer, I did lots and lots of rehab, lots, lots of therapy. And I had to obviously recover from all my injuries, my broken vertebrae and leg and muscle damage and all that. But also I recovery from my brain injury too. So I would do tons of sleep, greens, exercise, outdoor activity, um, I would even do luminosity, mindfulness, like practice meditation. I was literally doing everything under the sun, even osteo, chiro, massage, acupuncture, you name it. I was doing it because I wanted a holistic approach and I truly wanted to heal. And he was even seeing, um, I would go to a psychologist and all that too. And when I went to one psychologist, it was for my examination to go to York. Um, one of the big things for me was that the brain injury was supposed to leave me in a state where I shouldn't remember my name, but I was already past that state completely and was functioning normal and was breaking these records. And so when I went to this assessment, he said that if I go to York University, I'll fail out and that I'll have a bad lifestyle. I'll get mentally in a dark place because I'll be in Toronto and there's so many different options I can relate to, to, I guess, um, kind of put put bad things into my body type of thing. And he's like, yeah, like this will be a really bad idea. I don't want you to go into there. You won't do well. So when I heard that, I was like, okay, well, this is one perspective. And I know my perspective. I know that I've won, dreamed this for my entire life and I want to at least try it. So I gave an opportunity and I able, was able to succeed and do well. But in that first kind of year, I was really practicing. I was working out with the team. I was doing everything with the team. I just didn't do any contact in the practices. And so in those practices, I'd have, I'd beat teammates in races for the puck. I was like scoring on goalies in the drills. It wasn't like I was outside of it. I was able to pass. Like it, was, it was like I was part of the team. I was able to still compete and be in the lineup if I wanted to, but I actually couldn't because of the scans. And so even in the 
extra, like in the um, testing within the clinic, I was doing very well. I did an impact test and I scored higher on it after the crash than I did before the crash. So it's just so weird how it all kind of came together. And so I got it. I was like, Hey, my scan for my brain is wrong. I have the wrong scan 100%. And I was like, they messed it up because they've had mixed ups before. They had the wrong brain scan on me for sure. Like, yes, I had a brain injury. Yes. It was probably a concussion. I was different than the rest of my normal self for a little while, but I feel like it's wrong. So I went and got another scan in February of 2019, uh, almost close to a year after the crash. And it was the exact same scan. And that was when it really hit me just like, okay, I have no symptoms. I'm feeling amazing. I'm able to compete at the highest level possible right now, but I need to take a step back and really reevaluate my life and see where I can actually like, do I want to do this? Like I want to be a chiropractor. I have this passion of giving back. I want to be married one day. I want to have children. Like, is this really smart of me to pursue sport for another, maybe 10 years if I'm lucky to have the rest of my life damaged. And so I thought at that time, that was when I was really took a step back. I was like, okay, I need to really reevaluate my life and my goals and my priorities. And so I was able to focus more on what I could do in that time and how I could give back to the team. And then also to continue on my education, like you said, with chiropractic afterwards. That's there so, was a there was a funny story though the first time you stepped yeah, on the ice with the I was York just gonna team, ask right? about that. Yeah. Let's yeah. hear it. This is your first practice with the York University hockey team, by the way. Yeah, so it was tough. We had a team skate. I, I drove so a parents and I packed the vehicle and drove to Toronto. It was my first time ever being in Toronto. And I wasn't able to fly after the crash and uh for at least it would have been until June third or fourth, I got clearance. And then I literally hopped on the plane that day and flew to Washington. So I missed that whole time frame to actually tour the school. And we were planning on a tour after my season anyways. So I just committed to them anyways. I went on my virtual tour. So we're going there and we're driving. We finally kind of get to Toronto and I had an equipment fitting. So I quickly got my equipment. The second I got there, we literally drove into Toronto and I went straight to the campus, got my equipment fitted. And uh, got my new gear and I'm excited. And uh, the coach was there and he was like, you're going out on the ice. I was like, oh, we got ice. Today? He's like, yeah, we got like teams captain's practice. I was like, yeah, sure. Let's go on there. Like what could, what could happen? Let's go. So I was like, yeah, like, why not? So I went on the ice. Um, and at the time I didn't have, my skates were very, very bad. I ended up stepping on cement as I went off my last coaching session. And it was just by fluke. There was a little like, you know how in those mats, there's that little, little line and you just accidentally get your skate blade in it. That's exactly what happened. So I didn't even really think about it. I was like, ah, like that won't be too bad. So I kind of gave my skates a little stone in it. I stepped in one on the right foot and then my left foot, there was like a cement kind of pad and I stepped on a cement pad too. So I had both my skates that had cement on it. And I was like, I've never done it before in my career. And I was like, this is fine. Like, I'm sure people are making a big deal about it, whatever. So the second uh, we get dressed and all the guys are like really weird around me. Cause I don't really know how to react. It's my first time being a part of a team and in a dressing room. First time I'm skating. So I kind of said like, Hey guys, no contact. There ain't no contact jerseys kind of thing. Like, yeah, we don't do contact. It's like, yeah, I prefer to wear a different Jersey though. Just so I like stand out a little bit more. So they drafted these teams and uh, it was just like a little scrimmage practice, do a couple of drills. And then I don't even, yeah, a couple of drills and a scrimmage. And so, I ended up going onto the ice and I'm in my new gear. So I have new shin pads, um, new pants. I have a new helmet, new gloves, a new stick, different curve. Um, they didn't have my right curve at the time. <laughs> and I had my skates that were really, really bad. So I'm like a, a new helmet too. So I'm like a brand new guy on that ice, even new shoulder pads. I'm pretty sure I had new shoulder pads on too. So I had the full, full treatment of new equipment. And so I st- go and i'm excited i'm going to step on the ice first step eat it head oh. first like face plant on the ice and the guys behind me i started chuckling and one of my friends who i knew from before ben and he tapped me on the bike he's like oh good start hey i was like <laughs> as if like what a tough way to get going so i get up and i can't even put my other skate down because i slide that one out too so i was struggling so i ended up like kind of getting up and getting my wits and kind of skating a little bit and I was I was pretty bad out there they probably thought I was an ankle bender and how the heck did he hear and they probably thought is this his brain injury like what's going on with this guy so I couldn't even really skate that well but I tried to give it my all out there and I I really couldn't even turn away 
I couldn't turn. It was like, if I turned that way, I was sliding and I was eating it. So um, it was pretty funny, good experience. And uh, glad coach wasn't at that practice and glad I was captain skate because uh, the next skate, I was a lot better. I got my skate You'd snipped and first day. Old gear. Oh, I would have been, been like a uh, place. <laughs> You would have been like me and Witt on our PTOs in St. Louis. Gonzo's no more per diem packs. <laughs> Scram. And and you also mentioned like you you emphasize the new equipment. For those of you who have never played hockey before who are listening to this, new gear is the worst. The worst. <laughs> hey, but I'll tell you this. I went to training camp one year and Malkin, legit, one, one practice, finally showed up. I think you, the camp hadn't started already, but it was his first day actually joining us on the ice. I think he put on all new gear, including skates. He had those, uh, those ones that wrap around your foot, and he yeah. was the best player on the ice. I'd never seen anything like it. Oh, but he wow. was fucking nuts. That's, this guy was the natural. Incredible. Yeah, yeah, that is natural because I know exactly the feeling of new gear, like you said, and it's not fun, especially when you go all new gear. I can't believe he went all new gear and was that good. Oh, he was, he was, crazy. He, he was lights out. Uh, let me see what else I got. I got a couple more here. I couldn't, I kind of, I kind of wanted to jump in and ask. Yeah, jump one. in G. Um, you know, I kind of be remiss if I didn't ask about Logan Boulay. A kid, so many people tweeted us, um, was a huge Chicklets fan. But, uh, when, when Logan passed, you know, came the Logan Boulay effect, which saw 150,000 Canadians register for organ donation after Logan decided to donate his, uh, can you kind of talk about that and talk about the green shirt day and, and, and some of the, um, you know, some of the stuff that has, has come with all that? Yeah, no, it's been amazing to see Logan and his impact he's left on this earth. And even during the season, he was my soulmate and we'd always do everything together. We would go to Special Olympic floor hockey on Mondays together. We'd come back, watch our bachelor Mondays with the team. Um, we'd go to Giants together. We'd always do lots of stuff together. So I became really close with Logan. And when we even talked about it at one point. He's like, yeah, I signed my donor card. Like, oh, that's cool. Kind of thing. I never even really thought of it. Like I knew I wanted to do organ donation. I told my family about it beforehand. Um, and so they knew that if I was to be in the same situation he was, that they would donate my organs. But um, I never even signed a donor card. And I wasn't 21 at that time yet. But I think you can do it at 18 in Saskatchewan at least. Anyways, so after the crash, just seeing the effect that it had, it was incredible. And even today, I still support it, and I always will support it because I've. Why wouldn't you give part of yourself to somebody else to make them live their life even more? It's such a selfless act, and that's it. Doesn't even surprise me either. Like Logan is a selfless guy, and he's probably the most selfless guy on our team. And it was just incredible, and shows just how easy it is that you can still make an impact even when you do leave this earth. And uh, it's really incredible. And there's so many others things that came out of this crash that are positive. There's so many different charities and organizations and movements that really mean the world to me. And it's great to see that our families are able to come out and get some positivity out of this too. And remember their loved ones who aren't here as well. Um, it's, it's quite incredible. And even the survivors are doing amazing stuff too. Like they're all idols in my eyes and I look up to them for inspiration. So yeah, it's such an amazing group of people. And it goes to show even beforehand how tight knit we were and how good people these family these players come from and their families and so to see it now is just incredible well i mean you 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 dedicated the book to all of them including the you know the, the survivors the the ones who have passed away um do you feel that that's going to be part of your life moving forward till till the end of time is is carrying on this legacy of the humble broncos and, and of course the ones that lost their lives i think for me it I realized that it will always be a part of me, even though if I wanted to or not to, it's still going to be a part of me forever. And I do want to carry on the legacy of the 16 who aren't here because they are my motivation in life, to be honest. Like I was motivated beforehand to live my life to the fullest, but now it's just that much more reason to do it for them too. And why, why wouldn't I try to live my life to the fullest and enjoy it and make the most of it? And because life is short and I've really came to realize that at a young age, but even more after the crash. And now I just want to enjoy it and embrace it and make the most memories I can while I'm here because we never know when it's really our time to be gone. So I'll be living my life to the fullest for them every day for the rest of my life, for sure. Buddy, you're, uh, you're an unbelievable person. And, and, I, and I thank you so much for joining me on, uh, on the podcast. And, and, and gee, is, if there's anything else you want to ask him uh, before I, I let him go, but uh, this is emotional, man. And, and I think the people that are going to listen to this are going to love it. And, and I hope that they all go buy the book and, and, and support uh, whatever you're doing moving forward, man, because you are an absolute fucking G. 
Well, thank you so much. Yeah, it, I really appreciate being on here too. And I know that myself and so many others would love to be on this podcast. And especially with our team, we always would talk about you guys. So really, thank you very much for this opportunity. It really does mean a lot. Caleb Dahlgren, check it out, Crossroads. And uh, I'm sure uh, I'm sure it's going to keep fucking kicking ass, my friend. And, and you're going to do the same. Where can you buy well, it? Thank you. Um, you can get this at anywhere you buy books, to be honest. Uh, I know... In the States, Barnes & Noble have been a big one. Amazon has been big too. In Canada, honestly, anywhere you can buy a book, Walmart, Costco, um, Indigo, Chapters, McNally, like clearly anywhere you can get a book. And awesome. online is also like, you can just go even to my profile, Caleb Dahlgren, I'll have the link in there and it'll direct you right to it. Oh, and I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but I heard that potentially that you might be joining the Coyotes on an apprenticeship yeah i i am i don't know if you, you say it if you want i guess maybe not maybe yeah but i am i am i'll be there for a chiropractic internship and next oops, summer um i was able to chat with them and it's gonna be super super exciting i'll be at one of their development camps well thank you so much for joining us and uh and and, and keep going man awesome well thank you so much you guys really do appreciate all your support and everything you've done for the broncos too it really does mean a lot <laughs> Uh, thank you so much to Caleb and, and Biz. I want to say thank you to you because that's an incredible interview. Um, just a, a, a really special person. And for you to do that alone, I remember when I heard you, I listened to when you did with Rick Talk. You're really good at that. And we appreciate you doing some work when uh, Ari and I weren't there. No, no worries. Um, you know, it's uh, that's a special human being and uh, I appreciate him coming on. And it was, it was great to have a positive chat with him too, man. Yeah. Like a, a, a guy who's, who's really doing a lot of positive things. So if you guys have an opportunity, uh, pick up his book, read it and uh, go online and, and follow him on, on his social platforms and support him in uh, the type one diabetes uh, charity stuff and, and anything you really can. So thank you to Caleb. And uh, yeah, that was uh, that was a tough one. Well, you did a good job, Biz. Okay. Whether you're customizing an engagement ring or designing diamond stud earrings, at BlueNile.com, you're in control. You can build a more brilliant piece at a price you won't find at a traditional jeweler. You're looking to take Beyonce's advice and put a ring on it? Hmm. Well, at BlueNile.com, you can choose from more than 100,000 ethically sourced GIA-graded diamonds in every size and shape. It can be stressful doing that. I know from experience. So let Blue Nile help you build your perfect engagement ring. Well, you could just copy a buddy's wife. <laughs> That's what I did. But anyways, they've been doing this since 99. They're the original online jeweler, and their prices are competitive to other online retailers, whatever the occasion. You get expert advice 24-7 and legendary service with 30-day returns, as well as guaranteed service and repair for life. If it's not perfect... No problem. 100% satisfaction guarantee. So you can shop stress-free with guaranteed free shipping and returns. You need that special purchase fast? In most cases, Blue Nile can deliver overnight. Every order is insured, and it arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away what's inside. So make the moment sparkle with jewelry from BlueNile.com, and Spit and Chicklets listeners get $50 off of $500. This podcast-exclusive offer includes engagement. So use the code CHICKLETS. That's code CHICKLETS. Plus, every order is insured, ships free, and arrives in discreet packaging that won't give away that special thing inside. Shop stress-free and find your forever peace. Go to BlueNile.com today. All right, boys, moving right along. The Seattle Kraken are officially the latest member of the National Hockey League after paying off their expansion fee, and they can start making moves at any time. They're going to have the same expansion draft rules that uh, Vegas did. Vegas is, of course, exempt. That's a normal rule for uh, when teams recently come in the league. They are exempt. Uh, from it, you know, expansion drafts the next two, three years. We've seen it before, but Vegas has been good, and people think they should have to give out their players, but the rules have been in place for a long time. Uh, teams can protect seven forwards, three D, and one goalie, or eight skaters in one goalie. They have to have their list in by July 17th. Uh, the Kraken must select one player from each of the other 30 teams. Uh, going back to Vegas quickly, since entering the NHL since the 2016-17 season, Vegas has the fourth best record in the league, trailing the league Tampa, Boston, oh, and Washington. So, you know, uh, credit again to GM, GM, George McPhee. He fleeced everybody. They played oh that perfect. Goodness. And the league, you got to think they're going to learn some lessons from that. So <laughs> uh, good luck to Ronnie Francis in Seattle trying to pull the same stuff off. I would have been the GM just cruising in last minute being like, <laughs> well, yeah, what's all this news about this expansion draft here? <laughs> yeah, take uh, the code. Of Calamari. The code. Hey, you want a couple of my draft picks? Thanks. Code. <laughs> Anyone signed Perry yeah. yet? 
Yeah, give him a, yeah. give him a seven year. Experience. Don't take our third PAD. Here's two fucking first rounders. Just leave them alone. <laughs> yeah, fucking, they were getting fucking swindled. But all right, the call the cup playoffs are canceled for the second straight season. Obviously a bummer for those guys. The AHL it's been a struggle this year. They told div- the individual divisions they can have their own playoffs, but uh, you know if there's no call the cup playoffs, I probably don't see that happening. Uh, Yarmir Yeager just finished hit, finished his 33rd professional season in the Czech Republic. Says he's coming back. Uh, it was good enough to get his team bit. Uh, wait, what's it when you get relegated in soccer? What's it called when you go from down to up? Oh, fuck. I should know this. You get um, relegated or you go Come and you on, get. Fan. Oh, this makes me sick. Uh, See, Chelsea's always in that top league, so uh, they don't really need. To... Oh, 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 I just had it on the tip of my tongue. Mikey, uh, Google it. I can't do this right now. Oh, uh, shit. Sorry, I'm man. a little rusty after this weekend. I'll say that. My, my brain's in a fog. Team it trash. Is... Come on, not elevated. Come on, Mike. No, to be in the Google it. fucking promotion. Is it promo? Yeah, promotion I guess so. Yeah, I thought, I thought it yeah. might have even been another one, but I guess, yeah, promoted. Yeah, it's that's what I'm reading here. Yeah, right. It, it says promotion. Speaking. Yeah, Jesus. I should know having my Ted Lasso experience. Is that a real conversation? Like, yeah, that was like you are now I, dumber for listening to that, <laughs> Billy Madison. Oh, yeah. uh, fuck. All right. Uh, congrats to our buddies over at 31 Thoughts, Jeff Marrick and Elliot Friedman. They're celebrating 200 episodes. Um, they're kind of like a sort of a smart version of what we do here. They get a little more in depth. Yeah. They got some better sourcing. And, uh, you know, we kind of we're a little yin to the yang or yang. That to the last yin conversation we just had, that doesn't exactly. happen on that podcast. <laughs> OK, they're a little bit and they just no. threw up. They're oh, all shit. this information minus the nonsense and a very minus convent- the not being able to think of the word promotion. <laughs> But those are, hey, those guys are awesome. They've both been on our podcast and they're hockey encyclopedias and they have insane motors. So go and check sources. them out. And sources. Let's hope uh, Sportsnet's getting them. I said on their podcast, pop in and I said, that's like doing a thousand games, 200 podcasts. I said, Sportsnet, engrave the watches, make sure the Rolexes are ready. Wow, shit. Me and Witt, me and Witt are going to have You think that Lambos. 200 podcasts is a thousand <laughs> games? Yeah, I think Grinelli said that most podcasts don't make it past seven podcasts me, or something. I mean, yeah, we're, we're close in three, approach, approaching probably 350 all set. Well, you I, guys are Hall of Famers. That's what I just said. We're I'm like Trot Chan who just Ruby. hopped on the bandwagon for, for five and six. With, with the, <laughs> Hall with of the, shame. Oh, shit. Get up, Bellows. Tit fucker. Uh, Merle, Merle mushed uh, Siska. What did you catch that? He said they were going to sweep him. Well, people say I mushed him, actually, because I finally hopped into the KHL EBR. So in the end, I was the mush. But, yeah, it was not good. It was not good at all. Uh, Ilya Kovalchuk, Kovalchuk and Bob Hartley get it done and beat the favorites, the Russian Red Army. Yeah, I haven't gotten Alexi Emlin too. He had some health issues, so it was good to see him get the get the uh, Gagarin Cup. Is that how you say Gagarin Cup? I don't speak. I think it's the second one. Pretty Gagarin. cool cup. Yeah, it is. It's it a is. very cool cup. And how about that stadium? Jam, jam packed, buzzing. Yeah. Although were... the Preds the other night, the Preds when they, when they beat Dallas one nothing, uh, that place was bumping. That's actually another thing I wanted to talk about is apparently Dallas. I don't know if you guys have heard this. If they make playoffs, they could be at full capacity. That's Florida's going to go to 184% capacity, and they throw you out if you have a mask on. <laughs> Fucking savage state. No, we were down there, dude. It was like the Wild West when you go yeah. to other places during COVID. It was- that's going to be a big advantage. You go into your barn, no fans. or, or like I know. Like, that's what I'm saying. Toronto comes out of the north, and then they go down to – play vegas and it's buzzing in oh, there oh yeah oh yeah then you go People, back home and it's dead silent still that could well, affect who knows well so i would imagine the north is going to move down to the states to come yeah you're right, some sort you're of right. Bubble, i think they've but... already actually is there a chance they would do it in vegas the final four that's that'd be cool. sick they should if yeah, they have 100 percent fans vegas and dallas jerry's world <laughs> <laughs> i'm doing it at the big stadium <laughs> let's go Oof, it's the witch and I almost didn't get my action in it. Me and Merle's are both on Nashville. And we don't talk wit when we when we do the gambling corner, we don't confer. Like he writes his thing, I write my thing, and sometimes they're dead on. And tonight we're dead on. Like pound it with Saros is in. Saros just confirmed he started. So I loaded up on Nashville. So I'll either get crucified or uh, congratulated on Twitter tomorrow. Uh let's go to golf with your sport. This kid Michael Vasaki made the PGA tour. Uh clip of him calling his dad went viral. He had a very emotional moment. You know, kid probably had some adversity getting where he was. What do you know about him? Uh, I don't know much at all, but he, he so he didn't make it on the PGA tour. He Monday qualified. And what's a lot of people don't know is every tour event, 
every single Monday, the week of the tour event, there's a qualifier where I think, I don't know, I'm guessing three, uh, two to four spots are, are given to the top two to four players from that one day event. So a lot of guys who are amazing players come out of college and they like, I think Patrick Reed was a guy who knows what the fuck he was doing with his golf ball during it, but he Monday qualified into so many tour events that then if you get into one tour event, I think you finish top 10, you're in the next week's event. So Monday qualifiers can really change people's life. Actually, Corey Connors, uh, the Canadian, now he's turned into one of the top 30 players in the world. I think he ball striking machine. He Monday qualified into the um, tur- a tournament last year in Texas and won it. So it's truly life-changing stuff. And this kid, Michael Vasecki, who's been playing pro golf for a long time, just finally got into one. And he Mondayed in, and he had a great Monday round to get into the Valspar in Tampa. And just this in- emotional, but like so cool, such a cool video to watch at the end where he calls his old man. And, and, and he's just breaks down and telling him like, I just made it to the PGA tour. And, and from the discussions he had after his family's done so much for him, he's lived with them. They've spent money on his, you know, growing up his golf and after college, the money that they've given him to help pursue his dream. And he is, uh, absolutely no slouch in, in, in pro golf. I mean, he's, he's not, I've never been on the PGA tour, but like this guy runs away with events and the mini tours and he's gotten through local qualifying in the U S open. Congratulations to my boy, by the way, the one arm bandit, Andrew Duramio, he got through local stage of the U S open today at Eastwood Ho in Chatham, Massachusetts. Shout out Duramio, the one handed bandit. Uh, but this Viseki kid went on and he missed the cut. But he, he, he missed the cup by four shots. He shot three over the first day, even the second, was ahead of a lot of really great golfers. So just his chance to get in. The crazy thing is, though, not much changes for him now. Maybe he's going to get some sponsors because of how viral everything went. But he's right back to probably Monday in and playing mini tour events and a grind of a life for golfers who are so good, but still yet kind of so far away from the PGA Tour. Can you just hop around to the Monday qualifiers? You can go to any one. What, what level do you have to be to be able to just so show you have those? So if you have certain status and have done certain things in golf, I don't know what, you can go right in and pay money to do the Monday qualifier. But for a lot of people who don't have status and haven't done enough in their short or long pro golf career, you have to go through a qualifier for the Monday qualifier. So you got you to gotta get through a pre-qualifier event just to even go try to get in the big event on a Monday. So... The craziest there's thing so about, many good golfers out there, but these guys are a different level up top. The craziest thing about that Connors thing is like, so you're basically saying in six days you go from, I don't even know if I'm going to be playing this event to putting a million bucks in your jeans. Yes. Yes. It's fucking <laughs> crazy. And then, and then not only that, having status on the PGA tour where you could have status nowhere. Maybe you're a corn fairy guy who Monday into a, PGA tour event. It's just, it's a, those sports bizarre and how quickly your life can change. Has he ever talked, has he ever talked in length about that six days and how, like, was he just he, on an absolute heater? When I played with him, he was telling me about it a little bit. He's just like, and then that week, it was the week before the Masters. That, so that got him into Augusta. And then he played sick at Augusta. That changed his whole life. But he's like one of the top ball strikers in the world. So he's going to probably end up being a legit ATM machine in golf, <laughs> what he's done. But yeah, I talked to him, but, but he, I, I'm sure he'd come on here one time and do it if we want to do a little golf chatter but yeah that that Fisecki story was great and the, and the, the video caught fire it was everywhere oh, and just to so see good. like somebody talk to their father and, and or mother who's done like you think of the people who allowed you to get where you have become and where you where your dreams really came true right away and and that call to his father proved it yeah it was raw emotion I hope he gets a bunch of sponsors and gets to keep pursuing it man same here. Speaking of golf tours, never mind the corn ferry tour. I saw those pictures of BB. He's going to be on the corn tour with that fucking haircut. Did you see the pictures on our Instagram? He's got the Gilmore no. jersey on too. Oh, it's a, and it, Taylor. Said, it was an, everyone said it was a knockoff too. It's like, come on, bro, spend the dough. But that hair, that hair dude, man, he should be on the uh, fucking, uh, what was that tour with all the metal heads back in the day with uh, Biz? I never went to him. I don't know. There was like a big fucking huge metal do, tour. <laughs> do hoss. Anyways, it's a fucking. Do hoss, man. man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, dude, I just put my action. In. Listen, TNT, ESPN, NHL. Can we please, please, please get staggered start times? The, the other night, like twelve fucking games started at seven oh eight. Yeah, staggered start game. And, oh, and, especially and this fucking year. Afternoon no. games. Why are there not afternoon games in the NHL? And by the way, not to be like negative Nancy over here, but they had fucking like seventeen games. Derby Saturday, and then Sunday the next day they had one. <laughs> I was like, uh I don't know how that makes any sense in terms of like more eyeballs on your sport, but yeah. All right. 
for gambling wise, the staggered starts are key. Yeah, it's fucking killing us. Uh, before we get to the Kentucky Derby, you just mentioned it. Check these bad boys out. McCain's Quick Cook Fries are a new fry innovation that allows you to cook fries in half the time of traditional McCain fries. Anybody who has their fries at home is well aware of McCain's, their product industry leader. It's less cook time, more anything else time. Cook less, do more. Sounds like a plan, Stan. They cook them longer so we don't have to. There's no flipping required. It's 100% real potatoes, crispy on the outside, soft on the inside. Bake them in the oven for a healthier alternative. If you air fry, they're ready in six to eight minutes. In the oven, they're ready in 10 minutes. These are awesome, man. Throw a little ketchup on, maybe a little salsa, maybe a little cheese. Check out their website to see where you can find McCain in a freezer aisle near you. McCain Quick Cook Fries are a fun snack, appetizer, or side dish to share with friends and family or while podcasting from Midtown, because I'm going to go grab some hot sauce and slather them on these things. Can't wait. All right, boys, let's get to the fun stuff. Kentucky Derby the other day. I didn't have the winner. Um, the only person my family did was my mother, who picked because of the name. She knows shit about gambling. My father, my brother, my uncles probably spent 1,800 collective hours reading the racing form, and none of them won. Wit, did you have any any winners? Nope. Nope, I did not. I went with Murley's uh, Hot Rod Charlie pick because I liked that he has hot dog Charlie's in Albany or Troy, whatever it was, and he was a loser. <laughs> tough episode from Murley. Tough. He needs a bounce. No, Murley's is still, that. hey, this is gambling, right? If nah, you gamble, you you're, know. You're over right. time you win, over time you lose, but he makes it entertaining, and I'll ride with him forever. <laughs> I'll, uh, offer, I'll offer Hauser the new job, the new gambling job, <laughs> <laughs> if he doesn't pick it up. <laughs> Yeah, it was it Saturday night? I don't. You guys must have saw them. There were a couple crowd fights that went viral. Uh, I mean, there was some. These things were fucking epic. They were going on. They looked like gang fights. No security. Absolute joke. Some of those dudes were getting tuned up. I assumed it was the MMA crowd, but it was actually the boxing matches. And it got me to think. I've been a, a shitload of boxing matches, and there are so many fucking hados there. Everybody gets punchy. Like guys like to fight. I'm not really one of them, so I don't get that way. So I can't imagine an MMA crowd because it's just such a rougher sport and it's so much more violent. I got to think. Do you think there's more meatheads out? an MMA fight, fight card, or a boxing fight card? Well, I don't know, but like you said, it's like usually people go watch fights, especially in the upper decks, are ones who are just wound up way too tight for me to be around. Like, I, you know, I'm, <laughs> I'm good. Yeah, I'll watch it on TV. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll actually, I'll watch it on Twitter. Yeah, I'll watch I don't the gift 30 bother. seconds after the knockout. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's how quick it travels. But no, that was brutal. I saw that stuff going around too, man. I, that stuff makes me queasy. There's, there's like crazy stories about like Dodgers fans. Do- oh, Dodgers Dod- have bad fans, don't they? Dodgers and San Fran, man. That's LA San Fran. There's been some brutal, brutal things that go on. And it's so fucking mm. stupid, man. Like, oh, it's a fucking game, you know? Have we, have we ever talked about that? Um, that crazy documentary on here that involved a, a guy who was at a Dodgers game and it just so happened they were filming a Larry yeah, David about episode. Larry David Curb your enthusiasm. Yeah, yeah. About that. yeah, I gotta watch Nuts. that thing. You guys were telling me about it. I, I was reminded of it. Speaking of the old UFC MMA, whatever you want to call it, biz. Last week we never got to the story. We, we ran long. Uh, Chris, is it Chris Weidman? Chris Weidman. He, man, he fell victim to plain old physics. He went to kick that guy and he oh. blocked it. He caught his shin and he didn't even know he broke it. Like he, and he went to step on it and then fell. And that was the part where it was like, oh, give me the bath bag, man. I used to. I can't. I can't watch that shit. I anymore. actually didn't. I didn't nope. watch it. I saw the Twitter. I was blown up. I, I, I never watched those. Oh, Brutal. Marge, you made me miss Joe Theismann. <laughs> I look at I look at it by holding my phone as far away from me as possible, and oh, then really? like scrolling, and then like look at it slowly and then as soon as i see it i'm like ah, okay that's enough <laughs> yeah it's brutal so it's a slow process it's it's brutal and it's actually the same guy who silva ended up kicking and doing the exact same thing to his leg first so it was the guy that he fought oh yeah Floppy so this leg. is it's just a bizarre connection the fact that it now it happened to him so Oh, just I I don't I don't know if that's a career ender or what, but that was gr- gruesome, gruesome. Yeah, Ooh. I need I needed a W. I was telling what that night. I don't really follow MMA or UFC, but I looked at the odds at the fights. You know all the different scenarios and possibilities, and sixty to one jumped out at me in a couple of them. So I was like, look, I don't know who's fighting. I don't know the odds. I put a hundred each on forty to one, fifty to one, sixty to one, and sixty to one. Didn't watch any fights. Didn't even know who was fighting. Knew nothing about it. Check my account later. What two, one of the fights was a draw, sixty to one odds. I popped on it, so I went from negative to positive. Ended up having a, a nice week just on a random fucking play like that. So, nice. uh, I, don't, I don't know what the lesson no, is no. here. I had a horseshoe up my ass Saturday, I guess. Uh, the women's worlds, uh, they obviously got well. 
they were called canceled, but it looks like postponed is probably the proper word. They're going to look to get them done in August. Uh, Alberta is the preferred site given the way they handle the bubble. So we'll keep you abreast of that. A um, couple other quick notes, pop culture stuff. Uh, busy. You mentioned a couple of movies, docs. I went to the movie theater for the first time in what, I don't know, 16, 18 months yesterday. I uh, saw a 25 year old movie. I, w- I went and saw Fargo at the theater. I've I- never seen Fargo. I know you haven't, right, Biz? Don't worry. I, no, I've it. seen Fargo. Oh, oh you have? Oh, you know, oh, yeah. Is it good, Biz? Yeah, it's very good. I like Ma- slow moving movies like that. Like, uh, There Will Be Blood. I like yeah, that that's style. A, that, it, that, that's a good flick. Wait, yeah. you got to watch Fargo. I mean, okay. it, it, Lost Best Picture to the English Patient, which is a fucking joke. I mean, the Coens directed it. It's, it's a legit masterpiece. I haven't seen it in the show in 25 years, but there's this company called No Free Ads, but Free Ad, Fathom Events, and they put on anniversary showings of movies, like when it's like a round number, 20th anniversary, 35th, and they have like two or three days of randomly. It's, you can go, huh? What's he called? What'd you say? Did you say round number and then say 35th? Yeah. Well, 30, no, that will... Fargo's round number, 25th anniversary. Yeah, oh, round, I thought a round yeah. number would be an even number, no? Um, I always thought zero, round two, number was four, a five six, or a eight, ten. Is that, oh. or I guess, maybe I'm totally wrong. Fuck, I don't know. Round yeah. number and then 35. I tell you what they're not doing on the 20, 21st. <laughs> <laughs> that was one of the funniest. The Definitely. fact that nobody said anything and then R.A. just burst out laughing made that an all-time moment. No 21st <laughs> anniversaries here, guys. Yeah, when I, yeah, round number is probably zero, but you know, like anniversary numbers, nobody celebrates 33rd okay. or 28th yep. or whatever. Yep. So later this year, Stand By Me has its 35th. So it's a great thing, man, especially if it's a movie you, ha- you maybe watched on video or DVD or HBO, but you never seen it in a theater. It's just so much better in a theater. So uh, one show I got to mention, Wit, have you been watching a biz, Mayor of Easttown on HBO starring no, Kate I see Winslet? people tweeting about it, though. What's it about? No. Phenomenal show. It's kind of a lame name for the show, Mayor of Easttown. She plays. Mayor Kate Winslet from Titanic fame, fantastic actress, couple, a bunch of nominations to her name. She's won one or one or two. And she's a, a detective in a, a town just outside Philadelphia where they got all those crazy Delco accents, uh, accents. And first, the second episode, uh, a local girl dies and she has all these connections, to small town stuff. I don't want to spoil too much of it, but it yeah. fucking ropes you in by the second episode. You're hooked in. Episode three at Sunday night. Uh, so far, so good. She carrying the show. There's a ton of other great actors on it. So check it out. Mary yeah. East Town, if you haven't. I've been busy watching a buddy, the love sponge's wife, get plowed by a Hulk Hogan. But yeah, I'll try buddy. to check it out. <laughs> What's his uh, name? Buddy Bubba the Love Sponge. Oh, Bubba. Oh, buddy. <laughs> My buddy. You were combining My Buddy buddy. the Elf and the Love Sponge. Buddy. Yeah. All right. I got one last one for you. And this is off the, off the grid. I, I, one of the movie guys I follow, it's I don't even know if I'm pronouncing it right. It's a Bosnian film. It's Q U O Quo Vadis Aida. Dude, I watched it twice. It, absolute fucking incredible movie. Like the Yugoslavian War was something that went on in college. And I don't think Americans were really familiar with what went on. It ended up breaking up Yugoslavia into like five or six different countries. There were all these little civil wars in between. And it was just crazy how like man can just turn turn against his neighbor based on stupid shit. I watched it. It's it's uh, subtitled, and I I is the title character. She's a translator for the UN. As the like, this town's getting invaded by like I, Bosnians are getting invaded by the Serbs, and they they were trying to get on the UN base. Uh, it's an intense movie. It feels like three hours long. It's probably an hour and forty five minutes. But highest recommendation. Uh, it's not an easy movie to watch. It's a heavy topic, but the acting is phenomenal. It just shows you the power of like film and cinema that you can watch a movie where you don't understand what they're saying, and it's so powerful. It's Q U O. V-A-D-I-S, two words, comma, Aida. It's with the question mark. Uh, seek it out. I watched it. I think uh, whatever the fucking stream, you can just go to the movie rankings uh, that our buddies at Lights, Camera, Boss, do run. Awesome movie, uh, powerful movie, high, highest recommendation for me. You've been consuming a lot lately. I love it. Bringing a yeah. lot of heat. Wet. you got some Peter Malam merch coming too, right? Yes, this new uh, spring line we brought up last week. It came out. I saw the pictures that we we put on Twitter, and and it really is awesome. This it's the performance wear. It's like the those shirts fit so well, and they're comfortable, and they got great quarter zips too. It's just check it out. I think that you'll all enjoy the new colors and and some and the logo placement. And I just I love wearing it. It's all I wear. I wore it before this show, and I continue to wear it now. Is there are our good friends at Peter Millar. Also, we got uh, the RA's Casino T-shirt dropping. Uh, it's Daytona Beach, G. Uh, the casino's located at. It is. It's RA Rear Admiral's Casino, located in Daytona Beach, Florida, and we also have Rick's Pro Shop in Red Deer, Alberta. Merchandise for that dropping as well. 
Ra, Ra's casino would be out of a double wide trailer, like him and his buddies running it. Where just like just like uh, Witt's house at the in the AHL the first year. There's a, a back room for you can a special bet on rent. how long it's going to take him to feed the fucking squirrel <laughs> a full bowl of legal seafoods clam chowder. Well, I love how he's my pet now from your tweet. Everyone's like, what's like, I can't believe he, <laughs> he had was a pet. your like, pet. I was like, oh, <laughs> people really think I had a squirrel in my fucking in a cage in my house at, <laughs> at this point. Another another myth from Chicklets. Hilarious. Oh, uh, shit, boys. This is a long one. It was a fun one. I, I think that should probably wrap it up. Uh, Grayley's going to be up till Thursday editing, so yeah. we should let him go. Uh, uh, one more G? thing is subscribe yeah. to the YouTube channel. All vi- all podcasts can be found the next day on our YouTube channel. And again, like we always say, if you subscribe to the YouTube channel, it lets us, allows us to do a lot more video content. Yes, it does. Awesome. Yeah, maybe we got a couple more videos for you tonight. And big thanks once again to Brian Trottier for last week. We got some fantastic feedback on that. Six-time cup one, a great stories, great guy, so Thanks to him again. And uh, yeah, boys, I think that about wraps it up. Everybody have a fantastic week and uh, we'll catch you later. Thanks for listening. Peace.